Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the host of Stoicon 2023, Catherine Coramillis. Thanks, Phil. Hello and welcome everyone as you're entering the room. Pop into the chat box and let us know where you're zooming in from. It looks like the whole world is in the room today. I can see Portland, Oregon, Plymouth, UK, South Carolina, Pretoria, London, Vicky Wilson in Australia. <laughs> and I am here in sunny for a wee while longer Southwest Scotland. And if you are tuning in via our YouTube stream, Welcome, uh, so glad you're here with us. Okay, everyone, welcome to Modern Stoicism, our annual conference, Stoic Con 2023. I am Catherine Coromillis, and together with Phil Yanov, we are your hosts for the day. This year, we are exploring the theme of beauty. Our conference title is Beautiful Stoics, and our beautiful question for the day is, what can beauty teach us about how to live? Everyone, back in 2018 at our Stoicon held in London, Professor Emeritus Anthony Long uh, noted that the beauty of virtue is largely disappeared from our conversations around ethics and around how to live well. It needs to be brought back, he said. We need to bring back beauty, not only to modern Stoicism, but also to ethics. Uh, as such. And so today, everyone, we hope to do just that, to bring beauty back to our conversations as modern Stoics and to bring beauty back to our Stoic practice. And so we have a very beautiful program planned with 12 presenters who will be exploring beauty through the lens of Stoicism. We'll also be hosting short Q&A sessions following each presenter's talk, and some of our speakers will facilitate those Q&As so you'll get a real nice mix of voices up here on the stage. If you don't already have your conference program open on your device, I'm going to pop that link in the chat for you. Open it up and um, follow along there. You will learn more about our speakers. There are links to our speakers, websites, newsletters, YouTube channels, social media accounts and their books. So please do follow and support their work. We have also curated a collection of beautiful quotes. You will find them at the end of the program. These are extracts from the Stoic writings on, of course, beauty, just to inspire your further study of the theme. Everyone, we're going to spend the next seven hours together and the program also gives you the timings of the talks and the timings of our breaks so you know what is coming up. There'll be three breaks today so that we can reset and recharge and we hope you will stay with us all the way to the very end of our beautiful day for our keynote speaker, Professor John Berveke of the University of Toronto. John is pioneering the discussion around beauty and wisdom and, and is sure to challenge us as he argues for the primacy of beauty and explains to us how beauty is implicit throughout Stoicism. And at the very end, everyone, one of our favorite Stoics will send us off with her beautiful music. On that note, I will hand the microphone over to Phil Yanov who will give us some tips on how to best engage today. Over to you, Phil. Thank you, Catherine. And uh, by the way, don't you think a round of applause already for Catherine for pulling all this together? You can do this like this, you can do Zoom hands, or I can press a button. <laughs> and it sounds exactly like that. All right. Um, Thank you. I'm going to you know, I'm going to quickly snap myself into gallery view for just a second so I can take a look at all those smiling faces. And I see lots of people that I recognize already. I see Alice and, and uh, Massimana, JB's there, a lot of folks. And of course, I can only see you 25 at a time. But here's the thing. I know that we're nice people. And I'm just trying to remind you that, you know, Catherine showed this off. We are celebrating beauty and stoicism today. And so what does that mean? That means that we're going to be hopefully largely good actors, right? So uh, my thing is inside the chat, uh, Catherine's going to post some notes inside there, but we're going to ask you to be respectful, avoid using an appropriate language, or just being offensive generally. And by the way, all you have to do is sniff test it. If you're not sure if it's a happy thing or a snarky thing, it's a snarky thing. So go back to the happy thing and stick that inside the chat, right? 
Um, no post personal sensitive information. Please uh, limit, by the way, a lot of times people ask us to limit the chat while the speaker is presenting. You know, keep it on the topic, keep it with them, be supportive. That's what we want to have you doing right there. Um, no links or files, please. Uh, spelling and avoid using all caps if you can do it. I get it. Maybe you're an all caps person, but try not to be that cat because, you know, people who think you're yelling and we want them to think that you're a nice person. Uh, there is some more stuff in the notes. Take a look at that. But mostly what I'm asking you to do is to be nice. Don't get other people not being able to figure that out. Be supportive. Be supportive of each other. And uh, that's it. That's kind of on my side what I want you to do. So we're thinking about what you're going to do inside that chat. The other thing is, um, so Catherine's already told you, this event is seven hours long. Here's the deal. We're not, there will be Q&A, but those will come probably mostly out of the chat um, uh, till the end of the day. But the point is, seven hours is a long time for you to be sitting with your camera turned on. It's not required. If you don't, I mean, if that is exhausting to you, if you feel like it's taking away from your enjoyment, it's okay to turn off your camera. By the way, we are recording, we are streaming. Occasionally, we'll flip that around so that people can see each other. If you're okay with that, that's cool. If you're not, just stop your video and just listen. I mean, you can still see us. We just won't see you, but that's okay. We know you're there. We got a couple hundred people on the call already, which is really good. And I think with that, Catherine, um, I think I've covered everything you wanted me to cover. I'll hand it back to you, I guess. And then we're going to go to Cecily after that, I think. And Phil, I think we need a round of applause for you. Thank you so much for uh, directing Listen. this technical show. So we couldn't do it without you, Phil. So a big round of applause for you before we get started. And you got this. That guy. Listen, I press that button all the time when you guys aren't around. But it's even that. better when I've got an audience <laughs> for it. All right. You got it. And if you want to, everyone, you can use the chat with your emojis to just flood the chat with applause. I see some of you have done that. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks, Phil. It is time to begin. Everyone, I'd like to invite you to sit back, to get comfortable, to maybe take one full deep breath and on the release of your breath, release all thoughts and concerns out there and arrive fully in the space. For just this next moment or two, you might want to close your eyes. Let me take you back 2000 years, Cleanthes, the Greek Stoic philosopher and boxer who was the successor to Zeno and the second head of the Stoic school of Athens is composing a poem, a hymn, a hymn to Zeus. Today, actor Cecily Thomas, a graduate of classical studies at the University of Bristol who wrote her thesis on mental fitness and Stoicism will embody Cleanthes and recite that hymn for us 2,000 years later to kick off this conference. Thanks, Cecily. Over to you. Noblest of immortals, many named, always all-powerful, Zeus, first cause and ruler of nature, governing everything with your law, greetings. For it is right for all mortals to address you, for we have our origin in you. Bearing a likeness to God, we, alone of all that live and move as mortals on earth. Therefore, I shall praise you constantly. Indeed, I always sing of your rule. This whole universe, spinning around the earth, truly obeys you wherever you lead and is readily ruled by you. Such a servant do you have between your unconquerable hands the two-edged, fiery, ever-living thunderbolt. For by its stroke, all works of nature are guided. With it, you direct the universal reason, which permeates everything, mingling with the great and the small lights. Because of this, you are so great, the highest king forever. Not a single deed takes place on earth without you, God nor in the divine celestial sphere, nor in the sea, except what bad people do in their folly. But you know how to make the uneven even, and to put into order the disorderly. 
even the unloved is dear to you. For you have thus joined everything into one, the good with the bad, that there comes to be one ever existing rational order for everything. This all mortals that are bad flee and avoid the wretched, who though always desiring to acquire good things, neither see nor hear God's universal law, obeying which they could have a good life with understanding. But they, on the contrary, rush without regard to the good, each after different things, some with a belligerent eagerness for glory, others without discipline, intent on profits, others yet on indulgence and the pleasurable actions of the body. They desire the good, but they are born now to this, then to that, while striving eagerly that the complete opposite of these things happen. But all bountiful Zeus, cloud-wrapped ruler of the thunderbolt, deliver human beings from their destructive ignorance. Disperse it, Father, from their souls. Grant that they obtain the insight on which you rely when governing everything with justice, so that we, having been honoured, may honour you in return, constantly praising your works, as befits one who is mortal. For there is no other greater privilege for mortals, or for gods, than always to praise the universal law in justice. Thank you, Cecily. That was so good to hear you. Thank you so much. We've got lots of applause happening in the chat for you. I did want to hold on to you here and just ask you one quick question. How did it feel for you reading that poem and embodying the great Cleanthes here today? I loved it. It was amazing. Um, it feels very special to get to read something like that that's so old and so important um in the history of stoicism and to be here and get to read it to everybody here is um yeah it's very special so thank you so much for having me um and yeah i really enjoyed it great uh everyone we're going to invite the professor uh who translated the poem for uh cecily to read um and this is Johan. So let me introduce Johan Tom, who, yes, translated the hymn to Zeus that we just heard. Uh, Johan's going to present a short commentary on the hymn. Uh, Johan retired from his position at Stellenbosch University as disting Distinguished Professor of Classics uh, in the Department of Ancient Studies in 2019 and is the author of publications, including a publication around this poem. The publication is called Cleanthes' Hymn to Zeus. And um, you can, pref uh, I'm going to pop another link in the chat so you can explore more about Professor Johan Tom in the program. But for now, over to you. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks, Catherine, for the wonderful, kind um, welcome. And thank you, especially to Cecily, for this wonderful performance. Um, it's the first time I've heard it aloud. And um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. The Hymn to Zeus by Cleanthes is a truly remarkable poem. It combines various philosophical, religious, and literary traditions into a unified composition that can be read on two levels as a text conveying Stoic doctrine, but also as a religious hymn addressed to the supreme deity. On the one hand, the hymn uses traditional Homeric epithets for Zeus. It also refers to the god of thunder's attributes, such as the thunderbolt by means of which he enforces his rule, or his ability to disperse the clouds. Zeus is the father from whom humans have their origin. The poem also makes use of literary allusions to Hesiod, Solon, and Heraclitus 
to underline Zeus's ability to make the crooked straight and to ensure justice. And to Orphic text about the wretched foolishness of the human race. These traditional elements can at the same time, however, be understood as metaphors. Zeus is not simply the supreme deity. Within Stoicism, Zeus represents the active principle of order and rationality, which permeates the whole of the cosmos. This two-edged, fiery, ever-living thunderbolt is a symbol of the designing fire, the principle of coherence and order. His ability to make the uneven even is a reference to the omnipotent divine order, despite appearances of chaos. His dispersal of the clouds is reason's ability to change ignorance into insight. Leanthus thus uses the familiar traditional form of a cult hymn to convey his message in a poetically beautiful garb. This approach should not surprise us. Leanthus believed that poetry was the most effective medium to communicate the truth, both because the discipline imposed by poetry concentrates meaning and because the musical element of poetry makes a greater impact on the recipient than pure prose. The poem is composed in hexameter verse customary for hymns. Its composition also has the tripartite structure typical of hymns, namely invocation, argument, and prayer. Cleanthes, however, applies the compositional structure in a very pointed manner to accomplish his purpose. The invocation of an ancient hymn serves to address the relevant deity and to call upon him or her to pres be present and attend to the hymn. In Cleanthes' hymn, the invocation, verses 1 to 6, underlines both Zeus's position as ruler and the privileged position of human beings in nature because of their special relationship with God. This is also the reason why they may and should praise him. The argument forms the body of him. It indicates the reasons why the deity should assist or answer the prayer. In the hymn to Zeus, the argument as a whole focuses on the problem the bad people present to Zeus's universal rule. The first part of the argument verses 7 to 17, appears to continue the theme of praise with its description of the beautiful order Zeus creates throughout nature. At the end of this section, in verse 17, it becomes clear, however, that the positive, obedient response of nature to Zeus's rule is presented as a fall to the foolish people who act outside his plan. The actions for the bad people are described in more detail in the last section of the argument, verses 22 to 31. Blind to the fact that the good life may be obtained by adhering to God's law, they chase after mistaken goals in the hope that they will obtain happiness, only to end up in confusion and frustration. The first and last sections of the argument are therefore carefully counterpoised. The first contains a positive and optimistic description of the order prevailing in nature in obedient response to Zeus's rule, while the latter gives a gloomy and negative depiction of the fragmented and disorderly lives as a consequence of rejecting God's normative order. Acting as a hinge between these two sections, verses 18 to 21, suggest the solution to the disorder created by bad people. Zeus himself is able to restore order and to create unity in plurality. The pivotal role of this section is highlighted by its position at the exact center of them. Flanked by the opposing first and last sections of the argument, which itself is framed by the invocation and prayer. 
The solution is, however, followed by the description of the dire consequences of the bad people's actions. The argument ends on the somber note that people are able to reject God's solution. This sets the scene for, for the prayer, verses 32 to 39, in which Zeus is requested to save humans from their ignorance and restore the order of his rule by granting them insight into how the universe is governed. This will enable them to join the rest of the cosmos in obeying and honoring Zeus's universal law, that is, living in accordance with nature, which Cleanthus describes as a life of praise, literally of taking part in a hymn. Cleanthus composed this hymn to Zeus as a thing of beauty to remind his audience of the divine order underlying all of nature and to request God's help to live according to this universal law of reason. Life itself is viewed as a hymn in praise of the divine in which all humans should participate. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Johan. How fascinating to, to hear your thoughts on the poem. Everyone, if you are in the chat and have a question, just pop your questions in the chat. Um, start that by just typing in question in capital letters so it's easy to kind of find your questions. Uh, we're going to hold on to Johan for a few minutes here just to ask any questions. And thank you for your applause emojis in the chat. Much appreciated. Um, Johan, I think it's absolutely fascinating that you've delved into this poem. And I do have just one, oh, a couple of questions maybe, unless anyone from the chat has any. But I was wondering um, why uh, the hymn to Zeus was composed in this way. So almost... Um, on two levels, as it seems, it's kind of a traditional hymn to Zeus, but it's also a philosophical text. So could you just elaborate a little bit more about that? Yes, we, we don't really know uh, for which occasion the hymn was composed. But it seems that it, it was pub probably for a public performance. And I think the accessibility of the hymn the fact that he uses very little, very few um, technical, stoic terminology would have made this poem accessible to um, ordinary people listening to it. In other words, non-stoics as well. And in this way, drawing them into, you know, stoicism. So it's a, it's a kind of um, advertisement for stoicism. I love that, well, which is quite interesting because I'd love, we've been talking a lot lately about having more creative work produced around Stoicism rather than strict sort of nonfiction texts. So do you think Stoicism, modern Stoicism should use poetry to advertise Stoicism? <laughs> well, if uh, the poet is good enough, um, if, <laughs> if you yeah. have a bad poet, the poetry itself can put people off. Absolutely true. I've got a couple of questions in the chat. I'll just see what Michael is saying there. So Michael says, I was surprised a bit by the section where he describes people who live life foolishly. It reminded me of some religious tribalism I'm familiar with personally. Do you see Cleanthes as creating a dichotomy of the foolish and the wise and therefore creating a kind of stoic versus non-stoic tribalism? Well, I'm not sure about tribalism. But of course, um, there was a difference between the sage, the wise person, and the person striving towards wisdom. Um, it, it's a big debate in Stoic scholarship whether anyone could ever become wise. But mm -hmm. what's interesting in this poem is that in the prayer at the end, the author um, identifies himself and his audience, really, with the foolish people who is in need of, of God's help. Um, so th th there is, on the one hand, this uh, distinction between wise people and foolish people, but on the other hand, we, we're all really on the road towards wisdom. 
That's such a lovely response. I love that. Okay, we've got another question. I think it's an interesting question. Terry in London says, how can praise be relevant? Praise. I think praise is, in a sense, a, a way of life. Mm -hmm. It's a praise in, in which you are thankful, you're grateful, uh, you're open to the universe, as it were. Um, thankful, grateful for what you have, which is you know, typical stoicism, not to complain about your situation. Um, and in that sense, it, it's a metaphor for, for living gratefully, living positively. Uh -huh. Ah, yes, interesting. Okay, um, one more question. This is from 017108. Question. Which are the sources of this hymn and how has it reached us today? Yes, we only have one source for the hymn, and that is in the anthology of John of Stoby, uh, Johannes Tobias, uh, from late antiquity. He um, included this in his, his anthology, which was meant for his uh, the educa education for, of his son. It contains a lot of other texts, philosophical and um, literary texts, but this is the only reference we have to this poem. But mm -hmm. in the in the margin of uh, uh, Stubbes's uh, work, it says Cleanthes, so we know it's from Cleanthes. Lovely, thank you. Um, Phil, if it's possible, I wouldn't mind bringing Cecily back to the stage with Johan. I do have a question to the actor. Um, I know that Cecily did a lot of, had a chat with Johan to prepare this and also did some study. Um, you dipped into the life of Cleanthes and as an actor, you were trying to ascertain what was his intention in this poem so that you could recite it as accurately as you as you could. So I would love to know some thoughts on just your act, the process um, that it took to bring us bring us the poem. Yeah, um, <clears throat> excuse me. It was a really interesting process. It was really interesting talking to Johan about it. Um, it's it was very different from working on a character, you know, as you might expect um, for a play or something, because you tend to be given quite a lot of background. And obviously we don't really know that much about Cleanthes. Um, but from what I did read, I mean, all of Johan's work um, that I could read uh, was my main source. Um, from, what, from what I did read, I sort of came to the conclusion that this was a man who really did believe in humanity. Um, and I saw a comment in the chat about is this some sort of admittance to human evil? And I actually think maybe it's the opposite, um, or at least that was the way I took it, was that it was a Cleanthe saying that humans might be inclined to be foolish, but that with help, with God's help, with the help of Stoicism, um, which are obviously very intertwined, uh, they can be good if we show them the way. And he was, if to me, this was a desperate plea to help people be better because I think Cleanthes believed in humanity and he believed that we could be better. Um, and so that was kind of where I went with the poem was just uh, was to give him the intention, give the poem the intention of, of really, really just pleading for humanity. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Well, thank you to you both for bringing Cleanthes to our conference today. Thank you, Johan, Tom. Thank you, Cecily, Thomas. Thanks all in the chat for your generosity. Um, it is time to move on to our next speaker. And that is Aiste Chilkite, who will talk about the Stoic theory of beauty. Aiste is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Leiden. She specializes in ancient Greco-Roman philosophy and science. She is the author of The Stoic Theory of Beauty. And please refer to your program uh, for more details about Aiste. Over to you, Aiste. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Kathleen. Um, so I'm struggling to share my screen. 
I think we'll just give Phil a second. He'll be able to. There you go. Oh, it. thanks, there Phil. We go. Over to you, Esther. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction. Very happy to be here. So, a discussion of the Stoic ideas about beauty really has to start with a problem the problem of indifference. Now, many of you are probably familiar with a passage that you see on the screen right now. Here we see that the Stoic value system consists of three categories. So we have the good, the bad, and the indifferent. Only virtues are the good. So these are intelligence, justice, courage, and so on and so forth. Their opposites, vices, are the bad, and everything in between, including beauty and its opposite ugliness, is just indifferent. So the Stoics assign one of these three categories to various objects and pursuits, depending on their relationship to happy life, eudaimonia. Since virtue is the good, acquiring virtue leads to uh, a happy life of flourishing as it's often translated these days. The indifference, which of course include beauty or lack of beauty, have no effect on happy life at all. So this is the problem that we arrive in right from the beginning. The Stoics, it seems, should not have any uh, interest in beauty. However, this is not entirely the case. As it turns out, the Stoics have a fairly nuanced approach to the indifference. And I think Epictetus is especially good at uh, explaining this nuanced approach quite well. In his discourses, Epictetus talks about uh, what we could call, uh, uh, perhaps could call a wannabe philosopher. So uh, he is describing people who adopt a philosophical lifestyle in a superficial way. So they demonstrably disregard their appearance, uh, growing out their hair, not bathing, and so on and so forth. And all of this is in order to demonstrate that they do not care about conventional goods. Epictetus makes fun of these uh, very superficial ways of living a philosophical lifestyle, and perhaps rightly so. He argues that it is important to approach each object and each activity in accordance to its proper value. So even if there are many things in the category of indifference, they are not all equal. Some of them are preferred, others are dispreferred. So for example, uh, uh, thinking about the case that he describes with these wannabe philosophers, since we are embodied creatures, it is entirely reasonable and in fact proper for us um, to take care of our bodies, even if um, as, a, as, as a Stoic, one might not consider that bodily health or bodily beauty is the good. So beauty has its place on the ladder of value. It's not a very high place. If you think that having many beautiful things will bring you happiness, you are wrong, according to the Stoics. Beauty is not the good, and it does not have the power to make anyone flourish, to, have, to lead a happy life. Uh, so, for example, um, no matter how many pieces of beautiful art you collect and you might surround yourself with, it can never bring true flourishing to your life. Now, having said all this, beauty is also not at the bottom of the ladder. It cannot harm you and everything else being equal, it is preferable to the lack of beauty or, or ugliness. It does have some inherent value, even if that value is entirely divorced from happiness. Uh, so for example, there is nothing wrong with hanging uh, some pieces of art uh, in your living space. Or when choosing a wallpaper for your kitchen, you might as well choose something that you find appealing, uh, perhaps something that brings you joy, 
rather than living in a white tiled cubicle. So in short, the Stoics can and sometimes uh, should be interested in beauty with a caveat that it is valued appropriately. Okay, so now in order to understand how to value beauty appropriately, we need to ask what beauty is exactly. We do have extant Stoic definition of beauty. It's pre preserved in several formulations. They are slightly different, um, but the core idea is always the same. Um, and I think uh, this is one of my favorite passages because here you can see what is at stake very, very clearly. So this passage coming from Arius Didymus uh, tells us that there are parallel definitions for the beauty of the body and the beauty of the soul. Just as the beauty of the body is proportionality of limbs with each other and with the whole, so the beauty of the soul is proportionality of logos, of reason, with its, uh, and its parts with each other and with the whole. Okay. So let's unpack this definition a little bit. The key term here is proportionality. In ancient Greek, it is symmetria. And um, one important side note is uh, that symmetria does not mean the lateral symmetry, sort of symmetry in the way that we use the term. It really means proportions that go together very well. Now, as a concept, symmetria is associated with a very famous sculptor, Polycletus, who figured out how to depict the human body so as to produce a beautiful statue. The trick, as it turns out, is to depict the parts in certain proportion to each other. And Polycletus described these proportions in a treatise called Canon. He also created a sculpture to illustrate his work, which was also just uh, happened to be called Canon. So on the screen right now, you see a copy of Polycletus statue Doriphorus, uh, which also presumably reflects his work and his ideas about Subetria. Unfortunately, the original Canon is not extant, so we have to look at uh, his other works. And in this case, this is a Roman copy of his original statue. Okay, so with this background, um, we can move on to the Stoic influence. So um, Polycletus' work had a huge impact on broader cultural discourses about beauty. In the classical period, uh, so this is around 5th century BC, we find many philosophers picking up and using the concept of symmetria in reference to beauty. So this might seem disappointing, right? In this respect, the Stoics are not very original. However, philosophers in the classical period typically approach symmetria as a property that beautiful objects have, not necessarily as the cause of beauty or the definition of beauty. So you might think about Plato, for example, who defines beauty or sort of who ultimately ascribes the origin of beauty to the form, or someone like Aristotle, who gives us a whole list of conditions that uh, an object has to meet in order to be beautiful. So the list includes symmetria, but it also includes order, definiteness, and magnitude. So Stoics, um, the Stoics are pretty unique in defining beauty strictly in terms of symmetria. Moreover, and this is even more important than sort of being quite original in that respect, they are unique in interpreting symmetria as a functional concept. So an object is beautiful, not only when its parts fit together, but also when those parts fit the whole. The whole, I would argue, has to be understood as the nature 
on the purpose of the object overall. So the Stoics are functionalists about beauty. Now, what does this mean exactly? I think the easiest way to understand the Stoic commitment to functionalist aesthetics uh, is just to look at the examples uh, of their uh, analysis of beautiful objects. Um, so let's start with very simple and uh, in some ways very intuitive example, beauty in people. So leaning into Polyclitean tradition, the Stoics have, of course, a very easy way of describing the bodily beauty. It is proportionality, uh, proportion of limbs. So uh, this is a very conventional way um, of describing beauty in their own original context. And perhaps even to us, I mean, we often talk of beauty as being uh, a matter of proportion. However, as we've seen in their definition of beauty, the soul, the beauty of the soul is also a very important element in their understanding of beauty. One of the so-called Stoic paradoxes claims that the most beautiful person is actually the sage. So we might think of someone like Socrates. Um, of course, the, the problem of the sage is ever present in Stoicism. Um, but uh, just hypothetically, if we had to think of a really, really wise person, of course, in ancient context, the first person that comes to mind is usually Socrates. And you, ha you have um, a statue of him on the screen next to Derbyphorus. And of course, this raises the question, why, according to the Stoics, someone like Socrates is more beautiful than Doriferos? And this is why I think the functional aspect of the Stoic concept of beauty becomes quite obvious. And this is, uh, anyone familiar with the Stoic uh, views would perhaps quite naturally start thinking about function of the human, our nature. So the nature of humans is, of course, to be rational. And a person who has beliefs in accordance to that nature, right, who fulfills that function, is the most beautiful one. So all of this fits quite neatly within the Stoic system. And despite the paradoxical nature of the Stoic claim, I think they tap into an intuition that many people do share, perhaps even today, that outwardly beautiful people can become quite unattractive when we learn that they are morally bad. And conversely, someone who is perhaps not perfectly proportioned uh, might come across as really, really attractive person if uh, we are uh, if we find their personality and their character appealing. Okay, now moving on from the people, another important example of beauty is the beauty of the world as a whole. So for the Stoics, the world is designed to be beautiful. It's designed rationally and providentially which means not only that the structure of the world is beautiful. So we have beautiful landscapes, beautiful uh, geological constructions, but also the world is full of beautiful things. One of the most striking examples of this is the peacock's tail. Now in in the text, in the passage that you have on the screen here, we have uh, one of the more striking proclamations of Chrysippus. So Plutarch here is citing him as saying that nature loves beauty and delights in variety. And the best example of this is the peacock's tail. So the peacock was created for the sake of the tail, and that also entailed the creation of peahens. So the entire species of this bird 
came into being just so there could be beautiful multicolored tails. Just so there could be a certain beautiful thing in this world. Now, just to iterate the stoic approach to indifference, this does not, of course, imply that we need to spend as much time as possible admiring these birds, right? The Stoics are not saying that we should drop everything and run to the zoo and look at the peacocks. What this means is that it's, it's only that beautiful objects such as peacocks' tails um, have certain value and it is entirely reasonable to acknowledge and to appreciate beautiful things for what they are. Okay, the attitude that everything needs to be valued appropriately and beauty has a certain uh, value is also evident in the Stoic approach to art. So, so far, we've been talking about natural objects, people and animals and the world, but the same is true when it comes uh, to our artistic creations and our engagement with art. So, for a little bit of context, some of you might be familiar with Plato's Republic. But even if you are not, it is enough to know that Plato taught that some art can be potentially morally harmful. And in the ideal city, only virtue promoting, uh, promoting art would be allowed. So if, if Plato was alive today, he would probably agree with the people uh, who sort of argue that video games are potentially harmful. It's, it's that, uh, that uh, style of argument. Now, given that the Stoics are very interested in virtue, we might think that this idea would appeal to them. But in fact, the Stoics are very liberal, right, when it comes to arts. Uh, the Stoics love citing tragedies. Uh, they engage with various poetic texts and the Stoics compose poetry themselves. And the best example of this is, of course, Cleanthes' hymn to Zeus, and we have just heard such a beautiful recitation of it. Now, uh, besides everything that's been said about the hymn already, I want to talk just a little bit about the reasons why Cleanthes decided to write the hymn. Why him in particular? There is a very boring reason. And uh, as someone who has education in classics, I feel I'm obliged to, to say it. So ancient philosophers wrote philosophical works in poetry. You might think of pre-Socratic Parmenides, or you might think about Epicurean Lucretius, who wrote a didactic poem in the hexameter about atoms and pleasure. But there is a more interesting reason too. We have a fragment of Cleanthes in which uh, he is cited as saying that poetic form is better than prose because it is more memorable and enduring. The themes that Cleanthes addresses in his hymn are of course very familiar. He talks about fate, free will, moral responsibility. The Stoics have many long and complicated arguments about all of those things. Uh, but in the hymn, all these themes come together and form a single coherent flowing imagery. And although Cleantes only says that poetic form is memorable and enduring, it seems reasonable to think that it is mem memorable because it is beautiful because beautifully arranged words stick in our minds much better. So the Stoic approach to art is uh, instrumental. If we needed a technical term for it, we could call it instrumental. Art can be uh, very helpful for our moral education and philosophical activities as a tool, as an instrument. But we do not need to uh, instruct artists to make the right kind of art. 
Art can neither impose virtue, nor can it genuinely corrupt like any other beautiful object. Uh, a person's virtue is always up to a person. And so perhaps Cleantes wrote the hymn for the same reason that the Stoic, the, the Stoic God is said to have created a peacock's tail, the peacock's tail, sorry, simply to have more beauty and variety in the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aiste. That was so interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much. And yeah, fill that chat with applause, everyone. Thank you for being so generous in the chat. Uh, you ended on a really good point. Um, and I have just one quick question. There, there are a couple of questions in the chat, but just one question I was thinking, um, just my relationship with beauty then. So you mentioned that the peacock um, exists in the world for the beauty of its tail. So it seems to me that the invitation then is like, worship the peacock, but actually it isn't. So yeah, could you just elaborate a bit more on that relationship between us, me, beauty. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. So it's um, not a very straightforward relationship. Um, as, as, as always with, with the Stoics and things like, like that, uh, I think we have to think about beauty on uh, a ladder of value in general, but also uh, I think there is a hierarchy. There is supposed to be a, a hierarchy of beautiful things. So something um, like peacock is uh, there to, to admire and, and enjoy, and it is rational, I think, to appreciate its existence. Um, but there is also the kind of beauty that we find in virtue, right? That's the really uh, uh, beauty that's supposed to attract us the most. That's our nature. That's our function. Um, and that is greater beauty. So I think um, maybe thinking back to the example of the uh, beauty of the body and beauty of the soul, it's somewhat similar, right? That um, peacock is on the level of uh, beautiful people walking around, and that's great, that's nice, but really the most beautiful thing is, of course, beauty of the soul and beauty of virtue, and this is really what, um, if we have the right set of beliefs, this is what attracts us the most, I think, that that's the idea. Mm. Okay, thanks. Um, We've got a couple more questions in the chat. Michael, I know you had a question, but I can't quite see it there. So you might want to repost it for me. Um, and let me just see. There was one question about jazz and would the Stoics oh. enjoy jazz and that very kind of, yeah. I don't know. There, someone okay. mentioned smooth jazz maybe, <laughs> but um really unsyncopated kind of jazz what do you think oh great question um i will go with a yes <laughs> <laughs> um because i think uh, the, the 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 stoics are really very open minded about the forms of creativity uh, that they engage with and i I've never come across in, in studying their attitudes to art that they um, describe any genre as inherently bad, right? It's everything is always up to us. This is, this is the, the mantra, of course, but it also is reflected in the way that um, we approach different styles of art. So if you find jazz instructive in some way in any in, in any way if if it is useful for you to practice virtue then i think the stoics would say that's fantastic yeah uh michael i think that potentially answers your question as well michael was asking um about what the stoics would say um 
about the beauty in discordant and the asymmetrical. So I think that, yeah, if it's instructive, if it's interesting, enjoy it. Um, but I, I think that's quite interesting that um, any forms of creative uh, expression don't harm us, right? It's up to us how, yes. how we uh, uh, respond to that. So that's quite interesting. Mm, that's yeah, quite interesting, interesting in terms of art, like <laughs> criticism, et cetera. Sorry, I, I still. Um, yeah. Yeah, th no, this this is really the wonderful thing about preferred indifference. They don't contribute to happiness, but they really can't harm you either. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, let me see what else is happening in the chat. I did spy another question. Uh, let's see. Jeff, Christu, your question. Uh, Lysippos really played with the proportions to accentuate certain elements. See the Hercules of the Forum, Boarium, for instance. Can you comment on this? Um, uh, yeah, so, so I, um, I think that is, that, that seems to be fitting the Stoic idea very much, right? That, uh, they are thinking about proportions, not in abstract, not as mathematical abstractions, but in reference to something, in, in reference to the purpose. So in, uh, in reference to certain statue, certain proportions might uh, become exaggerated um, and others diminished. So that seems to me very applicable to uh, the Stoic understanding of beauty. But I, I don't know. I would be happy to hear different opinions too. Mm. Interesting. Uh, thanks, Jeff, for the question. Uh, Terry in London's got a question. Functionalism. A comfortable and a serviceable shoe versus a Louboutin, which is that really high-heeled shoe. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Comfort versus perceived. Yeah. As, yeah, what do you think? Yeah, very good question. So I think almost definitely comfort. Mm. Uh, from um, we we don't have stoic reflection on shoes, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> but <Sandals>? um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but 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 they do um, they do seem to really lean into functionalism and the famous ancient argument about functionalism is um, it predates stoics it's actually in xenophon where he talks about uh, a golden soup spoon and a figwood soup spoon that makes um, soup smell nice and it's easy to stir and since stoics do seem to embrace and elaborate this functionalist tradition i think they would definitely go with a wooden spoon and they would go with a comfortable shoe too yeah that's my reasoning in any case but i'm also wondering whether the stiletto is appropriate in certain social gatherings and therefore like maybe for yeah. a wedding okay or, yeah yes that's right that's right okay so that I, I think there can be an argument made in that direction yeah. too so maybe right. um yeah, depends on As the context. To Mark in the chat said, doesn't Epictetus talk about jeweled shoes? Oh, um, I'm not sure about the context. I do not remember uh, the passage off the top of my head. He might do. Um, yeah. Okay, so I think that's it. Everyone, you have really incredible questions in the chat. We... We can't get to all of them, of course, but keep asking questions in the chat. I think they just open up the, the conversation in the chat and we can go away pondering those questions. Uh, but we will try and get to as many as we can during our Q&A sessions. But on that note, Aister, thank you so much. Thank you for your gorgeous book and very accessible to read book, The Stoic Theory of Beauty, which kind of inspired our conference today. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It's Thanks. been a pleasure. And a round of applause in the chat, everyone, again, for ISTE. And while you're doing that, I am going to introduce our next speaker. And uh, that is Massimo.
Hey, Massimo, nice to see you. Massimo Piglucci, everyone, whose presentation is titled, Did the Stoics Get Their Theory of Beauty Wrong? Massimo Piglucci is an author, blogger, podcaster, as well as the KD Irani Professor at, of Philosophy at the City College of New York. And of course, pop into your program to learn a bit more about what Massimo is up to these days. On that note, Massimo, over to you. Thanks, Katrin. Thanks for having me. Let me see to share the screen. And here we go. I assume people can actually see the slides. Looks great. So the Stoics get their theory of beauty wrong. I have to um, alert people that I'm here basically, uh, but likely as the uh, token skeptic. So my view will be will probably be quite different from some of the other speakers. And that's some more reason to generate discussion. So let's start talking about beauty. Uh, it's a noun, of course. It can be defined as a combination of qualities such as shape, color, or form that pleases the aesthetic senses, especially the sight. Or as a combination of qualities that pleases the intellect or moral sense. So there are at least two fairly distinct in modern parlance understandings of something that is beautiful. So here are some examples of beauty of the first kind, the first definition. So, you know, Michelangelo's Pieta, a beautiful landscape, uh, a butterfly, a painting by uh, Caravaggio, or my favorite, Oren Lamborghini. Here are examples of beauty in the second sense, the moral sense or the sense that is aesthetic in a more formal sense, like a mathematical equation, for instance. I mean, you may not think so, but that equation you see on the right is considered beautiful by a lot of mathematicians and physicists. Uh, so our moral acts, such as down there on the, on the lower right, the uh, people working for the International Rescue Committee, helping refugees, things like that, or, the work of literature, like Marcus Aurelius' Meditations, or I think would fall into these categories as well, a, a beautiful act of, of sportsmanship, such as a goal by Messi. Now, why do we care about this in the first place? Because our sense of duty, uh, of beauty, sorry, both in the formal and especially in the formal intellectual or moral sense, actually guides what to do, what we do. We are guided by beauty. We're attracted to beautiful things, of course, in the first sense, but also attracted to, to be in the more intellectual or moral sense. And therefore, it is actually a very practical concept. It's something that uh, it, it does alter your, um, your perception of things and therefore how you act on things. Now, as you've heard uh, just before my talk, uh, the Stoics too had a definition of beauty. And I highly recommend that this book, The Stoic Theory of Beauty. It's, it's absolutely the, uh, the word on, on the topic. So well, the couple, next couple of slides is simply a summary of what she said, just to get back to all on the same page. So beauty was understood by the Stoics as symmetria, which means a combination of two things, harmony of parts with each other and functional integration of those parts within the whole. For instance, here is an example of beauty according to Sumetra, right? All of these, all of the parts, both of the statue and actually of the human being that the statue represents are in harmony with each other. They, they all functionally integrated so that the statue in itself has a certain, certain characteristics. The human beings that is described by that statue has certain characteristics, especially, you know, in particular, it's capable of throwing the discus at long distances. Okay, so far, so good. Where does the trouble start? Well, in my opinion, of course. Well, the, the problem is, of course, that the stoic account of beauty as symmetria is in fact intimately linked to their understanding of the universe as providential and rational. This is not the only thing that is connected to that understanding. Uh, certain aspects of Stoic ethics, for instance, Stoic providence, the, the notion of Stoic providence, are also connected to this way of looking at the cosmos. This, in turn, is connected to their conception of the universe itself as being and the logos, famous logos, uh, that is 
reason. That's where we get the rationality of the universe and by uh, implication also the rationality of human beings as bits and pieces of the universe. This conception is part of the stoic general view of that it's sometimes referred to as pantheism, sometimes as panentheism. We're, we're not going to get into that discussion. Even scholars disagree whether uh, the Stoic view was pantheist or panentheistic. It doesn't matter for the purposes of this talk. What matters is that it's not theistic. So the, the, the Stoics were not, when they referred to Zeus or, or God, they were thinking of it as exactly the same as nature. It's not a God that is like the Christian one that is outside of nature and creates nature, etc., from the outside. Now, just to make the point, uh, because sometimes I've actually encountered modern Stoics who uh, don't actually think that what I just said is true, that is that that's the view of the ancient Stoics. Uh, here's a couple of quotes that make the point. This is Balbus, a Stoic speaking uh, in Cicero on the nature of the gods. He says, thus we can assume that the universe must possess wisdom and that the element which holds together all that exists excels in perfect reason. From this, we see that the universe is in fact God and that the vital force of the universe is held together by this divine nature. So this is a pretty clear statement and there are several others, not only in Cicero, but in other Stoic texts that pretty much make the same point. The universe is God, it's held together by divine rationality. Now, the Stoics had been wrong before, uh, and we as modern Stoic practitioners and students of modern Stoics, we have to remember that, you know, this is not a religion, it's a philosophy, and therefore it's evolving over time. These people were incredibly brilliant and had incredible insights for uh, being alive two and a half millennia ago or two millennia ago, but, you know, they did get some things wrong. And so it's okay to sort of question uh, what it is that they had in life modern science. Let me give you just a couple of examples. Uh, first of all, the famous ruling faculty, which is so important in Epictetus' philosophy, and it's mentioned multiple times by Marcus Aurelius, where they located it. They said that it was in a place, and unfortunately, they got it wrong. Uh, whatever you think the, the ruling faculty is, it's got to be a part of your mind, and therefore, we would say today of our brain, not just we today, Galen, who was, interestingly, Marcus Aurelius' own personal physician, also thought that it was in the brain, and he made merciless fun of the Stoics because they said it was in the heart. Understandable mistake by the standards of the medicine anatomy of the time, but nevertheless, they were clearly wrong. Cicero, uh, although he's not normally sympathetic to the Stoics, he actually severely criticizes them uh, in, his, in his book on divination for believing in divination. Again, the Stoics were not stupid. There were reasons why they believed in divination because they accepted universal cause and effect, uh, they basically for look if you predict the future, which is part of the web of cause back, you can look at other parts of the web of cause and effect and infer the future. Well, this is reasonable. This is what modern science does, except that they were looking at the wrong parts of the, or the least informative parts of that web, such as, you know, the entrails of animals, the, the flight of birds and things like that. So Cicero wrote the on divination as a, a criticism of the Stoics. And in fact, that book, as it turns out, is the first known book in the Western tradition that uh, tackles what we would today call pseudoscience. So there, there are, the Stoics have not always been right on things. That's my point. Now, as a scientist and a philosopher of science, I really just don't see how we can recover uh, the ancient Stoic conception of a universe understood as a living organism and that with the logos in terms of modern science. The pictures you're looking at on the left is the cosmological picture, the cosmological view, the, the, the last view, which is best described by Einstein's theory of general relativity, by the way, the same one that was captured in uh, that beautiful equation that I showed you a few slides ago. On the right, you see the traces uh, that are produced by subatomic particles in a particle accelerator, an experiment uh, in a, within a particle accelerator. That part of our understanding of reality is described by quantum mechanics. Now, if you talk to most physicists uh, today, they will tell you that nowhere, neither in cosmology, general relativity, nor in quantum mechanics, uh, you see anything like the, the conception of the universe that the Stoics had. Could we be wrong? Sure. 
but my best understanding of modern science is it's just not compatible. The, the universe is just not made the way in which the Stoics thought. And in fact, it gets worse because the question, one interesting question to raise is, you know, how did the Stoics themselves uh, defend their position? You know, how did they arrive at that conclusion that the universe is intelligent and et cetera and, and alive? Well, they basically used a number of, of arguments, one of which, uh, the, the most frequent one, which is recognizable today is a so-called argument from design. Here's an example. This is Balbus again in Cicero's On the Nature of the Gods. He says, if there is anything in nature that the human mind and reason or human strength and power cannot achieve, it is certain that such a thing must have been created by something superior to man. Now the heavenly bodies in their eternal order cannot have been created by man. Therefore, that which created them is superior to man. What would we call this creator other than God? This, and again, a number of other passages in different sources, not just Cicero. Um, put forth. In fact, even Epictetus has a bit of the discourses where he basically uh, outlines the equivalent of a modern argument from design. Problem is, arguments from design of that kind uh, are essentially credible. Ever since uh, David Hume and Charles Darwin, David Hume in the, in the 18th century, Charles Darwin in the 19th century, on respectively philosophical grounds and uh, scientific grounds have pretty much demolished arguments from design. So modern scientists don't take them seriously anymore. Of course, there's plenty of theologians who still take them seriously, but you know, uh, they are fighting a rare guard kind of action. They're not certainly not at the forefront of how we think about the universe and how it's structured. So that means we need a new account, in my opinion, of Sumetria. If Sumetria does not come from Zeus and the, and the rational and the logos, then where does it come from? Well, the peacock's tail is actually a perfect example uh, because of course, where does the peacock tail it, it come from? From evolution. It's a result of evolution, particularly for of something that biologists call uh, sexual selection. It has to do with the male, the, the male being able to attract the female and have babies. And that's what it's all about in, in evolutionary terms, survival and reproduction, mostly reproduction. Survival is in fact a fun, a, in, in so that you can get to the point of reproduction. Now, there is a discipline and approach that has been uh, proposed by, for a number of years by uh, modern psychologists and evolutionary biologists called evolutionary aesthetics. And the idea here is that our sense of beauty uh, is the result of evolution by natural selection and other, and other means. Uh, it is therefore still a functional theory of beauty. I'd like to highlight that. Just like the stoic one, we're still talking about beauty as being functional. And we are still explaining it in functional terms, but those terms are different. They're not cosmic. They, are, they have to do with the survival, survival and reproduction of members of a particular species of social primates on planet Earth. Um, what is beautiful to us is not beautiful to other living organisms, whether they're intelligent or not. And therefore beauty is not entirely arbitrary, uh, but it is relative to the particular species and to its own needs. Um, from a biological perspective. So to put them together, these two accounts uh, side by side and the Stoic account, as you just heard before uh, in the talk before, the peacock was created for the beauty of its tail. That's precipitous according to Plutarch. Uh, the evolutionary account is that the peacock's tail evolved in order to attract the female of the species. They're very different accounts and my money is on the second one, not the first one. Now again, why do we care? Yeah, all of this may seem like a, a completely academic discussion. It's like, okay, fine, the, the Stoics fought this, the modern, the, the, the ancient Stoics, maybe we think we are justified in thinking differently. So, well, as I said at the beginning, beauty is a guide uh, still today for human beings to decision making. And so it actually has practical consequences. And presumably here, we're interested in especially in the practical consequences of things like any good Stoic would be. So here is Aista herself. Uh, she says in, in her book, the equivalence of ethical and aesthetic value implies that shares the properties of the full and the beautiful shares the properties of the good. For the Stoics, beauty is a property built into the world. As we said, from an evolutionary perspective, it's not a property built into the world. It's a property relative to a particular type of biological beings. 
Again, I start. It is possible to draw an analogy between the stoic use of aesthetic properties as special attributes of the good and the use of aesthetic properties by scientists as special attributes of especially apt scientific theories. When a scientist is faced with two theories with equal truth value and she prefers the one which she considers to be, for instance, the more elegant, she makes the judgment based on the theoretical virtue. This is all true. Uh, a number of scientists do that. And this connects basically the uh, sort of formal aesthetics uh, to the um, uh, intellectual value or the moral value, if we were not talking about science, but we we're talking about ethics. Now, the problem is that this connection comes it's very natural if you accept something like storage. It does not, it falls apart entirely on the other hand. Uh, well, I shouldn't say entirely. It falls apart to some extent if you accept an evolution account of things. And in fact, in recent years, so, so this is the basic structure of what we're talking about, you know, right? Beauty is, truth is beauty, truth is beauty, etc. Right? So people could be using aesthetic sense as a guide to truth, and that would be a mistake even when scientists do it. Uh, in fact, there have been a number of books uh, and, and uh, uh, that, that in detail criticize this specific approach. These are just two examples. One, is, the one on the right is by Jim Baggett, who is a physicist. The title says it all, Farewell to Reality, How Modern Physics, physics Has Betrayed the Research for Scientific Truth. The one on the left is by a mathematician and theoretical physicist, and, and it's even more explicit, lost in math, how beauty leads physics astray. Beauty is not, formal beauty is not a good guidance to uh, truth. And I would argue also uh, to ethical truth. Sometimes uh, things that are beautiful will turn out to be in fact true, um, but a lot, some, some of the times that's not the case. So you cannot use it as a, Reliable guide, and uh, particularly Sabine Asenfelder, the author of the book on the left, actually goes through a number of examples from the recent history of science where ugly theories turned out to be true and beautiful theories turned out to be wrong. Not only that, but it gets dangerous even at a you know day-to-day -day, uh, level of the interactions between people. Forget scientists and mathematicians. Uh, this is one of a number of article papers that have come out in the psychological literature recently. And it has to do with what is sometimes called the attractiveness halo effect. Uh, this is the notion that, as it turns out, people uh, assume uh, wrongly that if a person is beautiful or attractive, aesthetically attractive, she or he is also trustworthy, responsible, etc. Here is a direct connection between the sort of the formal aesthetic appearances of something and the ethical moral value of that something. It turns out there is in fact no connection between the two. Ugly people are just as likely to be trustworthy or responsible or untrustworthy or irresponsible as beautiful people, but people do make that connection uh, and they make mistakes as a result. They discriminate, they make mistakes as far as personal decisions are concerned and so on and so forth because they trust people that they shouldn't be trusting. So the take-homes from this whole uh, approach are the following. The Stoics did think of beauty as symmetry, which is a concept that implies, as we said before, harmony among parts, as well as functional relationships between the parts and the whole. They connected this theory, derived this theory from their con conception of a rational living cosmos, but modern science does not appear to be compatible to support the Stoic notion uh, of the structure of the cosmos. But even when science provides a real alternative to explain symmetria, and that is the concept of evolutionary aesthetics. And as a practical step, we need to be very careful when we are drawing connections between beautiful, the good, and the true, both as scientists and as lay people, because that connection is actually not reliable. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. And uh, let me leave you with one more slide, which is basically advertisement for myself and for John, John Sellers, uh, who is coming a little later to give you a talk. Uh, we and a few others recently formed something that we call the School for a New Stoicism. If you're interested, check it out at newstoicism.org. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Massimo. Round of applause in the chat with your chat, uh, your applause emojis, everyone. Um, and Massimo's new school, there is a link to that in the program as well on Massimo's page. So do 
check that out and support this uh, wonderful new initiative. Okay, I can see about four questions in the chat that are pretty solid. Eric, we might keep your question for the next speaker uh, who will be talking about harmony. Um, and if Mark, Trumbull and Ali, could you just repost your questions for me? Because they've probably lost up there for me. But uh, let me start with uh, Michael's question, which is pretty groovy. Hey, Michael. Uh, Michael asks, how would you distinguish scientists and mathematicians desire for elegant theories, theorems from the principle of Occam's razor? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. Yeah, you're right. So that is the problem with the, with the principle of Occam razor. It's just a heuristic. It's not a law of nature. Right? So as it turns out, it's a practical thing. Uh, as it turns out, it makes sense. So first of all, let me step back for a second. Occam's razor simply says that whenever we're considering alternative explanations for a particular phenomenon or set of phenomena, we should prefer the simplest explanation, one that makes the least possible hypothesis invokes the least possible number of, of hypothetical entities. Now, this makes eminent sense from a practical perspective, but there is no guarantee that nature actually is simple or that the simplest hypothesis is, in fact, the, true, the truth. Uh, so people, the philosophers and scientists tend to use Occam's razor as a first approach, as a guideline. It's like, okay, let's go there first, because why do I want to complicate my life? Is if, if it turns out that a simple hypothesis is going to do the work, then fine. But it's not a general principle. There is nothing in the structure of the universe that says that things are going to have to be simple. And so it's similar for the beauty thing. You know, you may want to, if you have two equations and one of them seems ugly to you, um, fine, go for, this, for the one that you think is beautiful. But be careful, because if you assume that beauty is, itself is a guide to truth, then, then you, you, you're likely to make a mistake. Mm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Evelyn, Evelyn, you've got a question in the chat for Massimo. Evelyn asks, how can you explain aesthetic experiences, for example, seeing beautiful nature, if beauty is only functional? Well, the beauty is functional for in term, terms of evolutionary aesthetics, beauty is functional to survival and reproduction. And people have actually, one of the typical examples that people, students of evolutionary aesthetics bring up is exactly our uh, reaction to landscapes. What kinds of landscapes do we find beautiful and which, and which ones do we don't find beautiful, we find actually uh, scary, for instance, or something like that. The idea is that landscapes that are calming psychologically or that are attractive from a functional perspective because they are, for instance, calm bodies of water where you can find plenty of fish, but there are no storms, uh, things like that. Um, those are we find beautiful. But if we look at things and therefore there are guidance essentially for survival. However, I want to caution here because when people tend to think about evolution, about evolution, they think about biological evolution. And the thing about human beings is that our biological evolution, uh, more or less a few tens of thousands of years ago, has been uh, accompanied also by what now people refer to as cultural evolution, which works by different, different means. So you should not take evolutionary aesthetics as explaining every aspect of the, let's say, aesthetic experience of modern human beings, because modern human beings did not evolve in the place to see uh, so we're talking about only very basic stuff that has to do, for instance, the fact that we find symmetrical things uh, you know, more attractive than asymmetrical ones. Uh, generally speaking, that's true. And there is a very nice biological explanation for that. And that is uh, asymmetrical uh, human beings and asymmetrical creatures in general often are the result of developmental mistakes and mutations. So, so symmetry is a uh, indication of health. But of course, if we stop there, we would never understand Picasso. Uh, there's nothing symmetrical there. It's, 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 it, this whole thing is about breaking symmetry. And yet people find a Picasso's paintings attractive. But that's because we have now experienced tens of thousands of years of cultural evolution that tends to superimpose itself and interact with biological evolution. So I would, I would caution uh, from, from to a very sim simple, simplistic uh, analysis of evolutionary aesthetics. It's not, it's not quite simple. Mm. So interesting. Okay, um, let's have a look at what else we have in the chat. Okay, Mark, Mark Trumbull asked, 
uh, does evolution and adapting to the environment not assume the unity of that which adapts and the whole in which it adapts to and shapes? So there's an assumption that, yeah, so does evolution and adapting to the environment not assume the unity of that which adapts and the whole in which it adapts to and shapes? Well, of course, evolution, does, it's, not a, it's not an agent, so it doesn't assume anything. It either works or it doesn't, right? Natural selection is a natural process, so you need to think of natural selection the same way in which you would think about gravity, let's say. Gravity doesn't assume anything. Gravity just is, and it works in a certain way. Uh, now, however, I understand, I think, the, the, the basic um, structure, you know, the, the basic idea behind, behind the question. Biologists have shown pretty convincingly on empirical grounds that uh, natural selection works at different, in multiple levels. So it works on whole organisms, which is what Darwin thought. Darwin's idea starts out with natural selection working on entire organism. It's, it's the entire organism that relates to its environment and it's either adaptive or it's not. However, later on, biologists have shown that actually evolution happens in multiple levels, one of which the obvious one is the genetic level. There is evolution directly on individual genes, uh, the kind of stuff that Richard Dawkins has been talking about for decades, for instance, if you're interested. It also works at the other level. Um, people have shown that the evolution at a group level uh, within, you know, on, for, on entire populations that are structured in certain ways uh, and where the individuals are genetically adapted in certain ways. So, uh, no, it's not just one whole, one, one structure. It's actually multiple levels, not infinite levels, but, but multiple levels. Okay. Thanks, Flasmia. Thanks for the question, Mark. Um, got a question from Mac here. Are the Stoics telling us that it's okay to appreciate beauty but not desire it? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, well, beauty, as we said, as, as um, uh, you've heard in the, in the first talk, is falls into the preferred or dispreferred indifference. And so, yeah, you shouldn't be desiring it. You, you can appreciate it, uh, but the only thing you, you need to desire is virtue, not, not beauty, right? So beauty is one of those things that it uh, allows you to exercise your virtue by using it in one way or, or another. And so if you use it properly, then you're being virtuous. If you you're not. But since it is an indifferent, meaning literally something that does not make a difference to your uh, character and, and virtue, then yeah, you, I guess you shouldn't desire it. Just like you shouldn't desire health or, or wealth or anything like that. But if you have them, you ought to be using them in certain ways. Okay. Thanks, Massimo. And I hope that was a good answer for you, Mac. Um, I do have another question in the chat, quite a nice one. Um, Constantine Muska asks, what about the awe in face of natural world, of the natural world? What about the awe that we experience in the face of natural world that doesn't provide a practical benefit? For example, Red Rock Canyon. Red Rock Canyon. Right. So uh, actually, people have argued that awe itself, awe is a type of aesthetic experience, and and awe itself does have uh, is a result of evolution. Why are you awed at the view of the Grand Canyon? Uh, you know, we, my wife, we went to the Grand Canyon just a few years ago, and yes, it definitely there is a sense of awe. And awe means also, it also means you're keeping your distance from the from the from the edge. Why? Because if you fall inside the Grand Canyon, you're dead, my friend. So awe is a, is, in, in, is a reaction that also instills respect and a cautious distance from the kinds of things that you'd be awed by. Again, however, just like I said before, let's not read only biology into this. We do feel awe about things that are clearly culturally constructed. And what, bio, what, what culture evolution does is it basically uses the same kinds of the same kind of structures and reactions that have evolved by biological evolution, and then it applies it to other things. Let me give you just one interesting example, if we have one minute of time. And that is psychologists have found recently an interesting connection between our sense of disgust and our moral judgment. Right? So there are certain things that disgust you, like, oh, you know, the idea of a child being beaten or something like that, or a puppy being beaten, even worse. Uh, those are disgusting things you feel repulsion right now why where does that come from well it turns out that a sense the ability of us to, to feel repulsion is actually adaptive think about the kinds of things that 
you feel repulsion to, like bad food, you know, run smelling food. It's a good thing that you're repulsed by that kind of food because if you do eat it, uh, you're very likely to get sick or, or get or, or even or even die. Right now, cultural evolution has essentially used that kind of pre-existing sense of rejection and disgust for certain things, and it has applied it to things that clearly for which it really clearly did not evolve, such as disgust to, it's about certain. Uh, either moral or aesthetic experiences. And, and that's how the interaction between biological and cultural evolution works. It's, it's, it's wonderful, but we're just beginning to understand it, especially the, the cultural part. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Massimo. Thank you, everyone, for your amazing questions in the chat. Um, hopefully, we'll save that chat for you because I think those questions will guide us to continue learning about this subject. Yes, a round of applause in the chat with your applause emojis. Thanks, as always, Massimo, for some uh, interesting thoughts. Um, and yeah, see you. Thank you. All right, everyone, it is time for me to introduce our next speaker. I'd really like to introduce and welcome. David Feidler, who will be speaking about harmony and proportion. David is, of course, the author of the much-loved book, Breakfast with Seneca. Pop into your program for some more details about David. We're going to bring him up in a video. We um, David chose to record his talk um, just to beat some tech issues, but uh, I'm going to hand it over to Phil, who will set us up with David. Hi there, my name is David Feidler, and in this presentation, I'm going to focus on three simple questions that will show how we could create a more beautiful world using harmony and proportion. In short, what did beauty mean in ancient philosophy? Why are things beautiful? And how did artists and architects draw on these ideas of proportion and harmony to create beautiful works and a more beautiful world? Eisty has done a wonderful job of describing Stoic ideas about beauty in her talk and book, The Stoic Theory of Beauty. As she explains, beauty arises in natural and living structures because of a harmonious proportional relationship between the parts. It's part of the Pythagorean and Platonic tradition. And this emphasis on proportion, harmony, and beauty was one of the central characteristics of Greek civilization. One of the most important things to understand about beauty is that philosophical thinkers, at least since Pythagoras and up through the Renaissance, considered beauty to be an objective aspect of nature. It was only very recently in the 1700s that people began to think of beauty as being subjective, or as the saying goes, only in the eye of the beholder. Classical thinkers never believed that, and there's a reason why. When we look at the forms of nature, they all consist of whole part relationships. And the way that nature integrates parts within a whole is usually through proportion and harmony. This is the Pythagorean, Platonic, and Stoic definition of beauty, and even Aristotle agreed with it. For example, if we look at this photo of a galaxy, we clearly see the whole part structure of the galaxy, and these stars making up the galaxy are mathematically arranged in relation to one another through proportion and harmony, which gives rise to the radiance of beauty. Ancient philosophers, of course, could not see galaxies since they didn't have telescopes, but their understanding of nature's beauty was so fundamentally correct that they anticipated the empirical beauty of this galaxy we can see today. In another case, the inner parts of this flower are arranged mathematically through proportion and harmony. Specifically, this mathematical ratio is the phi ratio or the golden ratio, which we find in many living forms. This proportion allows the flower to unfold in the most economical and efficient way or to work in the best possible way. And this gives rise to beauty through symmetria, literally a common mathematical measure or ratio. It also gives rise to the objective kind of beauty in nature that serious thinkers were concerned about. 
for over 2,000 years. Another place we find the golden ratio or fee proportion in nature is in the arrangement of leaves on many kinds of plants. This is because the fee proportion is a unique mathematical ratio that is ideally suited to integrating parts within a larger whole. And in this structure of this plant, uh, like many other plants, this ratio is being used by the plant to distribute its leaves in a kind of swirled pentagonal pattern for a very specific reason, because by using this ratio, it allows each leaf to receive the maximum amount of sunlight. So by using this ratio, the plant employs symmetria, a single mathematical proportion, which allows each leaf to receive the maximum amount of sunlight. And it allows the plant as a whole to function very well, to function in the best possible way. Like these other examples, the human hand is a whole, but it's made up of parts. So while our hands operate as a unit, we have fingers and our fingers are made up of phalanges or finger bones. But again, the proportions of the finger bones are not random. They are arranged according to the continuous geometrical proportion of the golden section or fee ratio. The reason for this is that this proportion integrates the part with the whole and it allows our hands to open and close in the best possible way. And this also shows how the human hand embodies symmetria. All the parts are unified into a whole by a single geometrical ratio, the golden section or one to 1.618034 dot, dot, dot. Other mathematical ratios are used in the forms of nature to allow for the deployment of form in time and space and to allow different organisms to function in the best possible way, like this and other butterflies. Importantly, when we speak about things functioning in the best possible way, we are really talking about excellence. We are speaking about virtue and goodness. And from this, we can see that beauty is a byproduct or a kind of radiance originating from goodness or fitness in nature. It's a kind of harmonious radiance displayed by the fitness of nature's forms and processes. Now, significantly, according to many ancient reports, the Greek philosopher Pythagoras was the first to call the universe a cosmos because the Greek word cosmos means beautiful order. So when Pythagoras made this statement, he was saying that beauty is one of the fundamental aspects of nature. Now, if we look at this from a Stoic perspective too, the Stoics said there were only two things that embodied perfect virtue. The first thing that embodies perfect virtue or excellence is nature or the cosmos. And the second thing that embodies perfect virtue would be a Stoic sage, if we could only find one. So logically, for a Stoic, anything that embodies perfect virtue or excellence would have to be beautiful too. And in other words, nature for a Stoic, by definition, would have to be beautiful physically in the same way a Stoic sage would be beautiful morally. In fact, this is how the Stoics could draw this parallel between physical and moral beauty. Finally, another important Pythagorean term is harmony or harmonia, which in ancient Greek means fitting together. And when philosophers used this term, they meant fitting together through mathematical proportion. So by now, we should have a very good idea of how symmetria, proportion, and harmony give rise to beauty in nature's whole part relationships. The next question is, how could we apply these same principles in art and architecture to create a more beautiful world? And the answer to this is quite simple. In order to create beautiful things, we only need to 
follow nature, as the Stoics would say. And this was the basis of artistic and architectural theory from ancient Greece through the Renaissance. In other words, the way that you follow nature in creating art and architecture is to simply apply the same mathematical proportions and harmonies that nature uses to harmonize the parts within its whole systems. Nature, it turns out, has been learning how to do this for a very long time. And traditionally, there were three ways that artists and architects accomplished this. First, you can use whole number ratios or proportions, and the ratios of musical harmony are whole number ratios, and they were especially favored. The other way is to use the harmonious geometrical ratios which occur in nature's forms. And in terms of the first approach, which involves using whole number ratios, we can look at the design of the Parthenon in Athens, which has often been considered one of the most beautiful buildings in the world. And when we look at the Parthenon, we can see that it is based on a single mathematical ratio that determines its entire structure. And this is the ratio of four to nine. So if we look at the top level of the Parthenon or the stylobate as it's called, we see that it is a perfect four to nine rectangle. Secondly, the rectangular front elevation of the Parthenon is also in the ratio of four to nine, imagine that. And finally, if the width of a Parthenon column is four units, the spacing between the center of the columns is nine units. So that is another four to nine ratio. What we can see from this is that the entire structure of the Parthenon is governed by the single mathematical ratio of four to nine. So this is also an example of symmetria, a single common measure or ratio that harmonizes all the parts of a structure into a common unity. The other way that artists and architects used proportion was through the ratios of natural geometry, the geometry that nature itself uses. The most common geometrical ratios used in art and architecture are shown in this illustration. The square root of two, which is the ratio of the square. The square root of three, which is the ratio of the equilateral triangle, and the golden ratio or phi proportion, which is the ratio of the pentagon and a geometrical ratio most commonly found in living forms. Leon Battista Alberti, who was a major architect of the Renaissance and also a Stoic philosopher, wrote extensively about how to use harmony in creating beautiful architecture, and he used these principles in his work. Alberti used the Latin word conchinitas, which has the same meaning as the Greek word harmonia, integrating the parts of a whole through mathematical proportion. In Latin, conchinitas literally means something skillfully joined together. In the definition of Alberti, beauty, or conchinitas is that reasoned harmony of all the parts within a body so that nothing may be added, taken away, or altered, but for the worse. Conchinitas, or harmony, for Alberti is the central organizing principle in nature. And Alberti discusses at length how beauty in architecture attempts to mirror the mathematical order of nature. Now, there are many examples I could show of how these principles were actually applied in Renaissance art and architecture, which I will be showing in an upcoming two-hour presentation in Italy just a few days from now. But unfortunately, I only have time to share one in-depth example today. And today, we'll look at one of the most famous buildings of the later Renaissance architect, Andrea Palladio who synthesized the knowledge of all the earlier architects. Palladio designed dozens of villas below Venice and gave plans for them all in his famous book, Four Books on Architecture. We'll now look at one of his most famous villas, commonly called 
Villa La Rotonda, which is based on the geometry of both a circle and a square facing in four directions. This is a photo of the villa at night, which is so incredibly beautiful. And this is a close-up photo of the villa during the daytime. And this is a photo of the columns of the villa near one of the entrances. And whenever I see this image, I think of just sitting there and drinking some coffee in the morning and having philosophical conversations with my friends. Uh, this is the original published plan of Palladio's villa, which I had traced into Adobe Illustrator with 100% accuracy. And this is the exact copy of the original ground plan that I had made. Now, if we look at the geometry behind this, we can see that the ground plan is based on a series of interlocking squares. And these squares relate to one another through root two, or the square root of two, which is the mathematical ratio that defines the entire structure. Then we can look at the elevation of the villa. And if we analyze that too, we can see that it is based on exactly the same geometry and the same mathematical ratio, but arranged vertically rather than horizontally. This defines the composition of the entire building and even the placement of the statues, which is just amazing. We'll now trace out exactly how the geometry and the proportions are based on the square root of two. So starting with this small square, you can see this circular arc leading down from its corner. And what this means is that this next square is larger than the smaller square exactly by the square root of two. This next square also is larger than the previous one by the square root of two exactly. And the same is true for the last and final squares. So all of these squares are larger than the previous ones by the square root of two in continuous geometrical proportion. In addition, the scale of the ground plan and the vertical elevation are perfectly linked. All the measurements, both horizontal and vertical, are exactly the same. In the end, every aspect of the entire building, both horizontally and vertically, is in perfect harmony and perfect symmetria, because every part is unified by a common measure or ratio, the square root of two. In reality, every part of the building is unified with every other part in the same way that parts of organisms make up a living whole. So the building's design makes up a perfect unified whole, just like the world or the cosmos we live in. In the end, I hope this short talk has summarized how we discover harmony and proportion in nature. It's discovered, it's not invented. And how these same harmonies and proportions can be applied to create architecture and artwork, which some people even do today. And that's because this knowledge was never really lost or it was never entirely lost. It's still there if you look for it. It was just ignored in the name of utilitarianism, modernism, and reductionism, usually by people who didn't know any better. Unfortunately, the result of this is that we went from having a relatable, human-centered architecture like this building on the top to this utterly dehumanizing form of modernist architecture shown below. From a philosophical perspective, we know the universe is a cosmos, a beautiful order. And if we follow nature, like the Stoics suggest, we would want to live in a beautiful world also. And this is why architecture of all the arts is the most important in terms of the direct impact it has on our lives every day. Because if we try to mentally tune out something as ugly and dehumanizing as, as the so-called modernist buildings, they will unavoidably have a negative impact on our lives and on our psychological state. In the end, it's like Seneca said, the people you surround yourself with will have a major impact on the development of your character, either for good or for bad. 
Likewise, if we create an ugly world separated from the beauty of nature, we will by definition be living in an unnatural environment, a dehumanizing environment that goes against the harmony and beautiful order of the cosmos that we as human beings are truly meant to occupy. Fortunately, there is hope for a more beautiful world, assuming that we want to live in one. So this in part is an issue involving will and desire. We have to want it to happen. And for example, there are projects taking place right now to transform areas with ugly, unharmonious architecture and to enhance them with more beautiful buildings, which deeply impact and nurture the human spirit and our well being. One source that inspires hope in this direction is the new traditional architecture group on Facebook, which regularly publishes before and after photos showing new, more beautiful building projects. So while things can get worse, they can also get better. And the key to producing beautiful architecture in the end is knowledge. And these are just a few examples of some building projects that can give us hope for a more beautiful world. This, for example, is a building project from Paris where some virtuous architect has created a more beautiful neighborhood. And this example is from Budapest showing the restoration of a shopping mall. And finally, uh, this is another example from France showing the creation of a very livable and beautiful neighborhood. In any case, I hope this talk highlighted why beauty in our built environment is so important since it helps us to more deeply connect with the deep harmony and beauty of nature, the beautiful cosmos of which we all are a part. And finally, if you'd like to read more about this, please read my article on Living Ideas Journal, the Living Ideas Journal website, How Beauty Can Save the World, and join the Living Ideas Journal mailing list to learn about future articles. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much, David. Um, and I just noted Tom's comment in the chat, what a hopeful ending to that talk. Pop up on the stage and join me, everyone in the chat, a round of applause. Use that applause emoji for David. Lots of great comments in the chat and um, quite pleasing, said Emily. Um, everyone, actually, could I just call on Harley Manning, Eric and Joelle? Could you just repaste your questions for me? Joelle, it was the pie question. Um, Eric on harmony and Harley, the question about efficiency and beauty. Uh, but David, I've got one to start off, and it's actually my question. But um, okay. was it? It's but it's not. Someone else asked it in the chat. I think it was Jeff Christie. So this is Jeff's question: How can this harmony proportion translate into everyday architecture, um, the architecture of our home? So I'm particularly interested in how to translate these wonderful ideas into, yeah, how do we make our homes more harmonious? Uh, right. Well, that's an interesting question. Of course, uh, the best thing is to design a home to be harmonious in the first place, because you can't go back and change the proportions of rooms and things like that. But you have to keep in mind, perhaps, like what the whole idea behind this is. And what that is, is basically to uh, replicate the harmonies of nature, because um, and that's why the artists engaged, why they use these ratios, because it creates a, sort of like an unconscious feeling or a gestalt. And so what I would recommend, actually, is that if you're interested in learning more about this, there are a lot of very unreliable sources about like the the golden proportion. But, but this book is totally reliable, The Golden Section, Nature's Greatest Secret and Proportion in Art and Architecture. They're both by friends of mine. The guy who wrote the book on the golden section has a PhD in philosophy. So you can learn about this and expand your knowledge and start seeing the world in a different way. But if, but if you really want to make your home beautiful, one thing that you could do is you could add photographs of nature. That would be like a very simple first step because they've done studies in environmental psychology that when people are exposed to the beauty of nature, they feel more tranquil and they they produce 
higher quality work and they, they, they work more efficiently as well. And there's a whole, there was a whole book written about this called the biophilia hypothesis. And it was a bit silly actually, because it was like presenting this idea. Isn't it shocking? Maybe, maybe human beings actually do feel better when they're around nature. Maybe they need nature to be healthy. So it seems like that just went against yeah. thousands of years of common sense, but. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, thanks, David. I have a question um, from Eric, who says, so Roger Scruton stressed the importance of harmony as well, but he also mentioned that some of the great works of architecture often depend for their beauty on the humble context that these lesser beauties provide. Grand, beautiful buildings, if they're crammed together, would lose their beauty. So do Stoics recognize the problem of too much beauty or the context of beauty where whether something is beautiful depends on its environment, not just on whether something is beautiful in isolation? Mm. Well, I think there's some truth to that. And uh, Aristotle actually had a virtue that he called magnificence. And it was the idea of creating beautiful things on a really grand scale, like grand architecture. But he also said that you know, like a child's toy could embody magnificence as well. So you can find beauty on, on all levels, obviously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have one a question. Thing I would from... like to add, yeah. One thing I would like to add though, is that <clears throat> um, it is very interesting how evolution plays into beauty. And I agree with Massimo on that point, but there is one thing that I think Massimo is overlooking and that is, that he's overlooking the mathematical structures of beauty and also the question of why nature operates <clears throat> according to these mathematical proportions and laws. And so evolution can be part of it, but we can't overlook the underlying laws of nature that are part of evolution too. So to have a complete theory, you would have to integrate both of those parts. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, mat the mathematics is quite uh, a challenging question there. Um, and I'm glad you brought it up because Joel in the chat is asking about pi, the irrational number. So how is pi an irrational number that cannot be expressed as proportion be related mm. to beauty? Yeah. Well, actually, none of these ratios can be expressed as whole numbers. For example, like the square root of two and the square root of three, and someone men and and these these so called root ratios like the square root of two and three and the phi ratio they have all these unique mathematical properties. And someone mentioned that, for example, like our stationary here in Europe is a root two rectangle, and the reason for that is that if you take a root two rectangle and you you fold it in half, you get another root two rectangle, and if you fold that in half you get another root two rectangle. And all of these root ratios have these unique mathematical properties like that. If you take a root three rectangle, it will decompose into three root three rectangles that are smaller encompassed by it. And so as far as all of these, all of these ratios are irrational and the circle is just a, a basic uh, foundation of, of all geometry. And from the circle, you can generate all these geometrical forms. So. It was considered to be the most perfect geometrical form in the minds of many ancient philosophers. Absolutely fascinating. David, um, you really presented us with a very beautiful presentation and uh, we've got a lot to, to work with on that one. And I'd like to thank you again. Big round of applause in the chat, everyone, for David Feidler. Um, the two books that David showed us are linked in the program on David's bio page. So pop on over and check those yeah, out. Those are and really David's nice. also got an introduction, an, an invitation to some of his programs. And so a round of applause for David, everyone. And on that note, it is time to take a bit of a break. I am going to introduce our next speaker. Uh, and that is Brittany Polat. Um, Brittany Polat will talk about the inspirational power of moral beauty. Brittany is a Modern Stoicism team member, founder of the non-profit Stoicare and author of Journal Like a Stoic. I'm going to pop a link to the program into the chat so you can learn more about Brittany. But for now, Brittany, so glad to have you here. Over to you. 
Thank you, Catherine. Thank you to both you and Phil for hosting this amazing conference where we are all learning so much about such an underappreciated aspect of Stoicism and Stoic philosophy. So thank you for having me. I will be speaking about one specific aspect of beauty. So I know our speakers this morning did an awesome job of covering beauty in general. What was the stoic position on beauty? So we are going to focus in on one aspect, which is moral beauty or inner beauty, you might say. So, oh, sorry, my screen is not advancing. There we go. Um, so the first part of the talk will be looking at what is moral beauty. So we'll start with the ancient Stoics and we will move fast forward about 1600 years to the Earl of Shaftesbury in England. And then we'll come up to contemporary times. How can we approach moral beauty? What does it mean for us today? And then the second segment of the talk will be some suggestions for how we can cultivate moral beauty today and make our lives more beautiful. All right. So ancient Stoics on moral beauty. Again, we've already had a lot from our previous speakers, so I won't really dwell too much on this, but we've seen that virtue is beauty for the Stoics. Only the beautiful is the good. This was an idea from Chrysippus. Um, beauty is proportionality and functionality. So I did, really presented this. David described how this might apply to architecture. We'll hear later on about how this applies to other external things. But for our purposes here, we are thinking about beauty as internal. So we can we have this big definition of beauty, but we can also apply it to the human character and say that this internal structure, and of course, we all know that the Stoics were really big on emphasizing consistency internal harmony, constancy, this is all structured by virtue, right? And, and it's functioning as the best of a human being when we show wisdom and justice towards others, for example. So I like this quote from Cicero. And by the way, I, I'm relying on Eista's book, The Stoic Theory of Beauty, which you saw earlier. But um, Cicero's quote is, when used of the body, the word beauty refers to a nice configuration of the limbs together with a pleasant coloring. Okay, so we have kind of a physical equivalent here. But internally, similarly, beauty of mind means an evenness and consistency in the opinions and judgments. So our, our inner perspective, our inner outlook, together with certain toughness and stability, either following upon virtue or identical with it. So very closely related to virtue here. So we have this bigger conception of what beauty is and specifically how it applies to our inner lives. And of course, we have a quote from Seneca, which illustrates this really well. So this is from his letters on ethics. He says, if we could examine the mind of a good man, oh, what a beautiful, what a sacred sight we would see. What grandeur, what calm would shine forth in it and what constellations of the virtues, justice on one side, courage on the other, moderation and prudence over there. Besides these frugality, self-control, endurance, generosity, and cheerfulness would shed their light upon it and human kindness. Foresight too, and refinement, and most outstanding of all, greatness of spirit. What grace, and by God, what dignity would these bestow? How great its authority would be, and how much appreciated, beloved it would be, yet at the same time revered. So I love this because Seneca is, of course, he's describing virtue. These are things we would all recognize as a description, a pretty much standard description of virtue, you know, wisdom, justice, temperance, moderation, the cardinal virtues, as well as some others like frugality, cheerfulness, endurance, which we would classify underneath the cardinal virtues, but he couches it in aesthetic terms, right? So grandeur and, and this idea of radiance, light, he uses several metaphors for light, so this kind of um, helps us to see virtue in a more concrete way. What does this actually look like? It can be very abstract, right? Talking about inner virtue. So this helps us to kind of visualize it and think about what would this actually mean in a person? So, so I really love Seneca's description here. And this is the idea that the Earl of Shaftesbury picked up on at the end of the 17th century in his writings on moral beauty. Now, Shaftesbury was extremely influenced by the Stoics. He tried to live as a Stoic, and you can still read his writings today. He, had, he kept a notebook 
where he strove to be like Marcus Aurelius and, and live according to virtue. But the idea that he really brought out in his life and in his writings, and that's relevant for us here, is moral beauty. So virtue is beauty. He said, beauty and good are the same. And he relied a lot on the idea of natural systems, the beauty of nature. So the idea that we heard earlier, where the cosmos is beautiful, it's a beautiful system. And humans are beautiful when we fit into this system in appropriate ways, right? We don't think we're more important than we actually are, or less important, we fit in appropriately. So Shaftesbury says, to deserve the name of good or virtuous, a creature must have all his inclinations and affections, his dispositions of mind and temper, suitable and agreeing with the good of his kind, or of that system in which he is included and of which he constitutes a part. So again, this idea of fitting into our surroundings, our world, our cosmos, aligning ourselves with the bigger picture, not thinking that it's all about us. We're not the center of the earth, right? We're not the center of the world. And we're behaving in ways that are appropriate for what we are, right? Animals have their own virtue. A horse has its own virtue when it excels at doing what horses do. And likewise, humans are virtuous when we excel at doing what humans do best, which is being rational and sociable. So this idea of moral beauty is also internal harmony and consistency. We could describe this as integrity. And in fact, this is how Shaftesbury's intellectual biographer, Michael B. Gill, describes it. And I highly recommend this book. If you're interested in the topic, it's called A Philosophy of Beauty, an excellent read. He really goes through and examines what Shaftesbury meant by moral beauty. So there are two aspects of the integrity that is moral beauty, according to Michael B. Gill here. Within the virtuous person, and between the virtuous person and the rest of humanity. And I would also add the rest of the world, the cosmos. All the parts of the morally beautiful person harmonize with each other and the morally beautiful person harmonizes with everyone else. So in my life, I tend to think of these as a vertical and a horizontal consistency or harmony, um, just the way I visualize it for myself. So vertical harmony, Vertical integration or vertical harmony means all of your desires, your thoughts, your beliefs, your opinions, your judgments, all of these things that Epictetus tells us are up to us, they are all in alignment, all oriented in the same direction. And then your horizontal plane of harmony is your interactions and integration with other people and with the world, with society and the cosmos. So again, it's all about the, the structure that um, beauty can bring, that virtue can bring to us, to our inner character. And I really appreciate what Shaftesbury can offer us today. One question that you might be asking, you know, we, we already know about virtue and stoicism. Why do we even need to talk about it in terms of beauty? Why don't we just stick with describing it as virtue? What does beauty offer? So what I think Shaftesbury can bring to us today is that it makes virtue more attractive. You know, beauty is attractive, right? It propels us towards it. It compels us to, you know, to desire it. So when we talk about moral beauty as virtue, you know, we're propelled towards wanting to become virtuous or towards admiring it in someone else, like the sage, the, the potential sage, the hypothetical sage, but it really draws us toward it. And I don't know about you, but as a practicing stoic, it can sometimes be really difficult to stay oriented towards virtue, right? Sometimes it can seem like a slog or like a slap on the wrist, you know, it's all about self-control or discipline or obligation, that kind of thing. Sometimes we tend to emphasize those in stoicism, whereas beauty really draws us toward it. It's our motivation. And so thinking about virtue in terms of beauty can really motivate us to attain it. Another reason for thinking about moral beauty is that it makes artistic appreciation a step toward virtue. So Shaftesbury was living in a milieu, like many of us today, where people were not necessarily so interested in virtue, right? Um, but they were interested in beautiful things. And so he felt that this was a way he could really interest people 
who might not otherwise be interested in virtue, but if he compared it to beauty or the beautiful things that they were used to, or aesthetic notions of artistry, this kind of thing, it can really help people understand, okay, so I appreciate beauty in this object, for example, or this painting, but it's just one step towards something that's even more important, grander, that will truly result in a good life. So of course, Shaftesbury did not conflate external beauty with internal beauty. You know, there's a clear distinction in Stoicism, but he saw it as a step in the right direction for people who might not otherwise ever think about philosophy or ever consider virtue. So it's a way of drawing people's eye toward virtue, so to speak. And another reason we like to think about moral beauty is it enables us to become artists of our own lives. This is a really important metaphor that I will come back to at the end, but this was something Shaftesbury emphasized. He compared virtue to art, and of course the Stoics called our lives the art of living, right? Virtue is the art of living. So Shaftesbury says, is there not a workmanship and a truth in actions? And he compared this to an artist creating a sculpture or a painting, again, to draw people from their existing knowledge of art towards something even greater, which would be virtue. Okay, so shifting gears. Now we've talked about ancient Stoicism. We've talked about Shaftesbury. Moral beauty today. Where does this leave us today? What can we do with this concept in the 21st century? Well, I'm going to share some psychology research with you. And I always think it's interesting when contemporary psychology research corroborates what we've already discovered from philosophy or from practical stoicism applying this to our lives. So I don't think that we actually need psychology to you know, confirm something in order to believe it's true or put it into practice, but I think it's always interesting when it does. And there's not a lot of research on moral beauty. I wouldn't say a lot. But there is one strand, and so I will be talking today about the work of Rhett Diesner, who has done a lot of work in this area. And this particular study is a 2018 meta-analysis. So they were looking at all of the psychology research that had been done up to that point about what we would call moral beauty. And they defined it quite similarly to the way we would as virtue or unity in diversity. So the harmonious coming together of many things in one right? The bigger system, everything fitting in well and proportionally. So this is one of their main findings from this study. Appreciation of moral beauty is related to higher levels of prosociality and well-being. Sounds pretty good. Now here are some specifics. It's related to high agreeableness, high levels of gratitude, forgiveness, connectedness to nature, and loving all humanity. Prosocial values of benevolence, universalism, spirituality, openness to experience, conscientiousness, self-transcendence, satisfaction with life, hope, vitality, personal growth, and purpose in life, and lower levels of neuroticism, envy, and materialism. If you could bottle this, you could become a billionaire, right? I mean, this is, this is eudaimonia. This is flourishing. This is what everybody wants. So it's really interesting to me that moral beauty can help us in the direction of this, right? Can help us move in this in this direction and find all of these things. No guarantees, of course, but it is associated with these. So I think it's definitely something that we should be interested in today. And that's why I'm glad we're all here talking about it. So if we had to put together some principles for moral beauty today, what would we say? Just kind of some overarching guidelines maybe. So first I would say virtue is beautiful for its structure, order, proportion, regularity, and harmony, right? And these principles apply, as we've already seen, to nature, to art, and to humans. So it's kind of a general stoic principle of beauty, but applying specifically to humans in this case. Humans are beautiful when we fit well into the bigger system of the world or the cosmos. We correspond to ideal human nature, rationality, and sociability, and we bring the mind into harmony with itself, which you might call integrity. We see 
virtue as beautiful, and that means we are strongly motivated to attain it. Again, this is extremely important if we're pursuing virtue as part of a meaningful life, as part of a good life, as a lifelong pursuit, right? We need something, we need a treasure at the end of the path. We need to be motivated to continue this, this difficult course. And seeing ourselves as artists of our own lives enables us to beautify our character. So, um, you know, you can put your own suggestions in the chat for what this might mean today, but these are some of the ones that I see as most important, most informative as we think about how moral beauty can help us in the 21st century. All right, so let's look at some suggestions for cultivating moral beauty. How do we put it into practice? So first of all, I think we can appreciate moral beauty in others, right? It's very important. Even if you don't live with a sage, right? <laughs> Even if the people around you are not perfect, you can still identify and appreciate the, the areas where they do shine. So Marcus Aurelius really points the way for this. He says, when you want to gladden your heart, think of the good qualities of those around you. The energy of one, for instance, the modesty of another, the generosity of a third, and some other quality in another. For there's nothing more heartening than the images of the virtues shining forth in the characters of those around us and assembled together in close array. So be sure to keep them ever at hand. Now, Marcus Aurelius didn't think that everyone around him was perfect, as we can see from his other meditations, but he found a way to appreciate the beauty that did exist in the people around him. And we can also see this extensively in book one, where he made a long list of the virtues of the people he had known throughout his life. Learn to see beauty all around you. Now, we've talked a lot today about maybe beautiful objects, which we know to be indifferent, right? Beautiful artwork, uh, beautiful homes, this kind of thing. It is indifferent. It is not necessary for a good life. That type of beauty is external to us, right? But we can still learn to appreciate beauty around us, even in places where others might not see it, right? So Marcus Aurelius Again, this is such an insightful quote. He says, if a person is endowed with sensibility and has a deep enough insight into the workings of the universe, he will find scarcely anything which fails to please him in some way by its presence. Such a person will view the gaping jaws of wild beasts with no less pleasure than the portrayals of them displayed by painters and sculptors. And he'll be able to see in an old woman or old man, a special kind of mature beauty. And he lists a number of things like baking bread, ears of corn bending toward the earth, even foam dripping from the jaws of a wild boar, which most other people would not really consider beautiful, but because they are part of nature, we can see them as beautiful. So I, I think this is an important way in times, especially when you know we may not feel beauty around us, even in times of difficulty, the Stoic sage sitting in a jail cell, for example, would still be able to detect beauty around her. So we can learn to see beauty even where others wouldn't and become happier and appreciate the world around us in this way. And finally, we can learn to sculpt our own characters, just like Shaftesbury recommended. And of course, Epictetus recommended, he says, just as wood is the material of the carpenter and bronze that of the sculptor, the art of living has each individual's own life as its material. I absolutely love this metaphor because it kind of puts the power back in our hands to do something about our own lives. You know, if we see beauty as something that's unattainable, we feel like we can't reach it, you know, that's no good. So this puts control back on us. Um, Shaftesbury also adds, the wise and able man who with a slight regard to outward things applies himself to cultivate another soil, builds in a different matter from that of stone or marble, and becomes in truth the architect of his own life and fortune by laying within himself the lasting and sure foundations of order, peace, ability, and concord, right? So again, it's up to us to create these things in ourselves, to create our own inner beauty and keep sculpting our statue. All right, so thank you so much. Um, you can find me at Stoicism for Humans, my new Substack, 
and at Stoa Care, which is our nonprofit applying care philosophy, Stoicism as a philosophy of care. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, Brittany. Okay, everyone, jump into the chat and let's flood that chat with your applause emojis. There you go. Really a beautiful talk, as Roberto just said. Excellent share from Vanessa. Wonderful talk, says Anne. Hi, Anne. Um, yeah, really well done, Brittany. I have a question, uh, just something that's been going on in my mind uh, for you. I'll kick off first and have another question from the uh, audience. Um, Brittany, so physical beauty, I think, is pretty easy to recognize. You don't need to do much work for that. You just kind of see it and it takes you over, I think. Um, but recognizing moral beauty, um, especially in your example from the Marcus Aurelius quote, needs a bit of meditation, a bit of contemplation, some work to kind of think about how people around you are, are acting, et cetera. Um, but I wonder whether there is an external sign. Is there anything like harmony of speech or gentle movement in the, the morally beautiful person, um, the way they engage with others, the way they, you know, comport themselves around a specific environment? Are there any external signs or do we need to sit there and really pay attention? <laughs> well, yes, you <laughs> really need to pay attention. Yeah, I mean, I think the way that a person treats other people around them is a sure sign of their inner beauty. You know, if you see someone being rude to another person, that's, you know, that person is definitely not a sage. Everyone has a bad day, of course. So I think what we would look for in our closest associates, you know, the people that we are consistently around so we can see patterns of behavior. Um, so yeah, it's it's those patterns over time. I think there is a difference in a single moral act and the long-term character characteristic that we might call moral beauty. I think moral beauty would appear over time. So you could, for example, see one person, you know, helping somebody on the street and be inspired by that, but that wouldn't necessarily, in my view, you know, you, you're not certain that that person has moral beauty because they might turn around and do something that's unkind right after that. So I think for us to really be sure about moral beauty, we would need to have some long-term familiarity with the person's character, if that makes sense. But yeah, definitely looking for those patterns over time, you know, are they reliable? Are they kind to the people around them? Do they do their best? These kinds of things, I think, would be signs of moral beauty. Yeah. Thanks, Brittany. Um, Roberto in the uh, chat has a question for you. Hi, Roberto. Uh, would you offer us an example of someone in the present time who might be a beautiful moral person? Um, yeah, again, I don't know people, you know, we, we can point to celebrities or people who are well known who might be morally beautiful. Um, you know, I've heard Dolly Parton described as a secular saint. She does a lot of things for people. Uh, Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers neighborhood <laughs> was described as a secular saint. I don't know them personally, so I don't know what they were like, you know, when the camera was off or when they're not out in front of people. So I would hesitate to, you know, elevate someone that I don't know personally to this level, but I would say that we can really find role models in our own lives. So I can, I can provide an example from my own life, which is my mother-in-law who lives in Turkey. She, you know, she doesn't know anything about stoicism. She would not consider herself a stoic, but she is such a kind and giving person and, you know, has such a positive outlook on life and I don't know, maybe if we go back to the idea of signs, you know, how can we tell someone is morally beautiful? You know, she has a very gentle spirit about her, very outgoing and, you know, just a giving person. So I think, you know, we can all find somebody or we can find a person with at least some good characteristics that we can strive towards and kind of incorporate into our own lives. Yeah. Thanks, Brittany. Uh, Christian Lee has a question for you. Uh, Christian's referring back to the Marcus Aurelius' comment on finding beauty in everything around us. What role would the concept of purpose have in this sense of beauty? Are these things in nature beautiful, the, fo the foam of a boar, for example, because they are fulfilling their purpose? Well, there has been a lot of discussion in the chat <laughs> and during Massimo's and David's talks today. So um, 
I don't know if I have a lot to add. I personally do see a very functional element to beauty. And I think Shaftesbury would also argue, and the ancient Stoics too, of course, that as part of the larger system of the cosmos, even those things that we don't necessarily think of as beautiful, you know, the, the bugs that are not very attractive or the things that are not aesthetically pleasing to us, they do have a certain beauty because they fit, they do have their role to play in the larger system. Um, Shaftesbury even praised excrement because it, you know, it fertilizes and enables other things to grow. So I think, yeah, maybe you could look at a functional role for all of these things, just fitting, they have their role to play in the bigger picture. Yeah, and I was reading about bed bugs are pretty cool because they get you to get up and clean you, wash the sheets or something. Um, let's see how we're going for time. I think we have time for one more question. Um, this is a question that Eric posed in the chat. What does it mean that a morally beautiful person harmonizes with everyone else? Shouldn't we strive not to harmonize with morally ugly people, i.e. serial killers? Um, and Tim LeBon answered, maybe harmonize is different to be the same as. So Stoics would say we should try to correct those who do wrong. And if we are not able to do that, to show understanding. So, yeah, just a response to that. Right. Yeah, I would agree with Tim. Um, so harmonize in this sense does not mean become exactly the same as. I guess it's kind of an ambiguous use of the word harmonization, but it means, you know, fitting yourself into existing society. So if there is a serial killer, then you will fit yourself into the role of, you know, helping to apprehend the serial killer or whatever, whatever it takes, whatever your relation, the proper relationship would be of you towards that person. If there is somebody who needs some kind of instruction, you know, you, you see a shoplifter or something to use a less intimidating example, you know, maybe your role is to correct that or to notify somebody that that's going on. So harmonize means you adapt yourself appropriately to what other people are doing. It does not mean you strive to become exactly like other people. It means that you might identify certain people that you do align yourself with and you strive to become like them, but the majority of people you would not strive to become like, if that makes sense. Yeah. Thanks for that, Brittany. And I'll just take one more question from the chat. And this is David Feidler's question. Do you have an idea? how the Stoics were able to define moral beauty as a harmony of the parts of the soul when the Stoics also maintained that the soul was unified and didn't consist of parts. Well, that's a tricky one. <laughs> right, yeah. So using the term parts, I, I mean, it's not as if the, the your internal psyche is divided into parts in that sense. It's certainly not a platonic sense. I mean, I'm thinking more of the way that Epictetus described it, you know, judgments, opinions, thoughts, actions, all of these things that we, you know, we talk about them separately. Stoics, the Stoics definitely did see the psyche as unified, but, you know, we can identify, you know, emotions, motivations, all of these things that we colloquially describe are going on in our minds. You know, you want them oriented in the same direction towards the same goal of virtue. So no, certainly not parts, but you know, whatever, whatever term you want to use to describe our mental functions as being harmonious. Thanks, Brittany. Thanks for a truly inspirational talk, as always, Brittany. And thank you all for your questions in the chat and your generosity. Pop some more uh, applause emojis in the chat, a round of applause in the room for Brittany Pollard. Thank you all. And Brittany, I'm going to hand the microphone over to you because you're going to introduce our next speaker. Over to you. That's right. Now I'm shifting roles. And from presenter, I get to introduce John Sellers, who is reader in philosophy at Royal Holloway University of London, a visiting research fellow at King's College London, and a co-founder of Modern Stoicism. He's also the author of a new book on Aristotle. And you can refer to your conference program for more details about John. So with that, John, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thanks very much, Brittany. Um, let me quickly um, share my screen. I hope you can now all see that, and I hope you can hear me. Looks good. Sounds good, John. Perfect. Thanks. So thanks so much to Phil and to Catherine for everything for today. Um, I'm not going to talk about beauty um, directly, but I'm going to talk a bit about some art, some art history. Um, in particular, I'm going to talk about what I think is a fascinating moment in history that saw what was probably 
the first sustained modern revival of Stoicism. And it was centered around a relatively small group of people, one of whom was the 17th century Flemish painter, Peter Paul Rubens. Oops, sorry, I'm having, here we go. So this is Rubens. Now, Rubens might not be the first artist you think of as potentially stoic in outlook. He's usually remembered for his rather fleshy, sensual images that people might naturally associate with pleasure rather than virtue. But in fact, Rubens was deeply interested in Stoicism, and that's what I want to talk about today. He produced a number of Stoic-themed paintings. So let me start with what is possibly the most famous of these, which is his painting, The Death of Seneca. Now, there are multiple copies of this painting. There's one in Munich, which I think was probably the, is probably the, um, the earliest, um, one in Madrid, uh, and that's the one that you can see here, and also one in Antwerp. So it was a, uh, an image that he came back to again and again. Now, this painting depicts Seneca committing suicide in his bath. And as you can see, it's a very small bath. Um, and this is an event that had been described by the Roman historian Tacitus. Now, Rubin's painting of Seneca takes inspiration from two separate pieces of ancient sculpture. The first of these was a portrait bust that had only recently been identified, and as it turns out, probably mistakenly, as a bust of Seneca in the 1590s, so just a couple of decades earlier. And there are multiple copies of this bust too, including one that Rubens bought whilst visiting Rome and had installed on the wall of his house in Antwerp. This is a view of Rubens' house in Antwerp. It's now a museum, you can visit it. Um, I think it's closed this year for restoration. And if you look at the door um, on the right-hand side under the pediment, you can see the head of Seneca. And it looks to me as if that might be Socrates further along, higher up on the wall, but we'll, we'll put that to one side for a minute. But Seneca is there placed above the doorway in, in Rubens' house. Now, there's another copy of this closer to my home in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford which may in fact have been the one that Rubens originally owned. This bust in Oxford was bought from Rubens' collection just after his death by the Duke of Buckingham and was eventually donated to the museum in Oxford. The one that I've just shown you that's now at Rubens' house in Antwerp is in fact a later replacement that was bought when the house was being restored, I think in the late 19th century or the early 20th century. And there are many other copies of this bust of Seneca too. Here are just a few examples. These are all photos that I've taken at various places whenever I've come across Seneca. And one of these was, was taken in Rome. One was taken in a country house in Norfolk. I can't remember where the third one was taken maybe Paris. But anyway, they're all ones that I've come across. Just to reiterate the point that there are multiple copies of this image. This image was widely thought to be of Seneca throughout the 17th and the 18th centuries until in the early 19th century, another bust was found, this one, which as you can see, has got the name Seneca inscribed in it. And ever since then, the older ones that I've just been showing you are referred to as pseudo Seneca, right? So much for the head in Rubin's painting. What about the body? For this, Rubin's took inspiration from another piece of ancient sculpture now known as the dying fisherman. On the face of it, this sculpture has nothing to do with Seneca. Perhaps Rubin's just liked it. However, the statue as it exists today and how it was in Rubin's time um, had been heavily restored. So 
The torso and the head are antique. The arms are, I think, newer replacements. And when I say newer, I mean 16th century. Um, the loincloth has been added and the basin in which the figure stands. Now, as I say, it was probably restored in this way during the 16th century. Indeed, it may have been restored in this way to make it look like an image of Seneca by making it fit with the famous account of Seneca's death in Tacitus. And the basin is significant here. Um, Tasta says that Seneca opened his veins in the bath. And earlier in the Renaissance, this had been interpreted as a moment of last minute baptism, effectively turning Seneca into a Christian just before he dies. But because Seneca's blood mingled with the baptismal water, this made him a Christian martyr, assuming we interpret his death not as a suicide, but as an execution. Now, in order to illustrate this, the statue figure, perhaps reconstructed in order to portray Seneca, is placed literally within a baptismal font. And that's perhaps why the bath is so small. So this was probably not originally a statue of Seneca at all, but it may have been reconstructed in the 16th century in order to create an image of Seneca's martyrdom. And this is what Rubens is painting. Rubens also painted an image of a bust of Marcus Aurelius. And this was part of a portrait of the humanist Caspar Gavatius, who was preparing an edition of Marcus Aurelius's meditations at the time, although his edition was never published. Gavatius was also based in Antwerp, like Rubens. He was a humanist, he worked as city clerk, and he was hired by Rubens to act as tutor for his son. Gavatius also composes an epitaph for Rubens' monument after the artist's death. Now, while Gavatius was clearly an admirer of Marcus Aurelius, the bust represented in the painting was not his. It in fact belonged to Rubens, who probably acquired it while he was in Italy, just as he had done with the head of Seneca. The painting then is deliberately composed by Rubens, bringing together his subject, with an item from his own collection that perfectly illustrates the subject's interests. Along with Rubens, Gavatius was part of a small community of people in Antwerp interested in Stoicism in the early 17th century, a community that had its origins in the century before. Another member of this community was Rubens' older brother, Philip. Philip is especially important in this story because he was a friend and pupil of the foremost Stoic of the period, Justus Lipsius. Along with other things, Philip wrote Stoic-themed poetry in honour of his teacher. Rubens painted Philip and Lipsius together during a trip to Italy sometime around 1603. So Rubens and his brother Philip are in the center. And um, I can't see it so clearly here because it's slightly obscured by the, by the um, um, Zoom stuff on the side, but on the, right hand, on the very right-hand side, you can see Lipsius looking over them. Now, Philip was indeed with his brother in Italy at the time, but Lipsius wasn't present. His image has been added to this painting as if a guiding spirit watching over the two brothers. But far more important is another portrait of the two together in perhaps what is Rubens' most stoic painting, The Four Philosophers. So this image painted in 1611, 1612, shows four figures. And let's uh, zoom into the central section. The four figures are Rubens himself on the left, then his brother Philip, then Lipsius, and then Johannes Wovarius. The vase in the alcove above them contains four flowers, two open and two closed, 
which is thought to echo the fact that two of the people in the painting by this point were dead. Lipsius had died in 1606 and Philip far more recently in 1611. So this painting is perhaps Rubin's tribute to his brother. Wovarius had been a pupil of Lipsius too, living in his house at one point. And after Lipsius's death, Wovarius acted as his literary executor, seeing Lipsius's final works through to publication. You can also see in the alcove, Rubin's bust of Seneca. In the background, you can see glimpses of columns, placing the group literally inside a stoa. Lipsius, the teacher, is explaining the contents of a large book, um, as you can see here. Perhaps his famous edition of the complete works of Seneca, published in 1605, the year before he died. So this is Lipsius's great edition of the complete works of Seneca. A quick note on this book. Um, he publishes it right at the end of his career. It contains a number of engravings, engravings of both Lipsius himself and of Seneca, as well as this impressive engraved title page. When the book was reprinted in 1615, just after the Four Philosophers painting, the publisher, who I'll come back to in a moment, asked Rubens to prepare new drawings for better engravings, which he did. And this was prompted by notes that Lipsius himself left just before his death, because he was unhappy with some of the original engravings. The portrait of Lipsius himself is updated. So here, before and after. Um, a large image of Seneca's bust is included, replacing a previous one. And an engraving of Rubin's painting, The Death of Seneca, is added. And this is, full, this is a full page uh, folio image, it's a very large, large reproduction. And even the small image of Seneca on the title page has been updated. Now, this edition of Seneca was published by the famous printing firm of Christopher Plantin, also based in Antwerp. By 1605, when the book came out, Plantin himself was dead. The company had passed on to his son-in-law, Jan Moretus, and then in 1610 to his son, Balthazar Moretus, who had gone to school with Rubens and had also been a student of Lipsius. The printing shop still survives. It's the only one from the period to do so, and it's now a museum. So if you go to visit Antwerp, you can visit Rubens' house and you can visit the Plantin Moretus printing um, uh, museum where many of the Stoic books produced, uh, written by Lipsius were, were printed. Now, Plantin had been more or less a contemporary of Lipsius and his firm published all of Lipsius's works. The two were close friends and whenever Lipsius was in Antwerp, he stayed with Plantin. And Plantin's own printer's mark is often thought to illustrate his own interest in Stoicism, labore et constantia. Indeed, much later, Rubens would produce designs for an updated version of this printer, printer's mark for his old schoolmate, Balthazar Moretus. And so this is one of Rubens' drawings. Among the works by Lipsius that Plantin printed, the most famous was his De Constantia of 1584. This was a book of stoic guidance for those facing adversity. And this was a period of great adversity brought about by intense religious wars. At one point, Antwerp was sacked and people literally had to run for their lives. Lipsius's own house was ransacked twice and he lost pretty much everything. So it was a dangerous time. And in this context, Lipsius argues in De Constantia that real evils are 
in the mind, the product of one's opinions. And so in order to escape them, one must change how one thinks, not one's location. Drawing on ideas from Seneca, Lipsius argues that change is simply inevitable. It's either the product of divine providence or blind fate, but either way, it's out of our control. And difficult situations um, can in fact be an opportunity for us to exercise and improve our virtues, as Seneca had argued. Drawing on his vast historical knowledge as a humanist, Lipsius outlines the countless wars and conflicts that have raged throughout human history, reminding himself that this is far from uncommon. War, strife, conflict, trouble, change. These are things millions of people have had to contend with. And so why should he, Lipsius, be any different in having to confront them in his own life? In any case, there's nothing he can do to stop it. What he can do is try to develop the resilience and fortitude, the constantia, so that he can weather the storm. Now, Lipsius's Constantia was, if you like, the first modern Stoic handbook, the first book that aimed to present practical Stoic ideas to a modern audience, but also one that acknowledged that some aspects of ancient Stoicism might need to be updated in the process although in ways quite different to the ways in which we might think about updating Stoicism today. And it was also a huge bestseller. It was reprinted numerous times and translated into almost all of the major vernacular languages uh, within a decade of publication. Plantin himself printed translations into Dutch and into French the year after its initial publication. And the Dutch version was done by Plantin's son-in-law, Jan Moretus. And it was translated into English no less than four times in the um, decades after its first publication. Lipsius also published scholarly works on Stoicism, which were the first to try to gather together all of the fragmentary evidence that we have for the early Greek Stoics. And here again, you can see Plantin's printer mark labore et constantia. So, in this small group of intellectuals in Antwerp, comprising a mixture of scholars, artists, and printers, we find what I think is the first modern Stoic community. And these are some of the people that I've mentioned along the way. And the intellectual father figure for this group was without doubt Justus Lipsius, author of the first modern Stoic handbook, the first book that tries to present Stoic ideas as a guide for how to live. And a key member of the second generation of this community of Stoics in Antwerp was, as I've said, Peter Paul Rubens, not an artist of Baroque hedonism, but a serious and committed Stoic. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. That was fascinating. And I think the parallels between this time period of neo-Stoicism and modern Stoicism are inescapable. I was wondering if you have any thoughts as one of the founders of modern Stoicism, were you drawing on the neo-Stoic period or did you have any hopes that there might be something similar going on with modern Stoicism? Um, I mean, not, not explicitly when we first started. No, not at all. But um... I mean, I, I mean, one question that people have asked me again and again and again over the last decade or so is, why do you think people are so interested in Stoicism right now? OK, that's the question that keeps coming up. And I've tried to come up with various answers to that to that. And I'm very interested to hear other people's views on it, too. But I mean, you can point to perhaps reasons why. I mean, since the financial crash in 2008, um i think was a was a key moment um and 
people have found the world a little more unsettled. Um, the idea that everything's always improving and that everyone's getting wealthier, um, that kind of, sort of optimism um, that, um, that was around beforehand suddenly went. And people are feeling as if they're perhaps in slightly more unsettled times. And I think in the 16th century, when Lipsius was writing, he was, you know, they were most definitely in unsettled times. This was, you know, the, you know, the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation. There was a, a lot of religious conflict and the, all of the older certainties were suddenly being called into question. And I think perhaps that sense of uncertainty might be something that um, you know, might be a common cultural context that has led people to turn to some Stoic ideas. Do you think that led the Neo-Stoics to emphasize constancy? It's interesting to me that that seems to be the primary virtue that they concern themselves with, whereas today we hardly ever talk about constancy. I mean, was that why? Because of the Reformation period and all the societal changes happening then? Well, I mean, people, I mean, we, we talk about resilience, right? I mean, I guess that's the sort of the updated, the updated version. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, if we're talking about resilience, I mean, I suppose another parallel as well is that if they're talking about constancy, um, they're talking about managing emotions, right? They're, they're, they're engaged in the kind of the psychotherapeutic side of stoicism that's a big part of the, the modern stoic scene, right? Um, how can people manage their emotions? How can people become more resilient? Um, how can they cope with the stresses and strains of everyday life? So is that, that side of, of things, I think, where we, where we see the parallel quite strongly as well? I like that. Resilience is the new constancy. All right, so some questions more particularly on the images that you shared. Um, Francis Gasparini says, in what way does the printer's mark represent Stoicism? So um, so the, the two words, labor, labore et constantia. So constantia, the, as I say, the Stoic idea that we've just been talking about, and labore, I mean, labor, hard work. So, you know, kind of hard work and resilience. Um, um, so I think the constantia there is, is you know, um, I think comes through as clearly an echo of, 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 of Lipsius's focus on constantia in his explicitly um, stoic works, which, of course, were in, and, and is inspired by um, Seneca's dialogue, De Constantia Sapientis, right, on the on the constancy of the sage. Right. Thank you. And a question from Eric. Rubens is widely known for portraying what we now know as Rubenesque figure, which of course you alluded to earlier, flesh and pleasure. Considering restraint moderation is one of the major stoic virtues, why was that virtue not extended to portraying the human body, especially the female body? Or did he intend to use the Rubenesque figure to signify the lack of virtue? Um, yeah. Um, why would we consider why would why would we consider those representations of the female form unvirtuous i suppose would be my sort of counter question right um so representing nature in a way yeah it, yes like the greeks with their statues yeah okay thank you um so a question from Roberto, how did they in the 17th century manage to make Stoicism compatible with Catholic counter-reform? Yes, it's interesting. So, so Lipsius himself starts off as a Catholic. Um, he then um, perhaps is, is it, you know, it, he, he then for a, for a certain period converts to Protestantism in order to take up a job in Protestant Leiden. Um, and then he later goes to, um, um, to, to Catholic Louvain and converts back to Catholicism and dies a Catholic, right? And this has been interpreted in a number of ways. So on the one hand, it's been interpreted as kind of cheap opportunism, right? He needed to convert to take the job, and so he did it. Um, um, it's also been thought that but, you know, he was more interested in being uh, in being a Christian in a way that transcended those 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 differences. And perhaps, you know, he was a kind of a deist before before deists existed in the 18th century. 
Um, and of course, there's this hef- heavy Stoic influence on, on him as well. So he's kind of working in a Catholic context. And in the end, he, 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 he returns to Catholicism. Um, but but the, yeah, there's a sense in which we might move, we might think of we might think of him trying to interpret Seneca in broadly Christian terms, but without wanting to get too embroiled in those sorts of in those sorts of disputes. If that makes sense. Okay, sure. Thank you. We also have a question from Terry in London. Was narcissism a factor at that time as now? <laughs> Uh, who knows who knows (laughs) probably narcissism is always there in some form right (laughs) um okay so if anyone has any further questions for john now would be the time to put them in the chat um maybe just another question about what modern stoicism can learn from neo-stoicism i really like the fact that the neo-stoics employed a lot of allegorical symbols i mean we saw them in some of the images that you shared do you see that i mean it's considered to be not very sophisticated now to use this type of allegorical symbolization in art i think or in music do you see a place for that if we if we were going to bring back stoic art for example um how would that actually look Mm, yeah, that's that's interesting. I mean, as you say, there's a sense in which um, fashions have moved on, and you, that's perhaps not the way in which people would um, would naturally do it now. I mean, I mentioned very briefly that Philip's Philip Rubens wrote Stoic inspired poetry, um, just uh, to pick up on on where we started um, today's event. And I think Catherine at one point said, you know, perhaps we should all start writing Stoic poetry. So it may be that there are some 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 art forms that we could take where we could take some inspiration from from these guys, but it's not as if we're going to go back to particularly um, um, uh, we're unlikely to sort of you know try and resurrect sixteenth or seventeenth century sort of traditions in art for sure. Um, but again, I mean to pick up some of the other things that other speakers have said already, um, you know. Beautiful things are a way, are a very good, effective way of transmitting ideas. Um, I remember in the very early days of modern stoicism, Jules Evans saying one of the great features of um, ancient stoic literature is it's beautifully written and it engages people. Seneca's a great writer. That's part of his power, right? Um, It's not as if he's simply presenting the ideas in a bland and uninteresting way. He's a great writer who presents them in a way that makes them very forceful and powerful and we remember we remember quotations right because of the way in which they're written that's an example of beauty being used in an effective moral way and we can do that visually um, we can do that with poetry and we can do it with well-written prose and so these are all ways in which art understood in broadest terms can be a useful vehicle for presenting ideas in a way that makes them stick in our mind Wonderful. So this is a call to more Stoic art, more Stoic literature, more Stoic engagement with with beauty in general. Absolutely. And it's my honor now to introduce our next speaker, who is Jennifer Baker. Jennifer Baker is Professor of Philosophy at the College of Charleston. Her talk is called Selecting for Beauty, Some Precepts for a Stoic. She is the author of numerous publications, including Virtue Ethics and Practical Guidance in Economics and Virtue. She writes for Psychology Today and enjoys writing on pop culture. So Google some of those articles, would you? Please also refer to the conference program. I'm going to pop that back in the chat for you for more details and to connect with Jennifer. But for now, over to you. Thank you. I am so excited to be here. Hello, everybody. Um, This is great company. I use stoicism to make arguments in contemporary ethics. So I want to make a case for stoic ethics being a practical way to discover what beauty is, which is a very different approach than taking what the ancients said about beauty in particular, and fitting that into what we use of stoic ethics today. But if we're talking about beauty, I'm hoping it's okay, I can set the stage with Plato because it's it's irresistible. And he pretty memorably tells us what happens to us when, when we're in the presence of um, physical beauty in a person. As they get closer to us, our eyes 
get dazzled. We start thinking in terms of ultimates and eternity. We use superlatives like most beautiful I've ever seen or in the world. And in that same mind, the person gets put up on a pedestal, not for use, but for admiration. And uh, Plato suggests that we're a little bit afraid of great beauty and that we're tormented over this. So we feel overwhelming desire for the beautiful person, but that is forced down, you know, like aggressively by our other parts and not just once, but until that lower part learns its lesson. And as far as this kind of painful yearning, um, I just think this case is interesting and is useful as, as soon as I get to the Stoics in a second. It's from a reporter at the New Yorker who was investigating, um, investigating, doing a story on plastic surgery. So she went to a bunch of surgeons offices and they couldn't help but tell her what they could fix about her face. <laughs> and here's what she wrote. I had thought that I was researching the subject at a logical distance, that I could inhabit the point of view of an ideal millennial client, someone who wanted to enhance, not fix herself, who was ambitious and pragmatic. But I left with a very specific feeling, a kind of bottomless need that I associated with early adolescence. <laughs> so if you will think back to your middle school years, if you had posters up of pop stars, or even if you treated a few of your classmates like pop stars um, in awe of the glamour, for Plato, those sorts of innocent crushes are exactly as they should be. So it's a sign, a very good sign, that we were designed to yearn for greater things all our lives. And the yearning is what motivates us, as he puts it, to become like God. So in other words, you know, your Justin Bieber poster was just a vessel. <laughs> and Plato knows that we will realize we can't be sustained by mystique and physical beauty. So we shift our yearning from pop stars to uh, beautiful persons, to beautiful souls, to beautiful laws and institutions, to the beauty of knowledge. And then if you're philosophical enough, it's like a new sun has emerged and you see beauty itself, truth and beauty itself. But he knows things usually go wrong and we fail to become philosophers and get stuck at a very low level, confused, unsatisfied, bitter. It's impressive to think of all the insults that Plato enables us because any like adult fan or anyone who enjoys rating the physical beauty of others like an expert um, is really not doing well on a platonic account and, and not doing well on a stoic account either. So what they share in common is that beauty is a gift and a sign, but it can also be a trap that we fall in and a way to completely miss our lives. Um, so do the Stoics help with this? And I think they do in several ways. So the first way I think the Stoic helps will be familiar to you all, I'm sure, because I know you know the lines about food and the other things they deflate. It's not a delicious steak. It's just cut muscle from a dead cow. A mansion is just a roof and a floor. And, you know, these things don't make us popular, but I figure the Stoics would invoke the same deflationary um, approach uh, with beauty. So it's called uh, contemptuous expression, I think, as the modern exercise, but it's just seeing things uh, less as conclusions and more as their parts or looking at the, the origin of them. So with personal beauty, I think a Stoic would make comments like these, which aren't that unusual, but uh, things like, yes, she has nice elbows, or I think she dyes her hair, um, or yeah, those are hair plugs, or he's got to be taking steroids. Um, I love his arms. What great hair. Is that a filter? Um, and uh, yeah, the purple purse will, will match. I think the Stoics are going to encourage us to resist any excited fantasy and replace it with plain observation. But I know that is no surprise <laughs> to anyone. <laughs> a quiz on what the Stoics think about beauty would get, give those answers. What's confusing and what's hard to explain and what I um, have been getting help with all, all day and can't wait for more about is that the Stoics still see and pursue beauty. So unlike Plato, they don't expect us to mainline it through our eyeballs. We get an impression and then we can assent or not. 
We're not automatically attracted to all beautiful things. They don't automatically make us go out of our minds. That's only when we associate bad beliefs with beauty. Um, so I guess in some beauty doesn't always have to cause yearning and yet you don't have to deny its beauty either to resist its power if you think like a stoic. And I do feel like that's a pretty helpful package. I mean, of course it's, it's probably easier said than, than done, but it does seem to be a good midway position between Plato's it's a defeatist view, his his view really, but is his hyped up defeatist view and a cynical approach. So let me move to benefit two of a stoic approach. And I will be um, mentioning our special stoic terms, which also got uh, a nice introduction earlier. I hope it doesn't hurt to review, but I call this part the purple purse. So if you are going to interview to get a job in philosophy and you carry a purple purse, you need to be ready because probably in that department are some ancient scholars and probably they're going to tease you and say, how in the world could a Stoic carry a purple purse? And then because if you remember, I said you got ready, um, you know to say, I just selected it. <laughs> and then you're in, you're speaking Stoic code, the purple purse is reluctantly approved and you get the job. Now, if you're already in the habit of using the word selected for what you do with indifference, I'm just going to try and back you on that. But if you're not, you know, I'm going to try and make a case. It's just a little bit of technical language. It's supposed to convey to the agent, to you and to those around you who know the code um, that you can both care and not care about the purse, um, that you can take it seriously and not take it seriously to use uh, coinage uh a scholar has recently coined, take it seriously and not take it seriously. You cared enough to pick it out, to find it before you leave. You don't care enough to steal or lie for it. Um, and, you know, let's be stoic. Uh, you don't even care enough to be visibly upset if it's stolen. Um, the purse has some positive value, but you say select rather than choose to emphasize that all you would really ever choose is to be moral. As Julia Annis puts it, because the Stoics limit good to virtue, they want to make sure we don't speak too loosely to suggest that anything might match the good of virtue, uh, if we call it good too. So that's why we introduced the idea of calling purses indifference, and then some are preferred indifference and some are just preferred. And some Stoics actually say virtue just is selecting between indifference properly, figuring out which are preferred and which are just preferred any good behavior would be doing that. That's all virtue is a kind of tidy, tidy definition. Um, but it's helpful to remember also that indifference are, of course, it doesn't mean that they aren't necessary to our lives. They aren't indifferent to health or wealth or anything. They just aren't the same as um, your virtuous choice. I also want to emphasize that the Stoics probably shouldn't be generalized about in a, in a modern context so that they sound like consequentialists about things like, I guess, the purse or practical rationality. So I just want to take this opportunity to point out that a consequentialist would be looking to see that I chose the the, the best purse, <laughs> you know, so the purse that, um, uh, you know, does the least social harm, all things considered. And that could sound so neutral. And, you know, I see people using that, that language um, describing stoicism some, sometimes, but that is a real contrast to what it seems to me stoics expect of us. And it would introduce a lot of anxiety, endless recalculation. Um, I just don't think it's what the stoics have in mind, but they do want us to focus on what we can say. <laughs> so sayables, um, I love that expression, the things we say about what we're doing and in the moment, not with all the information you'd need if you were doing a consequentialist analysis and, and not if you were in an idealized situation. To focus on what we can say is something we can do and defend along with other things we say. And that is so great. It's what practical rationality is made of. And practical rationality is what makes stoicism so distinctive and explains, I think, why the complicated terminology um, is worth it, the awkward terminology. <laughs> I mean, it won't make us popular, but uh, I do think it'll help with uh, beauty, <laughs> the problems of beauty. So um, 
uh, Epictetus says some lovely things about uh, problems with beauty. Um, he says, don't say it's nothing. It's clearly there. Trying to pretend you don't see like gradations in beauty is so silly. No one will believe you. And it also shows a lack of gratitude when beauty is a gift to us all. And then he's also addressing non-cynics a moment later. Um, don't be so afraid of it. Don't be a coward. You can love beauty and despise beauty, as he puts it. You don't need to be carried away or placed within its power. Like, don't let Plato scare you. <laughs> the Stoics don't need um, us to use something like akin to physical force on an animal to keep our lustful sides under control. We can do that with words and reason. And so can many people, as, as someone might want to point out to Plato. So, you know, just saying he's married, just saying she's 17, that, that's, that's enough point for the Stoics. Um, what did Epictetus mean to say despise beauty? <laughs> well, I think the point might be that we do all sorts of things that ruin beauty. Have kids is uh, example number one. Break a nail, um, miss workouts to help somebody else, or if, if you become uh, sick or disabled, uh, saving someone in a fire might risk your beauty. Um, we also might need to overcorrect if we choose too often on the basis of beauty and not something else. I mean, this sounds trivial in comparison to like heroic examples, but, you know, people do go bankrupt buying things. So um, you have to be careful uh, to not think choosing beautiful things will make you happy. <laughs> Ignore the advertising. There are just two more things I think a Stoic might want us to realize. Um, that I want to catch with, uh, with you know, this examination of the Stoic account. Um, for one, it's not uh, very generous to value people for their beauty, and people who want to be beautiful act like that's something other than it is. I think our experts are people who are extraordinarily beautiful, and it is a painful thing to be liked in part because you're beautiful. And then uh, for two. We do hold ourselves morally responsible for things we find beautiful. So if you don't find your baby beautiful or your teenager when their face is full of pimples or your parents in very, very old age, um, there's something wrong. <laughs> and there's something other than the initial aesthetic appreciation that's behind those transitions, which I think are very normal and standard. So I'm just going to suggest there are a few ways a Stoic could approach beauty. So we could be humble about beauty where we don't impose any one account of aesthetics. Um, we could be slightly cynical and we could have counterintuitive ideas. I mean, I'm thinking of like Diogenes saying the most beautiful thing is frank, bold, free speech. I think we could argue you need to see beauty in all of humanity, which has already been argued today. I think we could be consumers for fit, charm, and color, purple purses, I think we could pursue decorum if that's not the same thing. And I think it's not because manners would be included. And I think beauty can help us reinforce uh, the need for virtue. So the last one maybe is the hardest sell, maybe not for this crowd, but that's a hard sell. Um, I like to say how it would work in the most simple of detail. And I have a few reasons for that. Um, one uh, may not be relevant to everyone, but in the fields of moral education, moral psychology, kind of ethical theory generally, the idea of phronesis is under new attack, <laughs> new attack. And uh, a very good philosopher has gathered together all the descriptions he could find of phronesis. Now, this is in Aristotelian virtue ethics, just like by the numbers, um, but it is a very embarrassing list because the descriptions are vague, kind of like um, overly ambitious. Uh, it ends up kind of looking like to him, it looks like anything you'd want in your ethical account can just be thrown underneath the heading of phronesis. And then we're supposed to trust that we have this ability to do these things, case closed. So he's starting to argue there's, there's not even such a thing as phronesis, even though he believes there are virtues. But I think Stoics, I mean, would never want to, can never even imagine losing the role of phronesis. So, you know, that's our proclivity for thinking and acting consistently so that we can decide ethical issues. We do that in an informal way 
unsystematically, but it works. And we also do it with sensitivity to coherence, consistency, and contradiction. I'm quoting Larry Becker at the end there. Um, there are contemporary virtue ethicists, you know, developing their own account of phronesis in their own words. Irene McMullen has a wonderful um, new account. Uh, Dan Russell in his work on virtue ethics really emphasizes that this is not a mysterious process. It's just a settled ability that we can understand on its own terms and compare with familiar everyday skills. And so uh, another caution is that I don't want phronesis to seem bland or banal or even not particular to stoicism, but I also don't want it to seem too precious. So let me give an example and then suggest we could use this with beauty. Um, the example is just from Epictetus. A father is unable to visit his sick daughter because he loves her too much. That's, that's what he believes. How do you uh, talk him down? Well, there's a couple steps. This is how simple it could be. Um, the first step would be, is love for your daughter a good? Yes. Okay. So um, we're on uh, one page there. The second step is to see if uh, he's using the word love in the same way he does it other times. It's like, does the mother not love the daughter because she is hanging in there with the ill daughter? Okay. He's starting to realize there's some inconsistency here. The third step, what would you want if you were the daughter? How would love be expressed to you if you imagined yourself in that position? And then the fourth step is to check your motivations. Um, it's doubtful that love is really what's motivating this frightened father. Um, he is frightened. He admits, uh, finally, what beliefs do you have to revise to get you to do the right thing? It's very simple, a series of steps. Um, we can describe it as consistency, harmony, or lack of conflict, but people might not understand what we mean. It's what brings about virtue, a situation where our motivations have been organized by us so that they don't conflict and support each other. Um, it's it's something that can happen if we use practical rationality over and over again. So let me just end with how this might apply to beauty. So what you would do is begin with um, a sayable. So what would the sayable be? Something like beautiful people get ahead or to be admired, you must be beautiful. So the first step is putting that in sentence form, you know, we like, that's a hassle. We don't like to do that. Um, so you're already being pretty deliberate about this. You may not have internalized that norm. It may be what Larry Becker calls an alien norm. You know, it just could be something from the culture. But you think about the tensions that could be introduced if you did adopt or endorse that idea. Only beautiful people get ahead. Um, would that cause any of these things? A lack of closeness with others, insecurity, dissatisfaction, perfectionism, um, comparisons, fear of aging, um, lack of any kind of discernible gain. If those things seem likely to happen, if you follow that norm, if that sayable were an endorsed norm for you, um, then you're supposed to go back and revise and figure out what instead the role of beauty could be in, in our lives. Um, you'd imagine how this would apply to other people. And um, you would go back and um, revise beliefs that would support that norm that doesn't seem viable or does seem viable. And then once you find something workable, you go ahead and test it. So what are you looking for? You're looking for something you can support, believe and be motivi motivated by that doesn't make you feel like you have endless need that doesn't make you compare yourself to others, that allows you to enjoy beauty, you know, to see it, to recognize it, maybe to recognize more of it, experience joy at seeing it, um, to be able to find beautiful what you want to find beautiful, to not make yourself your own beauty project, to get self-esteem from your character and action, to love others for their character and action. Um, and we should be able to, with this process, put in, any sayable we can come up with. I have a, a list of ones I'm trying out. Um, I'd like to only select for beauty. I'd like to see the beautiful beauty in everyone, even people I don't like. <laughs> I don't want to be attached to my beautiful possessions. I don't want to get um, uh, I don't want to get the wrong impression from them. I don't want other people to get the wrong impression from um, beautiful possessions I have. 
I, uh, don't want to be a coward about ugliness or aging or beauty. I don't want to be ashamed of myself. I want to strive to see honorable actions, even ones that involve quite a bit of loss as beautiful, um, a criteria from the ancient Stoics, I think. And then finally, that we could find all of nature beautiful, which seems very ambitious, but I think that's okay. Thank you guys so much. It's really um, exciting to be doing philosophy, philosophy publicly, and I am so grateful for the experience. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, everyone in the chat, a round of applause. Goodness, you got our minds working there, Jennifer, with all the sayables. I'm making lists and that. I was wondering in the chat, everyone, I think mm. if anyone has a little problem, maybe we, we might even have some time just to work through the sayables for your specific problem. Um, I just want to quickly ask something that Francis questioned, and I'll wait for everyone in the chat to pop in. Um, Francis Gasparini said, I'm, I'm not clear how selecting between indifference is virtuous or leads to virtue. Yeah, so it's just a it's a description of the same um, uh, thing, I guess, uh, we more commonly uh, say about virtue. So if you can imagine any case of virtue, you know, what letting a little old lady go in front of you in a line, you know, that could be described as um, selecting between indifference, because it didn't really matter that you got there first, you know, at the counter, that doesn't really matter. And so if you had been thinking it mattered, you were you were rating indifference wrong. And that's giving you the, that's even giving you the compliment like, oh, you know what virtue is. You know, virtue wasn't like at stake in this decision other than choosing the wrong indifferent. Yeah. If that helps. Yeah, but it is, think, it's, yeah. It's a, <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Francis, for the question. I'm just looking in the chat to see if anyone's got a fear of beauty or non or not being beautiful so that we can solve that one but I think for me the aging one kind of speaks to me can we just work through what would my sayables be so yeah like I yeah. mean I think aging, of aging and yeah go ahead it's long and embarrassing is that a fair it's humiliating it's it's right. happening to us you know I mean it's a, it's a <laughs> it feels really personal and the Stoics would need to talk us out of those common beliefs about it. It yeah. can't be those things. Does that yeah. make sense? It just yeah. wouldn't <laughs> not with like what we know about life, not with how we value older people, you know, not with how our days go. Yeah. Does that make sense? And yeah, that makes sense. And so you just have a list. You literally just, you read that list to us, didn't you? You just read this list. And so you have, you make a list and what you... Do you then just go over it and meditate it with you uh, every day or? Oh, no, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not even close. I'm not to saying me. you per, per se, but you know, should we? That would be the process of practic being practically rational, which like, I do think it's very important. We start to, to illustrate it because we, we throw out the term and, you know, now contemporary ethicists are attacking us for being so vague as if, uh, you know, it's, it's, we're just blowing smoke or hand waving. But in some of the ancient examples, it's just as simple as can be. And it also has this wonderful um, feature where, like in the example with the father, you, you can understand someone's poor practical reasoning from the outside. So it's, it's not the case that it's just this internal process. I mean, you know, anyone who benefits from therapy or anyone who's a, a good friend, we, we've worked people through these processes. And then sometimes the best you can do is just say where someone got stuck. Like the reason he does that is because he believes, you know, and we might know he, he did not finish the process of, of reasoning practically or for, mm. for Anesis. Yeah. Thanks, Jennifer. I can see a number of sales filling the chat. Beauty doesn't only refer to aesthetics. Aging need not be negative. We can develop wisdom with experience. Eric has a question for you. How will the concept of beauty change? Once, thanks to biotechnology, we are able to indefinitely remain biologically young and reverse aging. Yeah, I mean, I haven't thought deeply about that, but I, you know, because how we look is an indifferent, I feel like it's it's no it causes no crisis for a stoic. So if we all, you know, were filtered all the time, or you know, could pick our avatar, that that doesn't, uh, you know, make our lives easier. So that was an indifferent. Anyway, so it, that would be a 
a horrible thing for people who stake a lot on beauty or have uh, these ideas about merit and beauty. But um, yeah, I feel like stoicism could be very flexible with a future like that. Yeah. Can you just explain to me um, one thing? We do have some time. And I think someone mentioned this in the chat and I'm formulating a question around that. You said that um, one response would be like to care and not care. Okay. Is that the same as moderation? Um, to care and not care. Is it the same as, I, I don't think it's the same as moderation, even though I'm not very good. I never, um, I really do focus on practical rationality at the expense of, of thinking about what the, the particular virtues guide us to do. So could someone be immoderate and also be capable of detaching like from their wealth or their fame or their power? Yeah, I think so. You know, uh, okay. that's easy to imagine. Right. So it's, it's not as if just being able to understand indifference aren't virtue means that you are, you know, disciplined in every direction. Cause there might be other beliefs or, or a lack of beliefs that they get you to moderate yourself. Does that sound fair? Yeah. 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 I'm just going to read a sayable from Tom in the chat. Um, at the age of six, I told my grandmother, wrinkles are a sign of beauty. She insisted I was a genius for the rest of her life. <laughs> All right, we've got three minutes for one more question. I see Eric Ruth has a question. Uh, Eric says, how does a beautiful person balance their ego with virtue if they're using their beauty to further a purpose they justify as virtuous? say an actor using their face to advertise for stoicism or if Ryan Holiday stopped writing and started modeling but did so while espousing Seneca a better way to put it is a philosopher's only fans virtuous only fans okay well now I'm out of my depth but <laughs> if you just use your beautiful face for business or promotion of something I don't even think it would have to be stoicism I mean big whoop you know this is like the realism I think like yeah some people's faces are so attractive uh, you know it's unbearable you know I mean just some people are glamorous beautiful I mean it's um it's what I like about stoicism is you can recognize all of that and how attractive it is to the rest of us and you know how much we like to uh see it and and then it, that it doesn't have to lead to any harm you know it's, it's just like any tool or, or or colors or you know I mean a purple purse, you know, so the stoic conception, um, doesn't have to make us neurotic or like Puritans. Um, and it's funny how much I think we do import that like a morally serious person would not carry a purse. I mean, you, you see how gendered that even is, but you know, yeah. some of them think the stoics should be blamed for. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks as always for, uh, yeah, a really interesting deep dive into seeing this philosophy. Very, very practical. I uh, really enjoyed that. Everyone, um, a round of applause in the chat. And while you're um, applauding in the chat, I'm going to hand the microphone over to you, Jennifer, because you're going to introduce our next speaker. Yeah, I'm very excited about this because the best videos on YouTube are from Greg Sadler. <laughs> and I think every one of my students has probably watched a hundred of your videos. So um uh, Greg is an amazing philosopher, and he's going to uh, be presenting on From the Cosmos to Cracks in Bread, Things of Beauty for the Stoics. And um, he is former editor of Stoicism Today, teaches at the Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design, produces those amazing uh, philosophy videos on his YouTube channel, co-hosts the Wisdom for Life radio show, and is a certified philosophical counselor. Uh, there's more about him in the conference program, so please look at that after this uh, wonderful talk. Thanks, Greg. Well, thanks so much. That's a very nice introduction. And um, my talk, you could say, is a little less ambitious, perhaps, than almost everyone that I've heard so far. Um, and it's just looking at types of matters that Stoics describe as beautiful. And obviously, if we wanted to be comprehensive in this, we'd need like a whole seminar because they say so many things about beauty and so many things are, are beautiful. So we're just going to look at a selection of examples drawn from the three Stoic thinkers that I think almost everybody is the most familiar with, which would be Seneca and Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius. 
And we're looking at examples that are coming directly from their text. Um, I've put them into kind of an order and hopefully it's one that has a good flow and makes sense for people. So we're, we're doing a little bit of an itinerary here. And I'll just note very briefly, uh, several times terminology has come up. Almost all of the examples that we're looking at in Epictetus's and Marcus Aurelius's Greek are using the word kalon. There's a, a few where that's not the case. And then Seneca's tend to be um, pulker, beauty, beautiful, you know, um, and so these are the, the things that we're going to be looking at. And the general plan is to begin with some common instances and, and features of beautiful things, and then widen our scope as far as it can possibly go to the entire cosmos itself, and then descend through us human beings and get down to really humble and seemingly unbeautiful things and think about what the Stoics have to tell us about them. And, you know, what we can do at the end is think about how we can have good or bad or wise or foolish responses to beauty, something that we've already had a lot of discussion of already, including in the last presentation. And we can call out some guidelines, which again, I think is something we've been hearing about a, a good bit already, about how we can properly and positively appreciate beautiful items without getting sucked into, let's call it the seductive side of, I won't say bad beauty, but you know, more problematic uh, instances. So there's, there's two passages I'd, I'd really like to start with. And one of these is from Marcus Aurelius in Meditations Book 4. He says, beautiful things of any kind are beautiful in themselves and sufficient to themselves. Praise is extraneous. The object of praise remains what it was, no better, no worse. This applies, I think, even to beautiful things in ordinary life, physical objects, artworks. Does anything genuinely beautiful need supplementing? No more than justice does, or truth, or kindness, or humility. Are any of those improved by being praised or damaged by contempt? Is an emerald suddenly flawed if no one admires it, or gold, or ivory, or purple, liars, knives, flowers, bushes? And so what we've got here are references to beautiful things in what he calls um, ordinary, or we could say even common life, koinotero, um, the most common sorts of things, things that we're all accustomed to calling beautiful. And so, you know, he talks about emeralds and other precious things. Now, you know, that's changed culturally <laughs> over time. Not too many of us are walking around with gold or emeralds or anything like that. And we can reproduce some of these things uh, by industrial processes. So perhaps their value has come down a bit, but, you know, uh, fine works of craftsmanship, you know, like a great musical instrument or, or a knife or pick whatever else you want. We go into people's houses and we talk about the moldings as being beautiful or, uh, you know, landscaping, gardens, all of these sorts of organic things that we look at. We might think about beautiful animals as well. And notice the point that he's making here. All of these are beautiful in themselves. They're sufficient in themselves, whether we praise them or show contempt for them or just ignore them entirely. So as many of the speakers have noted, beauty for the Stoics is something that's that's real. It's out there. It's available to us, even if we don't necessarily have the right kind of subjective responses to them. And that would be the praising or grasping it. Um, and notice as, as well that there's a analogy that's being drawn here with justice, with truth, with kindness, or better put, goodwill, eunoia, and shame or humility, eidos, these moral qualities that we're looking for in, in people. So that's a great stage setter. And then Seneca adds something that I think is really good to remind ourselves of. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more in the end. In letter 76, he says that, Sometimes, from an extremely beautiful object, one experiences great joy even in a tiny space of time. So out of something that is really striking us, we have gaudium, 
joy, which is one of the good emotions, right? Uh, for, for Stoics, this is a proper affective response to things. And notice that he says, even if just for a short time, tempore ac brevi in Latin. And I think that's a great reminder. We don't always have to be on when it comes to the perception of beauty. Sometimes it's enough just to have experienced it for a short period, and then we can remember it over time. So let's uh, zoom out and think in terms of the biggest object we could possibly take in, the entire world, the entire universe. And this is not a uniquely stoic thing by any means, right? Uh, it's other philosophers before the Stoics are looking up at the heavens or looking at the earth and saying, holy crap, is this beautiful? This is amazing. Let's take this in. And it's not just philosophers. It's it's people of all walks of life who are grasping this. And, you know, we can look at uh, the, the sky, we can look at the landscape, we can look at physical processes and, and find something there. And we can ask ourselves, okay, well, what makes the world or the universe beautiful? And, you know, just pause for a moment and think about your own experiences of natural beauty. What did they encompass? Certainly there was an aspect of the senses, taking things in. We never see the whole universe. We never even see the entire landscape, right? Uh, in part, because our eyes are right in the front of our head. I suppose a horse probably takes in a little bit more than we do because they're a prey creature rather than a predator creature like ourselves. Um, but they don't take in everything either. So we're extending ourselves out into the universe through our minds. And we're, we're imagining something, uh, the force of impressions or appearances, fantasiae is, is part of beauty for this. And what are the Stoics actually seeing? So I'm going to have a little play on words here. The Greek word for universe is cosmos. That's also the Greek word for order and proportion and arrangement. So we can say that it's actually the cosmos of the cosmos that is being grasped both through our senses and our imagination and our rationality. And it's also that we're grasping um something like a divine rationality at work. And this, this could raise some problems for uh, modern Stoics who think that the universe doesn't contain any elements of that. And we can talk about that a bit later. Certainly for Seneca, certainly for Epictetus, certainly for Marcus Aurelius, that was part of it. So I've got two passages here from Seneca that I want to put before you, but you know, we could easily bring up similar passages from Epictetus or Marcus Aurelius. So if you've if you've ever read Seneca's letter 65, which I highly advise that you do, you know, he's talking about Plato and Aristotle and their notion of causes there, and he brings them together in a beautiful harmonization and then says that they've gotten things wrong. And here's the stoic point of view on it, you know, typical Seneca there. He tells us that God made this wonderful universe, and he did so by using a model, a platonic form, essentially, an exemplar. And he says, the model according to which God, Deus, made such a vast and supremely beautiful piece of work, namely the entire universe. So for Seneca, the entire cosmos is something that is beautiful, and it's modeled after something even further, even deeper, a, in a, an idea in the divine mind. Um, in On Benefits, Seneca, and he says things like this in many places, clarifies uh, even further, the gods gave us the second rank in this supremely beautiful home and put us in charge of the earth. And this is a typical uh, ancient Stoic point of view. Rational beings are in charge of things. We're sort of like God's deputies. So we better not screw it up, of course. And we get to apprehend this amazing, beautiful cosmos that we, we exist in, that we have a, a job in. So here we can start thinking about us human beings. And we have multiple and complex and interconnecting parts to play in relation to beauty. One of these is that we are creators and producers of beauty. We produce things 
that we consider to be beautiful, when we work with materials that we consider precious, right? Setting the emerald in the gold necklace. Oh, that's that's nice, right? Make it, maybe we make a, a beautiful gold statue of uh, Seneca. <laughs> we could do that as well. Although, you know, that should be pretty indifferent from a stoic perspective. Um, and we also produce beautiful items of usefulness or attractiveness like lyres, not so much today, more guitars, pianos, things like that. Or, um, you know, Knives and other implements, your KitchenAid mixer, if it's well-designed, could be an object of beauty. Or through what we do with the physical world, engaging in gardening and landscape and arrangement. But we're also participants in the beauty of the entire cosmos that we noted earlier by being part of it, by taking up our parts uh, as as rational beings within it, as not mere animals, right? But as something that has a greater purpose. And by appreciating this universe as well, another term for that is witnessing or understanding, right? Epictetus tells us that um, we human beings don't merely take in appearances and and you know grasp them and respond to them. We understand them. And this is part of our relation to the, the divine ordering of the universe. Seneca in letter 115 says that if we could consider the mind of a great person, oh, what a beautiful sight we would see. We would see that beautiful sight, and by that he means virtue, even though it may be covered with dirt. Now, this is a, a recent translation. The Latin for that is quam vis sordido objectum. Now, sordido, grime, right? Uh, kind of scum and, and things like that. So even though we don't see the, the virtue, you know, untarnished, unblemished, we can still see it there. And now notice there's also an if there as well. Obviously, we can't open up somebody's head and peer inside and see the virtue shining in there. But we, we do see it through what people do as we'll talk about in just a moment. Um, Seneca in On Benefits also says something really quite remarkable. The power of the honorable, the honestum, the intrinsically valuable, to attract the minds of human beings is immense. Its beauty floods our minds and sweeps us along, enchanted with wonder at its brilliance and splendor. The most beautiful things are, in fact, often accompanied by a host of added attractions, but it is beauty that leads and the attractions follow along. So, you know, there's many different beautiful things. And when it comes to people that we find attractive, it, you know, we can find their bodies attractive, we can find their sense of humor great, or all sorts of other things like that. But it's really, we, we talk about inner beauty, which shows itself externally, that we can be amazed by and dazzled by and attracted to, or even sometimes Seneca doesn't talk about this here, pained by when we find that we ourselves don't measure up to those who we emulate. In On Shortness of Life, another thing that Seneca says is really quite cool. We're led by the work of others into the presence of the most beautiful treasures which have been pulled from darkness and brought to light. Now, what are these most beautiful treasures? They are the words, the thought, the, the lives being offered to us of people long gone, the possibility of a relationship with ancient thinkers who can actually give us, as Seneca will say, more life and a beautiful life on, on that, that way. So notice that beauty understood in this sense, in other human beings, has the capacity to motivate us. It can jar, it can rearrange, it can fit into our motivational structures. It can give us pleasure, it can give us joy, it can provoke desire. And not all desire is going to be bad in relation to beauty. We should desire some of the types of beauty that are out there. It can lead to emulation. Now, when we think about ourselves, because we're human beings as well, you know, we don't know ourselves perfectly. We're all a little bit of a mystery to ourselves, uh, so long as we're not the sage. And, uh, you know, if anybody is, go ahead and chime in and let us know, because it'd be kind of cool to meet a sage, but I'm not going to hold out too much hope for that here. Um, 
we do have a different kind of access to ourselves than we do to other people, right? Uh, we can't peer inside our own heads, but we we know what's going on in there a lot of the time. And so we can say, well, what makes us genuinely beautiful as opposed to the things that are beautiful in our bodies or in our possessions? And we might want to recall Enchiridion 6. There, there's a really funny passage there. Epictetus is going to say, you know, if a horse wanted to get worked up, literally uh, elated, epiromenos in, in Greek, because it, it realized that it's beautiful, which I suppose could happen. It doesn't happen all that often. Um, but if a horse was going to like, you know, preen around and act as if it's really a big deal, that's fine, right? That's a horse thing. But for you to be elated because you own a beautiful horse, that's just ridiculous. The horse isn't you. That beauty doesn't belong to you at all, even if you have like a title to it. And so uh, he says, what is us there? And, and here he says one thing that sometimes I think gets people a bit confused when they only focus in on passages like that. Use of appearances, the chresis fantasion. That's not all that is up to us. That's not everything that we do, but that's a really important thing. And this actually addresses a lot of the questions that people are asking about the use of the indifference or our relation to them. Um, many of them are, are indifferent, right? And that that is up to us. And, and that is part of how we become beautiful. In Discourses 3.1, Epictetus is going to give us a lot you know, more let's say, focused teaching about this. And he's talking about the context of what makes a person beautiful. And he begins by talking about dogs and horses, right? What makes those animals beautiful? And he says, it will be correct to pronounce each of them beautiful so far as it is developed suitably to its own nature. And you know, we can talk about this in terms of many of the things that people have brought up, proportion, function, all of those sorts of things. I, just as a digression, there is a beautiful two-year-old cat that I was uh, hanging out with yesterday at a cat shelter. And um, she's beautiful in a sense because she is just a brute. She's super strong, super fast. Um, very dominant when it comes to other cats, loves to play, right? Well, that's the way a cat ought to be at that age, right? Um, and we could go on and on and talk about all sorts of other kinds of animals as well. Now, what about us? We're not dogs or cats or horses or any of those sorts of things. So he's talking to a guy who comes into his school and he's a little bit too dressed up, a little bit too put together. And he says, if you make yourself such a quality, you know you will make yourself beautiful. But if you neglect those things, even though you use every contrivance to appear beautiful, you must necessarily be deformed. For you, what are you? You are not flesh and hair, but your faculty of choice, your proiresis. And if you take care to have this become beautiful, well, then you're beautiful because that's what you truly are. And so if we want to be beautiful, we have to think about our rational and social nature, about the virtues, about our character, about the use of appearances and indifference, and about our relationships and roles, our connections to other people. And notice, going back to another theme that came up at the very beginning of this conference, these things are up to us. These are within the scope of our, whatever you want to call it, control, power, business, the epumon, right? Um, Hamon, rather. Um, so notice that that there's interconnections here. We haven't just started with the cosmos, and then we got cosmic beauty, and then the beauty of other people, and then our own beauty. These are all interconnected with each other, right? We take part in society, we take part in a cosmos as rational beings. And that means developing the virtues. That means making beautiful choices. That means sometimes also finding the spots of ugliness within ourselves and looking at those and figuring out how we're going to address those. And now we get to things that might be a little bit ugly or have the potential for that. 
Marcus Aurelius in Meditations 3.2, a passage that we've already talked about a little bit, um, we should remember that even nature's inadvertence has its own charm, its own attractiveness. The way that loaves of bread split open on top in the oven, the ridges are just byproducts of the baking and yet pleasing somehow. They rouse our appetite without our knowing why or how ripe figs begin to burst and olives on the point of falling. The shadow of decay gives them a peculiar beauty. Stalks of wheat bending under their own weight, the furrowed brow of the lion, flecks of foam on the boar's mouth and other things. If you look at them in isolation, there's nothing beautiful about them. And yet by supplementing nature, they enrich it and draw us in. And anyone with a feeling for nature, um, a deeper sensitivity will find it all gives pleasure. Even what seems inadvertent, he'll find the jaws of live animals as beautiful as painted ones or sculpture. He'll look calmly at the distinct beauty of old age and men, women, and at the loveliness of children. And other things like that will call out to him constantly, things unnoticed by others, things seen only by those at home with nature and its works. So notice what he's talking about here. There's this availability of beauty everywhere. We have to make ourselves capable of grasping it. We have to have not just a deeper uh, understanding, but a deeper, uh, the word there is annoyance, a common uh, concept that we can tap into as human beings. Um, a feeling, a pathos we need as well. And notice there's, you know, nothing in these things that is going to make us that way. It's up to us and how we look at it. So there's a passage I want to bring up just to tie all of this together, and then we'll we'll jump into some good discussion, hopefully. Epictetus, as you know, wants us to be purple threads. He says, I want to be the purple, that small and brilliant portion, which causes the rest to appear comely and beautiful. What good does the purple do to the garment? What to, but to be beautiful in itself and to set a good example to the rest. Now you could interpret this as, well, there's purple threads and that's great. And then there's the white garment and that's all crap. You know, don't be a white garment person, but no, it's a cohesive whole. It's not a contrast here of good versus bad or wise versus stupid or anything like that. He is saying, you know, you can be the purple thread and then you provide a good example and you beautify the rest. And I want to say, although Epictetus doesn't say this, Maybe we can think of the purple thread person as also one who provides us with an example for how to genuinely appreciate the beauty that's out there waiting for us to grasp it and respond to it in our lives. And so, you know, do we have guidelines for this? There have been a lot of that have been given, I think, that are very helpful here. And so I'm just going to say three quick things, and then maybe others will have uh, some guidelines they want to bring up. We do need to direct ourselves towards the right kinds of beauty and to be open to recognizing them. The beauty of the cosmos, the beauty in other people that is not just of their faces or clothing or uh, bodies or things like that. And we also have to avoid certain mindsets that I think are quite prevalent in our own time that want to control or to consume or to commodify beauty. And then the other thing that we have to do is extricate ourselves from excessive and irrational responses to what we take as beautiful. And Epictetus gives us an example of this in the Enchiridion when he says, you see a beautiful body, you've got temperance to help you deal with that, right? You have the capacity to, to do all of these sorts of things. So that is all that I have for you. I think I've taken up a little bit more time than I was supposed to. So hopefully we'll have some good Q and A and uh, we can uh, maybe derive some new guidelines as well. Oh, that was so wonderful. Okay. Can we do the clap in the comments thing, which is so cool. And you do have some questions. That was wonderful. So um, I, I'm just going to start with the most recent. Is there anything imaginary that is beautiful to classic Stoics? Oh, um, imaginary. Yeah, I mean, so imaginary as in not really existing, I suppose you would say, right? So um, yeah, we could talk about 
um, narrative figures in, in fiction, like in drama, right? And it's kind of funny because in a lot of cases, Epictetus will say, ah, the, you know, the Iliad's just a bunch of connected appearances. You know, uh, we look at these plays, but I mean, you Seneca wrote plays, so presumably he thought there was some value there. Um, and I, I think, you know, we could look at at fictional characters and at things that they're going through and say, aha, there's some there's some beauty there, perhaps beauty in terms of virtue or other things as well. Like we could say the relationship between people of say love could be beautiful, right? Um, you think of uh, Perseus's poem where he has, and I'm not counseling this as, as a, a great example for all of us, but Cato and his, and his wife, you know, uh, they've been separated from each other, but they still love each other. Well, there's a kind of beauty there, right? But Cato was a real person, but Perseus is Cato is not real Cato. It's it's an imagination. So maybe that would be um, a great question, a great answer. Now the problem is we have these amazing uh, questions lining up. Um, do you think that the beauty of virtue is one of the core arguments for why virtue is the only good? Oh, that's, that is actually a great question. And I won't be able to explore that fully, but I mean, you do see in a lot of Stoic texts, um, you know, think about Marcus's uh, reminder to himself in the morning, right? Um, The people who are screwed up don't realize that the good is the beautiful. And so there's, there's this great overlap, the, the genuinely beautiful. And there is a beauty to virtue and it's got multiple affective elements to it this is where like uh, i think it's seneca's letter 120 uh, when he's talking about where do we get our ideas of the virtues from can be quite helpful and he says it's according to analogy and what he means by analogy there is something like a grasping a rudimentary thing. So we see somebody, you know, this isn't what we see all the time, but there's this guy defending the bridge against the enemy and he's displaying this remarkable courage. And we're like, holy crap, look at that guy. You know, <laughs> And we, we respond to it and we grasp the virtues in that way. And I think, you know, we, we do have like definitions of virtue, but we really do need instances and examples that you and I can relate to as, as human beings. Right. So that might, you know, that might play into that. Well, this is uh, really hard because there are a lot of good questions up here. And I think we have time for one, but one is uh, related to what you just described. Is there, I mean, I think you said something like uh, our virtue does sometimes uh, come out in um, um, our physical. Did you say something like that? Oh, well, no, I, I, I mean, it's, we do virtue through our bodies, we could say, right. And we can tell whether somebody is virtuous sometimes by what they say, but obviously if they just tell you, well, I'm courageous, that doesn't make them courageous, right? Um, we see it in their actions and the patterns of those, those actions, and then the words that go along with them. And there has to be, you know, kind of a, a, a consonance be, between those, a consistency. And that's how we actually witness virtue. Um, we, we can't ever like look inside with some sort of x-ray for moral purposes and find the virtue lurking in the heart or the, the head or whatever it happens to be. Um, we have to go by outward appearances. And I mean, I don't even know if we can like look inside ourselves with the inner eye or whatever metaphor we want to use and see the virtue shining within us. I think we have to see it in, in what we do over and over and over again. And that's manifest in this physical world that we exist in. Yeah. So it might not be physical beauty in a conventional sense. That was the thing. But but maybe a, a, a stoic will see things other than uh, physical beauty, even if they're observing the same behavior as, as a non-stoic. You know, and just to before we totally run out of time, how you use whatever measure of physical beauty you have could be how you demonstrate virtue, right? Are you like full of yourself and expect people to um, fall all over themselves doing nice things for you if you happen to be attractive for a little while? Um, well, that would be unvirtuous, right? Uh, be- being attractive and yet behaving like a decent human being, well, that would be at least on the way to virtue. So great. Thank well- you, Greg and Jennifer. That was just amazing. Thank you both. Big round of applause again in the chat. Flood that chat with your applause emojis. And Gregory, I'm going to hand the mic back to you because you are introducing our next speaker. 
Yeah. So this turned out very uh, fortuitously well, because I get to introduce somebody who I'm not only a big fan of and cite a lot in my own writings, but I now count as a friend and colleague, Professor Nancy Sherman, um, who is going to talk about dancing with the Stoics. And this ties in with a very exciting <laughs> new project that she has going on, which I'll let her tell you about. Nancy is Distinguished University Professor at Georgetown University, is a New York Times notable author. Uh, most recent book is Stoic Wisdom. She gives frequent podcasts and interviews and lectures all over the world. She not only has a, a really solid background in Stoicism, but also is an Aristotle scholar, writes on military ethics, on moral injury, just a host of interesting topics. So I'm very much looking forward to this talk. And with that, I turn Turn it over to you. Thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate that. It's um, lovely to be here and I hope everyone's doing well. A long day. Um, and thank you for that lovely introduction, Greg. And thank you to the hosts uh, and organizers, Catherine and Phil, um, especially. So we'll hope that I can um, easily uh, share my screen when I need to, um, but I'm not sure that I see um, that I can do that here. So just give me a sec to um, be able to share the screen because it's the possibility is not, ah, there we go. Okay, good enough. So um, let me begin with a question, a sort of facetious question, but I'll, I'll begin. Um, can we dance with the Stoics? Um, really, uh, does the art form capture key Stoic notions about how to flourish? Uh, in the pursuit of virtue. Would the ancients have the slightest interest? And now I'm thinking about partner dance, in partner dance. Um, um, you know, Zeno might have attracted large crowds, the painted colonnade, the Stopoikile, but would he attract a dance audience? <laughs> Boleto maniacs. Um, and we know Epictetus had a lame foot. Um, Marcus, in the time of the um, uh, um, campaign, uh, along the Danube that I'll speak about shortly um, was um, suffering from Antonine plague. So he wouldn't have been up for dancing. So, um, and it wasn't fitting for an emperor really to do the kind of mime dance. But what I'm really musing about is not, can they dance? Um, or would they in principle be interested in dance? What would interest them in principle about that? Um, you know, what would be in uh, interest them in the idea of following your step, catching your tempo, swaying with your sway? Uh, would they get the idea, um, not so much the know-how, but the know that, as we say, of what's at stake in mirroring your steps without colliding into you or marching in formation? Um, since uh, in the ancient world and in our world too, the, the military parade is this kind of form of dance um, or keeping the right distance so no one trips. Um, you know, would they have philosophical interest in the idea of dancing in time with the Kithra, Nero's famous fiddle or Pan's flute? We were just talking about um, imaginary creatures um, or uh, figures in literature. Um, uh, epics as told on stage or the like. So music and dance that follows the ancient modes, um, Dorian, Lydian, Phrygian, um, if you're readers of Aristotle and Plato, um, was sort of like major and minor modes, have always had a time-honored place in ancient moral education. Uh, Aristotle tells us through the rhythm of dance figures, uh, we can imitate character emotion and actions. And I take this up a bit in um, my early book, Fabric of Character. Plato's a little worried about uh, getting the wrong ideas through um, music and dance. And so he has some sen uh, censorship well known. But nonetheless, um, dance was venerated in the ancient world, um, even if it had to be controlled. So, but is there something special in particular about partner dance that captures Stoic philosophical ideas. And I, I think there is, and that has to do with social connection, connecting with others through their steps. Um, and partner dance especially emphasizes that social connectivity. 
But that image, you know, just briefly of social connection and its importance as symbolized uh, for the purposes of today in my talk in, in dance, partner dance, flies in the face of a popular gloss on ancient stoicism um, that many um, that many really celebrate. And that is that uh, stoicism is about tough individual grit. You retreat to the inner citadel and you use meditative exercises to minimize the impact of the exter exterior world. Um, so of course we anticipate tragic loss through these meditative exercises. Um, we manage fear and grief that might come to us from our vulnerabilities so that all of these um, assaults don't uh, unravel us, you might say. So if that's the case, um, what would you want to do with leaping onto a dance floor into, you know, Mar Margot of Fontaine into Nureyev's arms? You know, he might not be ready to catch you at that very moment. That's putting your faith in someone else's um, hands. Um, it's not retreating to the inner citadel by any means. So if we think of stoicism as strengthened by the self, inner self, and, and by minimizing the impact of others, um, then how do we really uh, deal with dance? Um, I want to argue that the Stoics really do have a notion of Stoic social, of social grit, you might say. Um, and I talk about that a bit in Stoic Wisdom. Um, and we can gl glimpse it one view of that social self strengthen through connection again in dance. Children play by dancing with others. It's an early form of social bonding. Adults play by dancing with others. It's a um, form of uh, bonding throughout life. I danced with my mother when she was 97. She in a wheelchair, I in a, um, you know, twirling her around, making sure that we didn't, um, I didn't do it too fast. But, um, you know, we were mindful that we were really connecting. It was a farewell dance, it, um, but we did it together locked in step. So as the ancients knew, that kind of connectivity finds its home, um, not only in dancing on stage or on a village threshing floor uh, in some festival to the gods, it's key to the cadences of military march as well. Um, that's stepping in time to a rhythm. Um, parade drills and military processions go hand in hand. In the Greek world, um, in the ancient Greek world, um, the young soldiers, the Ephebes, uh, were soldiers during one season on stage in choruses. And then, excuse me, they were choristers in one season, and then they would move to the campaign, to the rural uh, areas outside of the urban areas to take up battle. So they switched a helmet uh, that was from the campaign to a kind of mask, but they move back and forth. So, and that connection, uh, it, it was maintained even in this, uh, you know, in the um, 17th century, Louis the 14th was a consummate ballet dancer, and he would send his ballet master out to the fields, to the parade grounds in order to train his troops. So uh, let's see if I can um, share my screen for a half sec. Um, I'm hoping you see it, Greg. We good? Yeah. Um, good. Okay. Um, so, well, that's of course Matisse showing you the connectivity of dancers, modern Museum of Modern Art um, in New York. Um, but there's Louis the Fourteenth, dancer as he was, and here's the idea of connecting. That's Swan Lake. Um, look, you know, it's one body connecting. Um, this looks like the uh, peacock images some of you have as your backdrops. Um, amazing, that's Swan Lake. One, one body, a cadre, a core, a corps de ballet, a body of ballet. And there's, there again, it looks like one body in synchrony connecting with one another. And a parade ground, very similar. This is West Point in the United States. Um, but here is Balanchine doing it for the Union Jack, and here is Balanchine doing it, George Balanchine doing it for Stars and Stripes. Um, okay, let's see now if I can stop the share for a half sec. Okay, there we go. So um, for Louis the Fourteenth, it wasn't just to train troops. His his notion was, he said, it's most advantageous for nobility to know how to um, um, move 
um, in the right status and rank, but also once you're out in the battlefield. And, you know, of course, I had, I doubt that Marcus Aurelius was ever reading, um, or excuse me, that Louis XIV was reading Marcus <laughs> Aurelius. Maybe he was, but listen to the meditations. He's, he's jotting down from the battlefield thoughts, and he says, um, we have to think about um, bodies in mutually intertwined movements and ordered re arrangements. We've been speaking about cosmos, the order of the cosmos, um, a kind of cosmic choreography. And he says, bodies in alignment are like fellow workers in what comes to pass in the world. And he says, we sometimes move like sleepers, unconscious and blind, but with a little training, we can um, mirror each other and coordinate our movements. And um, so uh, now you might say we sort of create a group movement. Mirror and your, um, I've studied a little bit of this, but I'm no expert by any means, but um, mirror neurons, which I don't fully believe in as uh, genetic or um, um, nonetheless seem to certain of the same neurons may fire in our brains, macaque monkey brains, when we observe someone doing what we can do and when we observe it in simple movements like pincer movements um, and the like. So if I have it in my repertoire, in a certain way, seeing is doing, the same neurons may, um, may fire. And, you know, I suspect Marcus was thinking a little bit along these lines when he was uh, setting up or Roman soldiers would march 30 to 40 kilometers in a given day, and they would mark their steps to a rhythm of right, left, right, left, uh, dex sin, dex sin, dexter sinister in Latin. And they would um, sing to cadences in order to connect with each other. So Marcus is thinking of, I think, these the synchronies in bodies. And at the break of, you know, on a sleepless night, he himself a kind of sleepless worker. He had, as many of you know, who had trouble sleeping um, when he was in battle. He wrote that if we don't connect with each other, we're like a dismembered hand or foot, a head hacked off, lying somewhere else from the body in um, meditation seven. And so um, we need to, he says, work together. That's how we're born. We were born to work together like feet or hands or eyelids. He has body parts a lot, um, like the rose. He must have had a good orthodontist because he talks about the rose <laughs> of upper and lower tree teeth, you know, working well together. Um, so um, this is a kind of synchrony of movement, um, whether you're on the battlefield or on a dance floor. Um, with this in mind, uh, I want to just briefly, with a little aside, um, turn to someone who captured the synchrony on the battlefield better than anyone I know. And it's the World War I epic poet, um, London and Welsh, David Jones, hailed by T.S. Eliot, is one of the greatest poets of his era. And he was himself a Welsh fusilier, and he writes an amazing epic poem to my mind, parentheses, um, about the Battle of the Somme, toward the uh, Somme, uh, which was a horrible, as Robert Graves says, balls up essentially of massacre. Um, but uh, this is how this fusilier himself writes. He was also an artist. He was uh, did a remarkable artwork as well, plastic painting, plastic arts. Feet plodding in each other's unseen tread, so close to blunder, toe by heel tripping, file mates, blind on following, just like Marcus's blind workers, um, moving with a singular identity, feet following file friends. So in this march, the cues come not from a drum or a pipe, because that would be a cue to the um, to the Germans, but from the from from the step on the stone or the Burberry, he says, interlined Burberry. These are the, the trench coats, damp flapping across knee joint, pop, 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 like a metronome almost. Um, and so it's the subtle mechanics of bonding in March, muscle bonding, some say, of the body knowing what the mind doesn't, 
Um, and he gives us this sense, I think, that Marcus was talking about of, of sleepwalkers in synchrony uh, working almost as one. So are there other ancient images that depict the synchrony of bodies in motion that are at once dance-like in a part of a theater of war? And um, there are, um, and I don't know if Marcus would have known of these, uh, but uh, here's one, for example. Are we there? Can you see that? Is it, is it up? Not yet. Not yet. There you go. Okay, there we go. Um, so there we have it. Uh, it's the, excuse me, I don't want to lose something here. Um, it's the, um, it's the Neo, it, it's from Ajurpanipal, the ruler, Neo-Syrian. Many of you probably know this from the British Museum. Um, there's also one of these at Yale, um, British Gallery and other places, I presume. And it's- we a, lost look the share uh, there, Yeah, we're not seeing you yet. Oh, you're not seeing it? Hold on. Nope. How is that to be the case? One minute. Share screen. Are we seeing it now? Yes. Yes? We got it. Uh, Greg, say yes or no. Yeah, we got it, Nancy. Okay, super. So what you've got there is these, um, dancers in a kind of uh, uh warriors in a kind of phalanx moving forward um and they're all in a line and i have to now just sort of give you a sense here of there they are again angular flat warrior movements and here this is martha graham she studied greek philosophy uh, the greek movements assyrian movements as did her, um, her, her um, uh, Ted Sean and um, Saint Denis, Ruth Saint Denis, Isadora Duncan, they all were very moved by early imagery. That's um, Doris Humphrey. It's all very sideway tilts, um, a little like those Assyrian dancers. This is Martha Graham steps in the street commemorating the Spanish Civil War, where a lot of British and American. Um, lefty kind of soldiers went to fight against fascism. Um, there it is again. That's very Assyrian, that movement of the side bodies. Uh, she was studying these imageries, so it's quite remarkable. So let me stop share for a half sec and then try to share one more time. So there you have dance um, imitating uh, the battlefield imagery. Um, now, what about Seneca? He's simply brilliant on the idea of partner dance, but his notion is partnering as in the game of catch, because he uh, thinks of that simple games were often forms of dance, as children sort of sort of knew ring around the rosy, pocket full of posy, that kind of stuff. They're dancing in circle dances, but they're playing at the same time. And in his case, um, he's thinking of it, the game of catch as requiring mutual attunement, a synchrony with your partner. And this is Seneca on benefits. Greg was just telling us about on benefits book two, sometimes translated on favors, de beneficis. I would like to take up the analogy uh, regarding gift giving, which our own Chrysippus drew with a game of ball. It falls to the ground through the fault of either the person throwing it or the person receiving it. Um, while it remains in play only by being properly passed and thrown from one and caught to the other pa a pair of hands. A good player needs to send it off differently to a tall partner than to a short one, just like dancers need to know how tall or short their partners are if you're going to partner them well on a dance floor or catch them in a leap. Um, again, if the game is with a trained and practiced player, We'll should be, we shall be bolder in throwing the ball. No matter how it comes, his hand will be ready to drive it back. Against an untrained novice, we shall not throw it so hard or so vigorously, but be more relaxed, aiming the ball right into his hands and simply meeting it when it comes back. No pitcher would do this <laughs> in a baseball field. Um, we should use the same procedure doing favors. So Seneca tells us we should know how to give gifts, how to be generous to others so that we're attuned to their needs. He says, never give, um, never give a country bumpkin uh, a, a stack of books, 
never give someone in the summer a hot, a heavy winter coat. Know your audience, know how to give a gift. Um, and he says, it's like the fluid notion of the three graces. A gift, Seneca says, fallen Chrysippus, is characterized by three gestures, the giving, the receiving, and the returning. It's a dance of reciprocity that flows back on itself seamlessly from person to person. They hold hands on a dance that goes back on itself. And let's see if I can share the screen one last time. Um, there you have that. But that's the dance of Apollo with the muses. They're dancing back and forth um, in catching each other's hands, you might say, um, very much like Matisse's uh, dance, dancers, la dance, um, there. Um, let's stop share. So there you have this game of uh, uh, game of catch, dances of the graces, um, benefactions back and forth, all requiring coordination, a certain amount of synchrony. And it's meant to be a model not just for giving favors, for generosity, uh, essentially, we would say, or goodwill, as um, um, Greg, I think, mentioned earlier, um, but for how to listen and respond. Good teachers do this all of the time. You know um, you know how to keep up a back and forth dialogue and who you're talking to, graduate students, undergraduates, um, partners, et cetera, et cetera. So partnering is hard. It's hard enough on the dance floor. <laughs> it's hard when you move outside familiar patterns. Um, um, just as when we you know, you dance with people you don't know how to dance with. We don't always dance together well, like a Fontaine and a Nureyev. Most partnerships are not like a game of catch, even if the players are matched in skill. So really in asking what can the Stoics teach us through their metaphor of partnered dance or partnered synchronous movements, I'm not really saying we should turn to them because they have promising answers to the most pressing questions of this week and last week about global peace and cooperative living in regions that have not known that, that would be the height of folly. What I'm really asking is, um, is this, uh, is that what I'm really saying is it's stoic interest in the cosmic global orderly choreography of coordinated movements runs deep and wide if you apply it and is integral to their understanding of our social natures, of how we connect and try to follow each other's moves without imposing our own um, in picking up another's cues in body language, in voice, in tempo, the like. So to try to move in step at least some of the time is a way to quote Seneca at the end of On Anger, a way to cultivate our humanity. Thank you very much. Hope I have time for a few questions. All right. Well, let's see what people bring in. But there's already a, a good comment that I think could be turned into a very interesting question because I, I know partly what your answer is to this. So JB wrote, as an aside, a Stoicon on the theme of Stoicism and play would be amazing. And that, that might be the case, but you have a project on play. Do you want to say something about that? Well, yeah, I have a project on play. I'm not quite sure where it will go, but I think the ancients are often thinking about seriousness. Um, uh, Spudias, the sort of, you have to be serious and play is respite. Uh, John Stuart Mill kind of picked that up, uh, you know, light, light pleasures, the, the low water ones are good for recreation. But, you know, if you really want to work hard, you know, it's leisure, but it's just a respite from other things. And and so play often gets a, a, a bad, you know, a, a bad press by the ancients. But it would be hard to imagine a work without play, a, a world without play, pardon me, um, work without play, um, love without play, scholarship without play, um, a break from seriousness. We need to have fun um, and healthy play. And children are amazing at it. And we should all 
you know, some play with cats, but I, I play with grandkids and they are pretty cool. And <laughs> I used to play with my children. <laughs> and my husband's very playful. So find yourself a partner who is really playful. Here's a question. So this is from Heath. Uh, would you describe dancing metaphorically as a way to integrate yourself properly into society as a whole? I don't really know how to think about that. That's a hard question. Um, I was thinking of, you know, I've danced much of my life. I've done a lot of modern dance. So that was my interest. And I once had a fellowship thinking about dance. And I was, it was really about, um, partnering and synchrony and moving in time with others and dance is sort of a limited way of thinking about it but it's so the social dance at least not solo dancing um but if but you know it so requires um uh moving with others so you know um and as i say i don't think the stoics well, Seneca takes it up pretty directly in that last quote. And there's certainly material in Cicero, which I didn't have time to give you today, about the grace and alignment of bodies is imitated or is representing virtue. Um, that's his that's his idea. So not a not a um hard question. I'm not sure how to can, fill can it we, out. Can we extend this from the physical into other interpersonal matters? Like you know, you think about being on a good good team in a workplace, right? Oh, absolutely. Uh, partnerships. You know, it's about partnerships, teamwork. Um, no, uh, in philosophy, we sometimes talk about, some people in philosophy language talk about uptake. Um, how do you communicate in performative moments with the right uptake? Um, and it's very much upon you to do that, uh, to give the cues to another. You know, we would say colloquially, know your audience. Diplomats mm. have to do this all the time. Um, very hard job. So, um, yeah, there's lots of ways in which dance as partnership, social partnership as connecting, knowing how to connect um, and um, be in sync. Um, read someone else's cues, read their emotions, read their body language, read their eyebrows, read their gestures, their voice, inflection. All of that is sort of um, part of our work as interlocutors. Um, and it's part of our work in doing moral philosophy, really, that has practical application, where whether it's a small group or a larger group. So here's one that calls for a little bit of speculation. And I think this will probably be our last question. Please. This is from Eric. Do you think the fact that group dances, for example, Jewish or Scottish dances are becoming less popular than partnered or solo dances says something about the world we live in now? <laughs> That's a hard question. I don't know. Um, yes. Well, Morris dancing, if that's, if that, I mean, Welsh, I think it's Welsh actually, um, you know, is, is one form, Israeli, Israeli dancing is a folk dance. Um, I'm not far in um, Bethesda from, Bethesda, Maryland, from Glen Echo that does lots of group dancing regularly. And people, I mean, I can't tango for the life of me. It's one of the hardest art forms to me. Um, but yeah, that is partnered dance. Good question. Um, not not group dance, um, but lots of people sort of think about kids who go to events. Mm. They're kind of on the floor, mash, you know, mushing about, or they're you know they're at a concert and they're you know they're doing a wave. That's pretty group. That's big group time. It's not a yeah. dance, is you know, it's dance with your hands. Well, let's all thank Nancy uh, in whatever form you want to use. Uh, great talk and uh, everything I'd expected. Thank you, thank Greg. You. Very, very kind. There. Thank you so much, Nancy and Greg, for holding that uh, Q&A. It is time now to introduce our keynote speaker. Our keynote speaker is John Verveke. John Verveke, PhD, is a philosopher and cognitive scientist. He is an associate professor and award-winning lecturer at the University of Toronto teaching in the Department of Psychology. His work and research is far ranging, including topics such as human intelligence, rationality, wisdom, and AI. Dr. Verveke has been a leading intellectual observer of the modern meaning crisis, the 
loss of a spiritual worldview in the West and the decline of wisdom traditions that help individuals find meanings, meaning in their lives. His online lectures and practices integrate teachings from many different disciplines, including philosophy, psychology, religion, and cutting edge cognitive science. Today, he joins us to speak about why beauty is deeply implicit throughout Stoicism. John will speak for 50 minutes and then we'll gather with him for a Q&A following that. John, so good to have you in the room. Over to you. Thank you, Catherine. That was probably the best introduction I've ever received. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, a couple ca caveats. Um, one, um, sorry for the title change. Uh, as I was preparing this talk, uh, the previous ideas I had kept in, enfolding into larger ideas, so I appreciate Catherine's flexibility about this. Secondly, uh, throughout this week and including today, I've been st suffering from stomach flu, and so I'm asking for a bit of flexibility and tolerance. Uh, my affect might seem slightly off. I assure you I'm very happy to be here, and um, I'm very engaged with the material I'll be presenting to you. Okay, so let's start. Why is uh, why beauty is deeply implicit in Stoicism, especially in its commitment to rationality and virtue? So Han, in his book Saving Beauty, laments that we have reduced the beautiful to the smooth. This is what he calls it. This is the pleasantly, easily accessible and useful. So the way my phone is smooth, the way many things are now smooth. And this is convergent with his work uh, in another book, Agony, The Agony of Eros, about how intimacy with mystery, which used to be in our erotic relationship, and this intimacy with mystery, which demands transformation and commitment from us, has been replaced by pornography that gives priority to easy access and use for pleasure. So this is idea of the reduction of the beautiful as something that was initially uh, very transformative and uh, very demanding upon us uh, to something that in fact puts very little demand on us whatsoever. Now he's no doubt correct how this reflects a consumerist greed in our culture and a culture oriented to quick and easy gratification to bottom line mentality, et cetera. And his argument, of course, is convergent with the argument of other people. Just one among many examples, arguments from current musicologists about the loss of complex me uh, melody in popular music in favor of super salient, please remember that notion, super salient beat and repetition. So again, we have easy access. And of course, easy access makes sense when we are doing mass marketing within a mass society. I think all of this is completely coherent argument. However, I believe that there is something more going on in this reduction of beauty to ease of access to pleasure and use. I think something else is going on. I propose that there is a deep suspicion about appearance in our culture. There is a suspicion that appearances are misleading, distorting, distracting, untrustworthy, and often being used for manipulation, nefarious manipulation. In my work with Christopher Pietro and Philip Mizovic in 2019 in a book entitled Zombies in Western Culture, a 21st Century Crisis, in which we explained the emergence of the zombie mythology as a way of articulating the meaning crisis, we noted the upsurge in the increasing prevalence and power of bullshit. People are convinced there's more and more bullshit and it is more and more powerful in our society. Now, the notion of bullshit I'm using, I'm not trying to be vulgar. I'm making explicit use of Frankfurt's technical arguments about bullshit in his seminal essay on bullshit. Um, so Frankfurt distinguishes the liar from the bullshit artist. The liar tries to manipulate your behavior by depending on your concern for the truth and getting you to believe something to be true that is not true. That is the liar. The liar is depending on your caring commitment to the truth. The bullshit artist, on the other hand, is trying to get you indifferent to whether or not some claim is true and rather to be caught up in the salience of the claim. 
So prototypical examples of this, of course, are in advertising in which, uh, you know, you see the uh, commercial and there's a beautiful person um, in a bar and they're surrounded by other beautiful people. And notice my invo invocation of that. We'll come back to that. And there's some alcohol present and they're all very happy and very healthy. And you know this isn't true. You know that this is not what you're going to see if you go into a bar. This is what you know. This is not going to happen to you when you start drinking the alcohol. And they know that you know that none of this is true. And this is the important point. It doesn't matter because it puts you into a state where you don't care whether or not it's true. And you just find the stimulus of the alcohol super salient. And therefore, you are much more likely to buy the alcohol which of course is why so much money is poured into advertising. So advertising is prototypical bullshit. It works by getting you to not care about the truth, at least some of the time, and to instead be caught up in the salience of what is being presented to you. Now, what's interesting about this is the deep connection between bullshitting and self-deception and how they mutually reinforce each other. You see, Although we use the metaphor, you cannot really lie to yourself. You cannot say to yourself, I believe X, but I, I, I want to believe Y. Because belief is not a direct voluntary action. Belief is not something you do. Pick a belief you'd like to have that everybody loves you. Okay, do it. Believe it. Go. There's nothing to be done. You can imagine it. You can hope for it. You can desire it, but you can't believe it. That's not how belief works. But you can bullshit yourself because salience is actually affected by your attention. If I say your left big toe, it is now a salient to you. And of course, when things are salient now, they will tend to attract your attention in the future. And so by paying attention to things, you make them more salient, which is more likely to grab your attention. And so you get a self-reinforcing cycle until you are drawn into particular patterns of behavior. So self-deception drives, sorry, bullshit drives self-deception. But of course, the more self-deceived we are, the more easy it is to bullshit us because the more easy it is to get us to be unconcerned with the truth, because that, of course, is one of the deleterious functions of falling prey to self-deception. We get disconnected from a proper pursuit of the truth. So we've got this culture in with self-deception and bullshit are reinforcing each other and becoming more prevalent. Now, Paul Ricoeur has argued or talked about what he calls a hermeneutics of suspicion. And this was given to us by Freud and Nietzsche and Marx as prototypical thinkers of this ilk. In, in for all of these thinkers, we are they give us arguments to the, the effect that appearances mask self-deception. They mask a hidden motive, a secret agenda, or a deceptive covert manipulation. That's why it's a hermeneutics of suspicion. We're suspicious of how things are appearing to us. However, I would argue that it goes back to the combination of the Copernican Revolution and the Protestant Reformation. So before the Copernican Revolution, we have the Aristotelian notion of realness, and it's basically tested through three through rule, through three rules, right? And it's, is my organ functioning properly? Is the medium clear? Do other people, after reflective discussion, agree with me? Now, we still live by this, by the way. We still use this to determine if what we're seeing is real. Now, this is at the hallmark core of the Aristotelian framework. But notice what happens with Copernicus. We all have well-functioning eyesight. It's a clear day. We see the sun rise in the east, pass overhead, and set in the west. We all talk. We all agree that that's what we saw. And we're all wrong. We have to remember how terrifying that is. We've gotten so used to it we, and that it has, it has so inseminated itself into us at an almost unconscious level, but it expresses itself in a deep suspicion. Because if, that's, if, that, if that can fail the test, <clears throat> what else is failing the test? What else is passing all of our intuitive judgments about what is real and nevertheless turn out to be illusions? The Protestant Reformation, of course, taught us that we cannot trust traditional institutions. We cannot trust their sense of right and wrong. We are thrown back upon 
ultimately individual conscience. Now, that may not have been Luther's original intent, but that's not relevant to my argument right now. What we end up with is we get the isolated individual trapped behind sense experience, where that sense experience is understood as the veil of appearance. I was taught this repeatedly in my undergrad in philosophy as a central issue with which we had to contend, the veil of appearance and an ongoing anxiety and about skepticism and solipsism at the heart of what we were trying to do. And of course, the scientific revolution and the Protestant Reformation and this concern with skepticism and solipsism come to particular fruition in Kant and the tremendous impact, and he called it his Copernican revolution, he had on the intellectual and spiritual development of what we now call, probably inaccurately, the West. In all of this, appearances became unmoored from reality and from social structure. But of course, they are still nevertheless salient and compelling. That is part of our inevitable embodied experience. So notice what we have here. We have appearances that are unmoored from reality and social structure. We are deeply suspicious of them, yet we find them still salient and compelling. This is super bullshit. The cul culture as a whole is in a place where the appearances are disconnected from realness, yet they are still compelling and driving our behavior. Now, in order to protect ourselves, I propose, or I'm arguing, from this, we seek to tame and control appearances and make ourselves invulnerable the, the, to them being used to manipulate us. This is the great quest. And of course, it has been put on methamphetamines by the advent of social media. How would we tame appearances, make them easily accessible back to the smooth and, and make it so they do not claim or intend to claim or pretend to claim to portend a deeper reality. They are superficial and they glory in being superficial, the smooth. How do we seek to control them? Instead of being controlled by these appearances, they will be completely manipula manipulated by us. They will be completely in control of us. They are solely for our use. Back to the smooth. Of course, and this was what reflection and research show, this is ultimate bullshit. In our attempt to not fall prey to bullshit, we actually fall deeper in it because this strategy of the smooth, the smoothing of appearances, distracts us from the fact that the reduction of beauty to the smooth is precisely in service of mass marketing manipulation as we all wear our logos that look the same, saying how individual and unique we really are. So we have super bullshit being responded to by ultimate bullshit. This, of course, is a very difficult and problematic situation. What this argument is intended to show is that the reduction of beauty carries with it considerable epistemological and ethical loss and risk. But we're not trapped in the hermeneutics of suspicion. This is a point developed by Marlo Ponti extensively through his writings, but it ultimately goes back to a deep discussion by Plato that appears in many of his dialogues. But I'll use Marlo Ponti's presentation of it because it is clear and accessible. Illusion is a comparative concept. It's like tall or small. It's dependent on the experience, the realization of reality. I can only say this is an illusion if I can say because it is not this which is real. It is a contrastive comparison. In fact, 
technically it makes no sense to say all is illusion that's like saying everything is tall it doesn't make any sense typically what people mean is all is all of sense experience is illusion in comparison to some x that is taken to be the reality but there's always a comparison so illusion is when appearances mislead us away from reality and they are dependent Illusions are dependent upon when appearances lead to reality within acts of realization. And I want you to hear both meanings of that word, coming into an intelligible understanding and awareness and becoming real, disclosed as real. Now, this is one of Plato's central proposals, given this realization. Beauty is when appearances disclose reality. That is beauty proper. We can realize, in both senses of the word, the world through beauty. Because beauty is when appearances lead to reality and lead us to reality. And they have to be primary. They have to be more real than illusions. Now, note here, this requires us giving up a lot of the subjectivist and smooth notion of beauty that we have been given in a post-Kantian mass marketing world. Beauty does not have to be pleasant. It can be striking or haunting. Plotinus repeatedly makes reference to this possibility. Rilke, in some of his great poetry, talks about how beauty is terror that could kill us, but deigns not to. But it is always a moment of insight, seeing into things, seeing through illusion and into reality. And this, of course, is part of what Plotinus conveys in his argument his, about beauty and intellectual beauty, the two Aeneids. There is a moment when you realize that what appeared as relevantly real, the moment of insight, you thought something was relevantly real, and then you go, aha! What, I, what was salient to me was actually misleading. It was wrong. And notice the normativity in here. I thought I, I was apprehending her as angry but she's actually notice the language she's actually afraid and therefore i should adjust how i'm apprehending her and interacting with her notice this realization has a normativity in it a call to responsibility and action the aha moment carries with it a flash of salience as one sees into reality. There's a lot of cognitive science around this, and I won't go into it. You can look at my published work and my work in my, on my published videos. Somehow one is more right. In fact, we find insights so compelling in this way, in, we tend to be biased. We tend to judge reality in terms of whether or not they were produced in, in our judgments were produced in an insightful manner. When sees into reality, one is, one is more right in both an epistemological and an ethical sense about reality. One is correct and in right relationship. We need to be very careful here. Beauty is in the act of realization. What may, what may be disclosed could be great evil. One of my favorite paintings and I don't use slides, so I'm not going to put up a slide. I, I hope you've seen it. If you haven't, you could look at it later. Is Picasso's Guernica, which is a painting of the bombing by the fascists of a uh, town in Spain during the Spanish Civil War, I believe in 1937. It is, in many ways, a horrifying painting. Now, Picasso's Guernica is trying to cut through all the proper and bullshit around war and come into a bring us into a full presence of the full presence of the event 
Collingwood would talk about this in the work of art, how it brings us, it takes us out of a categorical way of thinking. This is one battle among, no, the actual suchness of this event come into full presence of its full presencing. There's a reciprocal opening. The whole of the self is the is involved in opening up to a deeper and deeper apprehension of the reality. And there's a reciprocal opening, which of course is an instance of platonic anagoge. What I'm saying is it is a beautiful disclosure of evil. But this should not be confused with saying it portrays evil as beautiful. It portrays evil as evil beautifully. We love the painting. We love the painting. We treat it. We don't destroy. Look, it's evil before us. Destroy it. It's evil. We don't destroy the painting. We honor it. We hold it sacred. I believe it's now being hung in the United Nations. It's a sacred object. We love the painting, and in that, therefore, in some important way, it is beautiful. The act of viewing it is beautiful. Not pleasing, but beautiful. Plato's second great proposal about beauty is that beauty can, not must, connect us to reality in a way that helps educate us in wisdom and virtue. Beauty affords self-transcendence, anagage, as I mentioned earlier. This is echoed in the work of my friend D.C. Schindler, especially in The Catholicity of Reason and Love in the Postmodern Predicament, where he talks about the three transcendentals. And remember, they're all convertible. They're not identical, but they all interdefine and interpenetrate each other. The primacy of beauty, the centrality of goodness, and the ultimacy of truth. The primacy of beauty. Beauty is how the otherwise abstract reality of the eidos, which is often translated as the form in the forms in Plato, first reaches into sense experience. But how? Well, eidos actually means the look or aspect of something. Remember that. Now think about when I ask you, what is a bird? Well, it, you know, it's feathers, it has wings, beak, and it flies. So I'll, punch a, I'll pile a bunch of feathers here, put a beak, some wings, and I'll toss them in the air. They're flying. That's a bird, right? No, it's a horrific mess. Because what's missing is the structural functional organization that makes it into a bird. It's logos, a notion that Plotinus will use that he properly gets from the Stoics, as Kevin Corrigan has argued. The logos this eidos, but notice it's a way of looking at it, Where the, but the seeing isn't visual seeing, at least primarily. Because you have to understand that this structural functional organization is not just the synchronic structural functional organization, it is diachronic. Look, you actually don't ever fully see an object. You can't fully see it. And all of these different aspects, all of these different looks are held together by something that is not any aspect at all, but a through line, a through line that is one with, but not conceptually identical to that structural functional organization. That's what the eidos of something is. And beauty is when the eidos is being disclosed in our awareness of something. Now, Rusin, in his uh, really important book, Bearing Witness to Epiphany, is trying to integrate phenomenology and Plato back together. And he talks about the musicality of intelligibility. He talks about the fact that when we're making sense of things, there's a rhythm that we need to pick up on. There's a rhythm. These, right? There's a rhythm going through this. And there's a melody. All of the different instances are, are like notes. They're not identical, but they all belong together. And there's a harmony. There's an organizing, unifying principle to it. This is the musicality of intelligibility. And intelligibility is our primary way of determining what realness is. So realness and intelligibility and musicality are bound up together. When we have an insight into the form, we're leaping into a gestalt. 
not just the synchronic gestalt that's in our mind, but the di diachronic gestalt through the musicality of intelligibility of our experience of a thing that this this leaping into the gestalt is what Zwicky talks about in the experience of meaning so notice what we're saying here stoic notions of beauty are often and I don't know her name, and I wasn't here for her earlier talk because, as I said, I'm not feeling well. I don't know if it's Selkite or Kelkite. I apologize for any mispronunciation. Makes a good case for Stoic beauty as Sumatria, uh, not exactly the same as our notion, current notions of symmetry, better understood as proper proportioning. Another notion is ratio, which is at the heart of our word rationality, because rationality is the putting of things into proper proportion, properly proportioning our attention and care. And by doing this, we cut through illusion and into reality. When we properly proportion our attention and care so that we can track the through line, follow the idos, then we cut through any possible illusion and appearances in the musicality of intelligibility beautifully disclose an underlying reality. This is why Chrysippus can say only the beautiful is good. Connecting to the real rational order of reality. This is ontonormativity, a term I've coined for the fact that people find the really real inherently good and they will transform their lives, their relationships, even their identity to be in closer communion and conformity to that really real. And of course, this lines up with the Stoic proposal that the universe itself has a logos and that logos is sacred and divine. And we are to come into an ongoing, uh, dare I say it, musical, joyful, flowing with that logos. Marcus Aurelius, of course, is aware of appearances disclosing reality and their relation to beauty. He says, we should remark the grace and fascination that there is even in the incidentals of nature's process. When a loaf of bread, for instance, is in the oven, I know there's been another talk on this. Cracks appear in it here and there. And these flaws, though, though not intended in the baking, have a rightness of their own and sharpen the appetite. The cracks, flaws, breakings in a simple notion of symmetry, and they're unintended, breaks in the surface structure, have a rightness about them. Notice that language, the rightness. I've been talking about this all the way through. A rightness that sharpens the appetite. Isn't that, of course, what beauty does? The appearance of the cracks literally opens up the surface of the bread to the depths. And this enhances our desire to come into contact with the bread. Part two, sorry, quote two. An angry look on the face is wholly against nature. If it be assumed frequently, beauty begins to perish and in the end is quenched beyond rekindling. Why is an angry face against nature? Because it is a face that discloses passion and not the logos that is essential to our humanity. A face too often angry can lose its beauty. It no longer rightly discloses the core reality of human nature. But let's examine more closely this realization through beauty that I have been arguing for. Scari, in an important book, an amazing book, I would put it, on beauty and being just, talks about how the experience of beauty prepares us for seeking truth and justice. She gives the example of seeing a 
beautiful tree. And she goes through the phenomenology very carefully. And she says, the insight is something like, I didn't realize trees could be like that. And I want you to, now I'm going to do something, if you'll allow me to use a self-referential adjective, verbatim about this, I'm going to put this into cognitive terms of sense-making. So I didn't realize trees could be that. Like, so we have all of our previous experiences of trees, all the different instances, all the categories, and they're converging on this new entity. And it somehow is disclosing the IDOS, the underlying reality of what trees really are. I didn't realize trees could be like it's realized. And what that does is that opens up possibilities for us, new ways of seeing and relating to trees. To trees in the future. So notice these movements. You've got a convergence to a realization of form of IDOS that is right, can be used in many different, it can find and formulate and reformulate problems as we encounter trees in the future. Now, if you take a look at the work on making sense and explanation. There's a couple things that come, and the work on plausibility, a couple things come out. This notion of convergence. We like convergence of independent things. Well, why? Well, if my realization comes through just one, let's, let's do sense experience, comes through just one sense channel, I see something, but I can't touch it or hear it or feel it. It might not be real. It might just be a subjective illusion. But if I can see it, touch it, hear it, in fact, the more senses I can get, the more I'm convinced it's real. Why? Now, this is not an algorithm. It can go wrong. But why? Because the more convergence I have, the less likely it is, the less probable it is that my realization has been produced by subjective illusion or bias. So convergence gives us what Rescher in his 1976 book, Plausible Reasoning, calls trustworthiness. The opposite of bullshit gives us trustworthiness. Of course, we know why we want IDOS. We've already talked about that. What, a, what is it when a realization can suddenly be applied to what were previously many disparate domains? And this is making use of the philosopher of science, Kitcher, some of his work on stringency. But I will argue in fact, I'll just have to claim I've got arguments elsewhere. This is what we mean when we say a scientific claim is elegant. I've had an insight that can go to many otherwise diverse. Four sequels mass times acceleration can be used to talk about planets, balloons, blue whales, accelerating cars. Wow, that's elegant. Ben Milgram in his astonishing book on practical induction, how we acquire new desires, not new beliefs, but new desires, argues for a balance between our backward and forward commitments. What does that mean? If I'm going to promise a lot of elegant problem solving going forward, I'm, I, sh I need to have a lot of convergence to my realization or claim. If I have a lot of promise without much convergence, I get the conspiracy theory, the far-fetched claim. If you only believe that the British royalty are lizard people, look at everything that I can explain. What's the opposite, where I have lots of trustworthy convergence, but no elegance, no power? That's triviality. Tri trivialities are not false. They are not worthy of your attention. So notice what we have in plausibility, in good sense-making. Notice all the aesthetic terms, terms deeply associated with beauty. We have convergence, a coming into oneness. We have the emergence or the emanation of idos, of form. We have elegance and we have balance between them. Plausibility is the beauty of good sense-making. And we are deeply attracted and moved by it. Now, plausibility isn't probability and it isn't certainty. Plausibility is what you should take seriously. What is a good proposal? Where you should look for the truth. 
turning it around, beauty is sensory motor plausibility that can be taken up into cognitive plausible, therefore beautiful sense making. So plausibility, what you should take seriously, what you should care about, the reasonable promise that salience is tracking reality, the opposite of bullshit. And of course, Socrates famously argued for a rationality of care. He knew ta erotica. He knew what to care about. He knew what he didn't need. He knew what mattered. The unexamined life is not worth living. And of course, this lines up with other more recent work by Frankfurt, the importance of what we care about and reasons for love. And my extensive, sorry, I don't mean to be self-promotional. I just want to indicate trustworthiness, work on relevance realization. You are different from computers because computers don't care about the information they process. You care about some information rather than other information, and therefore you take care of it because this is all part of you taking care of yourself and other people. Lipton makes a very strong case in his book on inference to the best explanation for the primacy, the primacy of plausibility. What do I mean by that? Well, think about an experiment. I have to come up with a hypothesis. Do I generate all possi logically possible hypotheses? No, that is combinatorially vast. I, I pick ones that are plausible. When I'm designing my experience I, experiment, I have to worry about confounds, possible alternative explanations. All the logically possible alternative explanations? No, that is uncountably large. Only plausible alternative explanations. What implications do I draw from my data? All logically possible implications? No, those that are plausible. Plausibility is primary. You, you, it is before, during, and after all scientific investigation and labor. Rationality depends on the orienting beauty of plausibility. Plausibility is good sense making, grasping the significance of information well, grasping the, in, the significance of information well, caring about the information in the right way. And that's what we actually mean by understanding. Look, knowledge is about evidence. Understanding is about the relevance and significance about what you know. Plausibility and understanding are mutually defining. Here's the connection good sense making is the beauty of plausibility. That produces understanding. That gives us the musicality of intelligibility, which of course affords good sense-making. That is the cycle that we are constantly running through. It's all a cycle of beauty. Marcus Aurelius, dwell on the beauty of life. Watch the stars and see yourself running with them. Well, this language is not the language of just belief. It is to be with and to run with. This is participating in the beauty, in the very way in which you are contemplating the highest or deepest realities. Beauty is primary because it reaches into our sense life and our sense making and prepares us for truth and affords us seeking it. In this way, beauty, and I've already alluded to this, beauty is anti-bullshit. Beauty helps us discern through bullshit and tutor us how, how to care well, what to take seriously, what matters. McGee and Barber in 1999, this ability to see through illusion into what's real is the hallmark of wisdom. This is, was taken up in the consensus paper that I was a co-author on with many other people led by Igor Grossman in 2020. The science of wisdom in a polarized world, knowns and unknowns, this ability to see through illusion into reality is central to wisdom. I propose to you that virtue requires discernment knowing what to take seriously and what to care about with insight and deep understanding. And when we have that, we have wisdom. 
In the symposium, Plato proposes that virtue is a higher order of beauty. We first noticed the beauty of the beautiful person. Then we moved to beautiful institutions, then to the beauty of virtue. How is virtue beautiful? Each virtue is a way to be wise in a particular situation. There are, some, there are multiple competing interpretations of the Socratic proposal of the unity of the virtues, but I take this one to be the most plausible. Each virtue is a way to be wise in a particular situation. It is like to, to be wise in this situation is to be courageous. To be wise in this situation is to be compassionate. The virtue is a proper proportioning, a ratio of attention and care, the rationality of attention and care, so that one homes in on what is most relevantly real in that situation. Think about the stoic emphasis on prososh and prokairon. It's all about tailoring us so we can do this, tutoring us and tailoring us. Each virtue is how wisdom proportionally and properly, therefore, appears in a particular context. Virtue is the beautiful appearance of wisdom. Virtue is how wisdom proportionally appears in a particular context to best disclose the most relevant truth in that situation and how action is appropriate to it. Virtue is the beauty of wisdom. Virtue is the beauty of wisdom. Think about all of the Stoic practices. Premeditatio, what Hado calls objective seeing, the view from above. What are they all designed to do? They're all designed to get you to pay attention to how the alteration of how you finding things salient can be more properly attuned to the underlying reality. And that often we are confused because we fuse inappropriate caring with the underlying reality. But we can learn, we can learn to have what we find salient, what we take seriously, properly tutored so that salience tracks us into what is real, not just in our thoughts, but in our whole sensibility, our whole sense-making, our whole comportment, our whole existential orientation and stance towards reality. This, of course, is the cultivation of virtue and wisdom. All of these practices they may disclose things that are very unpleasant. The premeditatio doesn't disclose something. Oh, death, the fatality of all things. I could lose my loved one tonight. It's not a pleasant experience. But what does it do? Well, some research on this shows is that when you do something like this, it releases people from mortality salience. If you just trigger people, about their mortality, they will get very close-minded, very rigid, very defensive of their worldview. But if you move it into a reflective practice in which you imagine that you're dying and all the people are around you, and then you ask yourself, what really matters here in this most real of real moments. And people don't say their possessions or their power. They say their relationship. And because the people they care about are there, they become open and flexible and loving. This is a beautiful practice, even though what is disclosed is not something that we like or prefer or find smooth. In fact, we are doing our damnedest in our culture to try and smooth over the reality of fatality. The fact that at any moment, reality can smash in to your most narratively cherished projects and our ultimate mortality. We try our best bullshit around us. But the Stoic practices can open us up. They can be 
beautiful practices that lead us into a deeper ability to be connected to reality. What would that be? A connection to reality that has rational apprehension, plausible sense-making. And by the way, you see here that rationality does not reduce to Cartesian logic. I'm talking more about overcoming self-deception, appropriately proportioning your attention and care to the world. What would that be? That sense of connectedness to reality that is fundamentally good, that is not pleasant or pleasurable. That, I put it to you, and I think Levine is right about this, or Levine, that is joy. Something the Stoics actually talk very frequently about. And of course, we've reduced it. Think about what we've done even to the word enjoyment. We've reduced it to a synonym for experiencing pleasure. But moments of great joy can be very unpleasant. They can be beyond pleasure. They can be other than pleasure. One way in which we can get a notion of joy is some of the current work I do, which is the flow experience but that has been talked about by Csikszentmihalyi. The flow experience is when you're doing jazz or martial arts or rock climbing. You get this tremendous, that narrative nanny superego thing in your head. How am I doing? What do people think of me? How's my hair? Was my shirt okay? How am I doing? What's my status now? Am I, am I, am I safe? Is there anything interesting for me? What am I getting out of it? All of that falls silent because you are so deeply connected. And there's a, there's a reciprocal opening in anagoge. The world is super salient to you and you are committing more and more of yourself to it, but you're not being bullshit. Exactly the opposite. You're being led into an intimate causal efficacy and connectedness to the world because error really matters in the flow state. You're at one. Although you may be exerting tremendous metabolic energy, you feel graceful. It feels magical. People seek out this experience. They will reliably tell you it is not, it is not pleasure. Think about rock climbing. It is absurd. <clears throat> you climb up this rock surface, you're hurting yourself, you're putting yourself at risk of injury, you're exhausting yourself only to, once you get to the top to come back down. It sounds like a Greek mythological torture in Hades. People do it because it gets them into the flow state. They have, I've argued with Leo Ferraro and Anna Hara Bennett that what's happening is an ongoing insight cascade. Like, you're constantly getting more and more insight into what's going on, and it's calling deeper and deeper into you. You're getting this anagogic at one minute. It's a deep st state of joy. It is not pleasure, and it can be very painful in a lot of ways what you're doing in that state. Sparring is painful. Rock climbing is painful. And yet people do this. It is an optimal experience. It is the best experiences. Many people will say it's the best experience they have, and it is where they are at their best. And it is a universal. You find it across cultures, linguistic groups, socioeconomic status, gender identification, continental dwelling, et cetera. People describe this experience in, in, the, in similarity at the level of detail. This is a universal. It discloses something essential about our functionality. We are made for joy, which is not pleasure. We are made for this deep uh, one And it is a profound experience for us because it gives us an intimate, deep connection to a reality that is disclosing itself as overwhelmingly beautiful. There's an ongoing sense of super salience but not deception, a super salience that is making us love what is happening, falling in love with us. There's ongoing disclosure and discovery, and we're tapping into the inexhaustible intelligibility of reality. Seneca, even when painted into a corner, it is possible to leap into the sky. The disciplining of attention and caring, cutting through self-deception in rational, virtuous realization, potentially putting us into a profound flow 
with nature, another Stoic theme, is a deep enactment of beauty. That is how beauty is implicit in all of Stoicism. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Ah, oh, John, thank you so much. Everyone, a round of applause in the chat for John Verveke. John's going to linger with us for a while, but I'm also aware, John, that you're not feeling your best. So we'll maybe take a couple of questions and see how we go. Are you, are you okay with that? Let's, yeah. Um, let's say 15, 20 minutes. I think I can. I think I've got enough cortisol and adrenaline and enough in, enough flow that I can hang on for a bit longer. Yeah. I want to say, wow, John, that was elegant. Um, you mentioned that, wow, elegance, that exclamation of wow, is that an exclamation of awe and is awe the experience that might be a sign of beauty, plausibility, et cetera? Do we, how do we feel that? How do we recognize that? So awe is tricky. Uh, I think wonder and wonder flow are definitely um, experiences of plausibility and intelligibility. Awe is a little bit different. Um, uh, we thought it would just be that sort of just more, but we're running some experiments to show there, if awe was just that, like what's happening in the flow state, you would expect people to demonstrate very increased measures of cognitive flexibility well after you induce the awe state in them. And we're not finding that. Now, one of two things might be the case. Awe is really ephemeral, and that's a real possibility. So take mm -hmm. that seriously. Mm -hmm. Secondly, even if the awe state is persisting long enough that it should be impacting cognition, and this, this, this second proposal is my favorite because for the completely biased reason that it lines up with my argument, there's probably an intervening thing that is needed. The awe, what awe does is it's one of the few positive experiences of the shrinking of the self. And if that launches you into the training of epistemic humility, of reverence, then that would probably predict many of the traditional predictions of how awe improves people. So mm -hmm. this is very much an experimental work and a theoretical debate work in progress. So that's the best answer I could give you right now. I think, um, did you say with the Marcus Aurelius quote, it's not... Um to dwell on or dwell with beauty, the stars. Dwell on, dwell on the beauty. Of dwell the, on. That's the translation I have. So is that an intellectual relationship? Is there an embodied relationship? I think, I think, I think the Stoics, and I, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to speak anachronistically. I'm going to use some of my language for them. I think the Stoics are very concerned with perspectival and participatory knowing. They are not just concerned with propositional knowing. And this comes out, of course, in their continual refrain that philosophical discourse is not the same thing as the proper love of wisdom, because love involves what you care about, what you find salient, how you're noticing and oriented in the world, and how you are committing and binding your identity to something. And I think dwelling, therefore, should be understood as pointing towards that perspectival and participatory knowing. Okay. I have one more quick question from me and I'm going to jump into the chat because we've got some questions. Um, could you just clarify how to recognize triviality versus plausibility? Sure. So plausibility is when you have a balance between the convergence, many different things give converge to this realization and the elegance. There's right. So lots of convergence to lots of elegance and lots of, you know, uh, um, instantiation of, the, of an IDOS, right? Yeah. But there has to be a balance between them. Mm -hmm. When you have a lot of convergence, but not much elegance, then you have a triviality. Can buses, you give us an example? Uh, like uh, Buses stop at stoplights. Okay. Huh. Yeah. You, you know, you've got a lot of converging evidence for that. You've probably seen it happen multiple times. Many people will agree with you. Lots of independent corroboration. You don't take that as a great scientific insight. Buses stop at stoplights. Yeah. And, and knows what you want to say here. And what follows from that? What comes from that? Where's the elegance? Well, there is no elegance. And that's what makes it trivial. That's why the person who spouts triviality is a bore. They're not lying but they don't say anything that has consequence for us. Mm. Okay. 
Oh, thank you. That was really clear. All right, I'm going to jump into the chat. Um, um, something that Dave Murray said. It's not a question, but it's just a, an experience. And yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with that. So he said, met a guy um, just like this at a biker. This is at the beginning when you were talking about Harry Frank Frankfurt and bullshit. Um, met a guy just like this at a biker bar a couple of weeks back, slung all kinds of bullshit, wanted me to believe him. He got very upset when I would not agree. Haven't been able to stop thinking of that encounter since. Not sure I handled it well. Felt like I should have clapped along, but not to agree. In ah, Felt I should have clapped along, but not to agree internally. All right. So any comments for Dave on that interaction? Thanks, Dave, for that. Yeah, uh, Dave, that's, I mean, that's a really tricky situation, especially if it's a, a stranger. And so you don't have much sense about what you can expect from the person, uh, you know, is there actually, you know, a, a, an implicit possibility of uh, an escalation potentially into violence or harm. And so I understand, you know, there's care to be taken here. And there's a there's a, a cost benefit analysis, like, it's, it's, it, you know, is it going to cost you much to challenge this person? If if, please hear the if, if it does come to be the case that there might be a good reason to challenge, um, this is where I think uh, learning Socratic practice is really important. This is what I do in a lot of the work I do around dialectic into dialogos. Socrates was very good at drawing people into the depths of their bullshit only to have it fall apart in their hands so that they would experience aporia. Now that in itself is a dangerous thing to do. And of course we all know what they did to Socrates. But the thing is, because aporia gives you a choice point, you can either retrench even more deeply, and that, right, that is a real possibility, or you can do the following. You can open up, you can experience wonder, which is to open oneself up to call one's world and oneself into question in a beautiful way, um, in a wonderful way. And so I would, again, Please hear all the caveats I put before it. But there are times when people are bullshitting. Perhaps a relationship is at risk and somebody is bullshitting. And this can often happen in couples therapy. The therapist often needs to use techniques, largely Socratic in nature, to try and get the person into a place where they are willing to disidentify from being a bullshit artist in an important way. See, the problem, as I said, with bullshitting, and we all know this, the problem if you bullshit a lot is you start to believe your own bullshit. You don't really believe your bullshit. You fall prey to it. Um, and so getting people to break out of that cycle it can be very challenging. But that might be an instance where doing posing a Socratic challenge to bullshit might be really necessary or at least highly um, indispensable and needful at the time. John, you said we don't, we can't believe our bullshit, um, but we repeat, we we say bullshit enough that it just becomes more salient and therefore. Right. We... And then we d engage in action, which causes us to have certain beliefs. So it's it, right. technically, we don't believe our bullshit. Our bullshit leads us into being locked into what we find salient. And then our act, our actions are what cause our bullshit. We can't, sorry, cause our beliefs. We don't, we can't act a belief, but our actions actually cause our beliefs. And mm -hmm. so in that way, bullshit channels our actions and then those cause our beliefs. You know, and, 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 and Pascal, and I don't mean to say he was promising bullshit, but Pascal was aware of this. When he gave Pascal's wager, he didn't want, he said very clearly, I don't think it will convince you of God's existence. What I and notice how this is a really sneaky plausibility argument. What it should do is take make you take seriously going into church and lighting a candle, because he knew if he started to do these things, then things would become salient to you, and then the beliefs would start to accrue, even though he could not give you any argument for them. Yeah, so. yeah, and and that's what Marcus Aurelius is doing quite a bit. He's kind of always piecing through things that mm -hmm. that veil of appearance. When you said that, I'm thinking of that piecing through that veil to get to. The reality of the food on our plate, the wine in the bottle, etc. Um, let me move on to another question. Um, uh, Mark, Mark Trumbull says, uh, what is the relationship between beauty and confirmation bias? So that's a very tricky one. And 
there's a sense in which some more empirical research is needed at a couple of lynch points. Um, I think confirmation bias is a kind of pornography. Mm. And in fact, I think you can even talk about confirmation porn. And in that sense, it's given my argument and my use of Han, it is antithetical to beauty, which should startle us and wake us up and make us ask questions uh, and prepare us for truth that we do not yet have. And so in that sense, beauty, as I've argued for it here, which of course is not our everyday notion of beauty, I've taken great care to try to distinguish that, right? Yeah. Beauty in the sense I've been arguing here would be the opposite of confirmation bias, which is a kind of cognitive pornography. Yeah. Now, you have to be careful about this because you can't, I, this is what I cannot tell you. Don't ever engage in confirmation bias because that would mean I would rob you of heuristics that you need because what these heuristics, when they're adaptive, what they do is they help you in situations, ignore a lot of irrelevant information, and focus in on the relevant information. The problem is for every instant, and this is a formal proof, the no free lunch theorem, for every instance where that heuristic helps you, it there's another instance where it equally harms you. And so you have to get good at ameliorating this and seeing the bias or seeing the heuristic in context. Hmm. Thanks, John. I'm just noting the questions in the chat and I see one from Stacy. Um, Stacy says, would you say the smoothing, and that's in quotations, the smoothing of reality has created a society that generally has a disdain for or denial of the necessarily complex? Or do we have a yearning at an individual level that can supersede the superficiality created, the superficially created smoothing? So I think the answer to the first question is yes. And I think that's Han's argument. So it's more his argument than mine, that the smoothing uh, locks us into a uh, a superficial simplicity instead of a challenging elegance. Um, about the second point, I think, of course, we're, no one swings free of cultural influence, but we know there are individual differences. And we know that one of the things in which there are individual differences um, is need for cognition. This is how much do you need to go out and find problems rather than just waiting to react to problems that are given to you by circumstance or other people? Do you seek out problems and challenges that have not been given to you by reality or by circumstance? And by the way, need for cognition is predictive of rationality. Uh, your intelligence is only weakly predictive of rationality. And if you want to see about that, go look at a whole bunch of other work that I've done and work by Stanovich and whole bunch of other people. So many individuals have a kind of constitutional resistance to the dumbification, the stupefaction uh, that is happening. Um, and what they do is they seek to complexify their cognition because they have a high need for cognition. Um, now, that is probably in some sense perennially true, but it is also um, more pertinently true right now because, as I've indicated, we have the technological and social acceleration of the strategies of smoothing. Mm. Yeah. Thanks, John. So people that have I need for cognition and seek rationality need to seek each other out and find community and mutual support. So yeah. obvious reference to the that, group here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's what we're trying to do here. Um, I'm gonna take two more questions from the chat, everyone, and one question from my co-host. Um, and hopefully that's going to be good, John. Uh, Leonard says, what to do in cases in which authentic, natural, salient beauty is indeed misleading? Do you recommend specific contemplative practices to recover from self-deception stemming from being blinded by beauty? So it, um, it's you have to be, I understand the question and I, I'm not being dismissive of it. Typically, what we mean is, let's say, for example, a, a woman is naturally very beautiful to uh, a, a heterosexual man, just as a prototypical example from literature. I'm not giving it any moral priority at all. Um, and we say, but that beauty was actually deceptive because she was evil or manipulative or a liar and all the horrible tropes. And I know there's sexism bound up with this, but... Um, 
that has been a protocol, prototypical instance of it. Now, now you have to be very careful because what the natural sexual beauty discloses is actually something like, there's good reason to believe, symmetry in, in the modern sense of the person's appearance and healthiness of their appearance. And those are both indicators of, sorry, I don't mean to sound crude, but this is sexual attraction we're talking about. Those are both indicators of good capacity for sexual reproduction. And so in that sense, there was no deception. Now, what we can do is we can fall prey to the halo effect, which is conclude that because the person is naturally attractive, that they are also morally virtuous. Now, that thing, the halo effect, you should definitely engage in contemplative practices to get to more reliably challenge. The halo effect is very, very dangerous. Now, you can see why it evolved, because halo effects, people that are attractive will largely marshal social influence. And if they marshal social influence, right, you better think well of them because social power, etc. So it, we can understand why it's, a, it's an evolutionary adaptation. But nevertheless, right, if, if, if we could all learn to more successfully challenge the halo effect and retail it, retailer our salience radar, it would do us all very well. And by the way, it helps the people who live by the halo effect because eventually it goes away. And I know people like this. And then they're really bereft. They're really bereft. I had, I noticed I was like many of us, I had been unsuccessful in the people that I had entered into a romantic relationship with. So this next time I decided to do something pretty stoic, I think, um, not to praise myself, but I decided I'm going to challenge my default automatic attractiveness radar, what grabs my attention in women, the type that I like, and I'm going to go off type. And so I met somebody who I'm now with one of the best people I've met in my life. And I fell in love with her soul first because of that. And then I've only come to realize, not only through my own eyes, but the eyes of others, that she's actually a physically very attractive woman. And this has been the best for me that it could possibly be. So if we are being really careful about what we're pressing on here, something like the halo effect, yes. Yes, I think it's good to challenge the halo effect. I don't think that's a particular problem with beauty. I think it's a particular problem with our judgments about how we are leaping from, and this is inappropriate leaping, right? There's good leaping and bad leaping, leaping from the disclosure of some underlying reality, a kind of capacity for sexual reproduction to making conclusions about people's moral character. That's where we need to pause and to challenge. Hugely helpful answer, John, and thank you uh, for your question. Okay, one more question from the chat and then uh, one more question after that and we're done. So uh, Gion has a good little question for you, John. Could you share methods to question myself if I am bullshitting or not? So um, the first thing to do is to adopt a practice of active open-mindedness. Learn about various cognitive biases. And then first, and you'll find this very easy and pleasurable, identify cognitive biases in other people, in newspaper articles or in videos or in other people. And you'll be really good at it. Now, I want you to remember this. You'll be really good at it. We are really good at detecting cognitive bias in other people. And then try and apply that to yourself and you'll find that's really hard and you're not very good at it. That's because the Cartesian monological model of how reason works is dramatically wrong. Reason works Socratically, it works dialogically. I'm good at identifying your bias, you're good at identifying mine. And so what we need to do is regularly engage in Socratic dialogue, dialogos with each other, and 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 so we get more and more capable of doing that. And then eventually you will start to more and more internalize that into an internal dialogue. Remember what Antisthenes said, he learned 
to converse with himself from mm -hmm. Socrates, right? And eventually you will internalize that ability to take other people's perspective on your own perspective. And then you will start on your own to be able to do active open-mindedness. Oh, that's brilliant, Sean. Again, I, I just want to bring up Marcus Aurelius. He, I, I notice that sometimes he does this little dialogic thing. He asks a yeah. question and then answer it, answers it. And it's thoughts okay. to himself, right? The meditation is actually a, a dialogical that's exercise. A dialogical exercise right. to put through. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. That's a great question, Gion. Thank you. All right, I'm going to invite my co-host, um, Phil Yanov, to the stage to ask the final question, John. Over to you, Phil. All right. John, thank you for being here today. Thank you for hanging out with us and sharing your thinking with us and letting us ask you questions. It's just been a real gift. I'm going to tell you, I can't wait to go watch this again. I'm glad we're recording this so I can come back and revisit this. Uh, and I'm sorry that you're feeling poorly, but I'll, I'll make thank one you. last question. One last question. Um, I look forward to your question, Phil. I really enjoyed our conversation earlier. So. Thank you. And I did too. And so I'm going to, uh, you know, we've been talking about beauty and stoicism and it's, a, I feel it's a romantic notion and you've got lots of thinking and we got to put all those pieces together. But I, wanna, I would love to hear you reflect a little more upon a statement I heard you make in another um, interview where you said that, you know, stoicism was kind of a gray area and what you were saying was maybe it was a religion and I was trying to get to the thought of what is your thinking in was stoicism a philosophy I mean they see themselves as the heirs to Aristotle right or is it a religion or was it somewhere in the middle or were they bullshitting themselves about what they were really doing this is wonderful um so I mean this is a question other people have wrestled with. I've looked at, I haven't read it thoroughly, so I, I, I don't want to claim competence in it. Um, you know, an entire PhD thesis around this question. Um, and it goes around what's called the demarcation problem in the social sciences about religion. Uh, we don't know what we're, we have, by the way, before we go, see religion, we, we have the same problem with science. The demarcation problem also exists for science. That's It's right. very hard to say that's a science and that's not. So the demarcation problem for religion is, well, what's a religion? It's going to a sports stadium where you go on a specific time with a whole bunch of other people and you cheer and you yell and you eat together and you chant and you're rooting for these people that are doing th something that in no way changes the real world. Is that a religious action? Right. Yes. And that's the right answer. The right answer is me. Is right. Buddhism a religion? Well, it could be a philosophy, but it's not right. It's not a philosophy in modern academic sense of philosophy, but it's, a, it's a love of wisdom. Right. And so I think stoicism is, I, I'll often use um, the, the, the phrase, the hyphenated phrase, it's a religious philosophy or a philosophical religion. Uh, because I think trying to come down hard on a demarcation, it has practices, it has rituals, it has community, it has a sacred dimension that you are supposed to come into a participatory relationship with that transforms you profoundly. I think this is a reason why Stoicism was taken up and becomes a proper part of Neoplatonism, which has found a home in many religious traditions, right? Of course, there's Neoplatonism within Christianity, within Islam, within Judaism. And of course, uh, there are, is, there's really weird historical inter inter integrations between something like Neoplatonism and Vedanta and Buddhism. Um, and so this com amazing capacity uh, to enter into reciprocal reconstruction with other religions and religious philosophies, it tends to um, make the religions more philosophically deep and tends to make the philosophies more religiously transformative. And so I think, you know, I think, I think you have Aristotelian science in Neoplatonism. I think you have Platonic spirituality, that sense, that sense of anagoge uh, that I talked about. Um, and there's the mystical. Um, and then Stoicism, I think it gives you um, a lot of practices that uh, I, I think are crucial. I'd be more happy saying that Neoplatonism is a religion, but I also think it is more properly described 
as a philosophical religion or a religious philosophy. Um, what's interesting- yeah, And I wasn't looking for a definitive answer from you. I wanted to hear your thinking on this because I think it is exactly that demarcation problem. And part of it is too, and I've heard you comment on some other things is that, you know, I, there is a hunger for some binding of ourselves to some other philosophical tradition, which is the thing that you talk about a lot. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing here. Yes, there is. And, and, and I think this whole, uh, if it's not presumptuous, but I think you're at least affording this, Phil, I think this whole conference is around uh, the sense of religio, uh, to be deeply connected to something right. that is profoundly and transformatively and beautifully real, that helps us find the centrality of goodness and the ultimacy of truth from the primacy of beauty, to use D.C. Schindler. Um, now, the one thing that I think um, is interesting, and the problem is the history gets a little bit hard here, is, is there a place, was there a place for the mystical, mystical experience that is clearly explicitly present in Neoplatonism? You see it in Plotinus without question. And of course, it's controversial around whether or not um, the mystical, that sense of, you know, a, a profound um, at one mint with reality um, is actually something that Stoics report on. I don't know. I think that part of the history is perhaps lost to us. Um, maybe it, it, it gets uh, submerged under uh, the emerging Christianity, maybe it gets submerged when it's taken into Neoplatonism. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I do think that flow with nature, especially if it has connections to what I talk about as flow, I think it's on a continuum with more proper transformative and mystical experiences. So do you, do you, and I apologize, but I'm going to get one more question. I want more answer out of you. That's fine. Do you think those, the, you know, the, the Zeno's flow and, and I can't say the guy's name. Mahalia, Chick -Sent Mahalia. Chick -Sent. Yeah. Chick I, you, I, every time you see it, I think I should record that so I can say it, but but those two uses of flow, do you think those are similar enough to have that conversation? Yeah, I do, actually, because, I mean, the, the we tend to overfocus on prototypical instances of flow that come out in athletic performance or martial arts or rock climbing. But it also comes out in jazz. And it also comes out when you're doing dialectic into the logos and practice. Uh, and we're following the logos the way Socrates says you follow the wind. That, to my mind, is an ongoing practice of insight, improvisation, re-questioning, reopening up, an ongoing sense of discovery and wonder. And that seems to me to be very much a flow state. Error matters. Socrates will catch you out. You have to be very clear. There's immediate feedback. These are all the conditions that create flow. Right. I think being in Socrates' presence, uh, if it was taken up correctly, which is always the existential choice in the face of Socrates, could induce a flow state in people. Don, is following the wind the same of sort of stream of consciousness, thinking, journaling, writing? Following the logos? Following the wind. Uh, what do you mean by following the wind? Oh, I just thought I thought I thought I, I thought you said following the wind. No, in... following the logos, like like we like like a wind, right? Like uh, a wind, yeah. Like it, it blows and it, it, it comes from another direction that we have to reorient. It, so Socrates talks about following the logos as if we are following a wind. Yeah. And, and of course, I just gets, thought it just reminded me of kind of a, a stream of consciousness type following of our thoughts in that way. No, I don't think. See, flow is typically different from associational, like like that associational right. uh, thing, uh, yeah. because it, it require it, it flow really cares a lot, and there's a lot more I could have put in my talk. We flow really cares and is afforded by a, a concern for intelligibility. If things start to be not might make, might not make sense for you, you immediately fall out of flow. Okay. If you start to make a lot of mistakes, you're immediately out of flow. That's the thing that will snap you out of flow like nothing else. Yeah. All right. One I think we also have a T-shirt. Well, when you're feeling well, I want to bring you back for more questions about this particular set of things. But thank you so much for your time today. This has been Thanks, John. wonderful. Really appreciate I think we, we have a T-shirt um, phrase, beauty is anti-bullshit, John Vervegi. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Great day from Northern California, my philosophical friends. I think of the practice of philosophy 
as an exercise in supposing, supposing as a prelude to meaningful, beneficial action. So I invite you to suppose with me, first using the language of words and then using the language of music. Supposing is a balance between acute attention while simultaneously taking a break from our mind's usual efforts to seek and identify pattern, uh, to draw conclusions, to reduce complex ideas to categories, to moralistically take sides. Let's all just pause in the face of this urgent disambiguation of the meanings contained in this moment. Because we can see, we can listen, and we can still pre-verbally and pre-categorically know. This is where, I think, beauty enters the picture. Now, Stoicism reminds us of the faultiness of our impressions of events or of the motives of other people. Marcus, Epictetus, Seneca, the whole gang insistently remind us of the unreliability of our perceptions. Yet, it is through our perceptions that we encounter beauty. Hmm. Well, I'm going to offer an embryonic idea. Here's what I suppose. Beauty is our birthright. When we encounter it in any form, I think, I think we are in at least a small but not insignificant way doing humanity a favor. During those moments when we engage with beauty, whether perceiving it or making it ourselves, what happens? Well, nihilism is sent packing. (laughs) And the meaning of life becomes self-evident, however beyond articulation. Beauty isn't merely pleasing decoration or adornment. It is itself a summons towards life's meaning. Beauty, that simple, unsought revelation of being alive and noticing the improbably dazzling things we see, we hear, we touch, we smell. This, I think, is our soul's fuel. And to me, that's one of the interesting things about beauty, the unsought part. Beauty finds us. It takes hold of us and leaves us speechless. It transports us from where we are to to a, a higher and deeper and fuller experience of where we actually are. And if we miss beauty, it's only because our attention is uh, booking it (laughs) to the next thing, and then to the next, and then to the next, or perhaps our attention is spent ruminating about past situations that are going on in our heads on rerun. 
and over which we have no control. So, beauty finds us. But does that mean we're at its mercy? That it will only come and go as it pleases? Perhaps we can't capture it in a net, but we can make a receptive home for it to visit often. How do we do this? By intentionally facing our days and our moments. And I would say especially those in-between moments, the so-called ordinary moments. With an open heart and an open mind. All of this is to say beauty can show up when we are paying exquisite attention to what is actually happening, even the beauty in tears, especially the beauty in tears. Now, paradoxically, beauty sometimes invites itself into us when we are not paying attention at all, when we're, I don't know, just humming along and then unaccountably a beam of light makes it through the defended crack of our, in our hearts and minds. And it says, hey, wake up. <laughs> Behold that luminous smile. Um, did you hear that jazz quartet? Did you, did you feel the, uh, the impossibly delicate strength of that bird's wing? Did you just smell the fallen, decaying autumn leaves, which then switched on the sweet melancholy that accompanies this season? Beauty, always there, no matter where. Always there, no matter where. Well, what is beauty? but an intimation of the dignity of all things. The realization that things and people, the places we inhabit, the animals and the plants are not only what they are or seem to be, but also point to and stand in for something inexpressibly eternal, perhaps the Logos itself. Thanks for listening. I'm going to play a couple of tunes for you on my supersized hammer dulcimer. All I'm going to say is that the stoic ideals of showing up for one's duty and of playing one's role in life have informed my life as a musician because I feel it is my duty to liberate the beauty of this instrument. So let's see what comes out.
Thanks, friends.